coincidence with the apparition of the grail of Montsegur. Simultaneously, Frederick II reached in Sicily the comprehension of the Hyperborean wisdom and became a man of stone. Since that moment would begin his war against the popes of Satan, the Antichrist, as he denominated them in his libels. He also prohibited the transit of every economic or military operation of the Templars in his kingdom, processing them for heresy. It is then when Frederick II affirmed openly that the three great impostors of history were Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, actually represented by the Antichrist who occupies the throne of St. Peter. With the decisive and unforeseen action of Frederick II, the delicate architecture of intrigues edified by the Golems started to crumble. But the white fraternity and the Golems know very well from where came the real attack, and further to clash in a direct struggle, and worthless against the Emperor. They concentrated all their power in the Languedoc, which, thence, would become an authentic hell, was urgent to find the magical construction that the Grail sustained and destroy it was necessary then to obtain the information as fast as possible. The heretics would not be sent to the stake immediately any more. Now it was necessary to obtain their confession, to discover their secret places, the site of their ceremonies. For that mission was perfected the manner to inquire about the faith instituting the use of the torture, the extortion, the bribery, the accusation, and the threat. And as such work of interrogation of prisoners, who preferred to die before talking, could not be realized any more just by the papal legacies, they decided to entrust it to a special order. The beneficiary of the enterprise would be the Order of Preachers, i.e., the founded order, and we'll see by St. Dominic de Guzman. Well, even by the effective task developed by the Inquisition, with the capture and execution of hundreds of Akatan heretics, the Golems belated twenty-seven years to reach Montsegur. Meanwhile, by false information, for the existence of a reasonable doubt or mere suspicion, they demolished, one by one, thousands of stone constructions in the Akatania, contributing to dilapidate even more beautiful country. Nevertheless, the grail was not found, and Frederick II carried out almost all his projects to debilitate the Gollum papacy. Only in 1244 the crusaders in the command of Peter of Amel, the Gollum archbishop of Narbonne, deployed before Montsegur in the presence of the Akatan grail came to an end. After that, troops of Satan occupied the area of Montsegur. The grail would disappear and would never be seen again in Occident. Montsegur was conquered and destroyed in part. The family of the Lord of Parella was exterminated, with 250 Cathars that operated there. But the Grail could never be found. What happened with the Stone of Venus of Christos Lucifer? It was transported far away by some Cathars who were in charge of its custody. It is convenient to repeat, however, that the Grail, for being a reflect of the origin, is present in all the time and place from where is proposed in strategic disposition, based in the Hyperborean wisdom. And that could be found again if the necessary conditions are given. If exists the pure men in the strategic wall, the Cathars who achieved to sustain it as a stone, that is, a lapsit exilis, for twenty-seven years decided to transport it before the fall of Montsegur. Five of those pure men embarked in Marcella, toward the destiny that the liberator gods of Katagar signalized. The unknown lands that existed further than the Occidental Sea, that is, America, the ship belonged to the order of Teutonic Knights, and they were awaiting them since time ago, by express order of the great master Hermann von Salza. Such evacuation was the only succor that Frederick II could give them even though for a long time had been waited in Montsegur the arrival of an imperial garrison. The vessel Constance, after crossing the columns of Heracles, penetrated in the ocean and took the route that centuries later would follow Diaz del Soles. Four months later, before returning to the river de la Plata and the river Parana, they arrived to a near region to the actual city of Asuncion of Paraguay. The map that the Teutonic Knights employed came from the far Pomerania, one of the countries of the north of Europe, which they were conquering by command of the Emperor Frederick II, existed there a population of Danish origin which traveled to America and possessed a colony in the place where the Constance had reached. Those Vikings traded with certain relatives who, according to them, had become kings of a great nation that was located behind the high snowy peaks of the west. 
a country separated from the colony by huge and impenetrable jungles, that would not be other than the Inca Empire, and the Constants came some Danish who knew the dialect spoken by the settlers. They found the colony in the signalized site, and there landed the pure men, to comply with their objective and give the adequate physical guard to the grail, through the construction of the strategic wall. The ship of Teotonic order departed, but the pure men would never return to Europe. Instead, they worked for years, helped by the settlers and Guayaki Indians, until to complete an amazing underground construction in one of the slopes of the Cerro Cora. The physical presence of the grail was now assured because it had been referred in such way the construction that the spatial stability resulted enough to remain there for many centuries, until other pure men seek for it and find it. Naturally, the Templars, warned in Europe by the white fraternity, didn't delay to start the persecution of the Cathars. They usually sailed to America from the ports of Normandy, where they disposed of a powerful fleet because they needed to accumulate precious metals, especially silver, to bank the future financial synarchy, metals that in America were obtained easily. Some years after the narrated events, the Templars fell in the Viking colony, and all the dwellers were passed by knife but the grail once again not disappeared. The golems would not forget the episode, and then, in full conquest of America by Spain, a legion of Jesuits, natural heirs of the Benedictians and Templars, would settle down in the region to localize and try to steal the Stone of Venus. But all the quests would be fruitless, and on the contrary, the presence of the grail would be making feel in an irresistible manner over the Spaniards' dwellers, purifying the pure blood and predisposing the population to recognize the universal emperor. In the 19th century, Dr. Signigel, an analogous miracle to the one that occurred with the civilization of Ock, was just to be repeated. The Republic of Paraguay was rising with their own light over the nations of America. In fact, such country had a powerful and well-equipped army, own fleet, railroad, heavy industry, flourishing agriculture, and an enviable social organization. With a very advanced legislation for the age, in which stood out the obligatory and free education in 1850, the population was extremely proud of their lineage, and knew to admire the spirituality and courage of their chiefs. Of course, to the white fraternity not resulted pleasurable the course that such society was taking, that would not agree to integrate the scheme of the International Division of Work, proposed then as the model of the economic world order. Such ordination was the previous step for the accomplishment in the twentieth century of the financial synarchy, of the world government of the chosen people. Some ancient plans, which, as I have clarified, were frustrated in the Middle Ages. For the white fraternity, the Paraguayan people were going sick, and the virus that affected them was the nationalism, the worst modern enemy of the synarchic plans. The height of the situation occurred in 1863, when the grail appeared again and confirmed to all that the Marshal Francisco Salano Lopez is a king of the pure blood, a lord of war, a universal emperor. Then was decreed the extermination sentence against the Paraguayan people and the dynasty of Solano Lopez. Thereupon a new crusade was announced in all ambits. Argentina, Brazil and Uruguay will contribute the means and troops, but behind them semi-colonial countries in England, i.e. the English masonry, Gollum and Hebrew organization at the head of the crusader army that was now called Allied, is placed the Argentinian general Bartolomé Mitra, a mason entirely subordinated to the British interests. But the capacity to officiate as Gollum hangman demonstrates that the general mitre exceeds widely the diabolic cruelty of Arnold Almerich and Simon de Montfort, and his logic due to the patience of the enemy ended centuries ago and now pretends to give an exemplary punishment, a lesson that demonstrates clearly that the path of the spiritual and racial nationalism won't be tolerated any more. The War of the Triple Alliance started in 1865. In 1870, when the armies of Satan occupied Asuncion, and the Marshal Solano Lopez died fighting in Cerro Cora, the war ends and leaves the consequences. The population of Paraguay before the war, 1,300,000 inhabitants. Population after the war, 300,000 inhabitants. Bezier, Carcassonne, are children's games before one million of dead, Dr. Signagel.
and it is not necessary to add that the 300,000 survivors, many of them women, old men, and Indians, to the population of Hispanic origin, which was hardened and proud, was exterminated without mercy, house by house, in dreadful massacres that caused the delight of the potencies of the matter. Once again, Perseus had beheaded Medusa. One million heroic Paraguayans with their pure blood chief was the sacrifice that the satanic forces offered to the god one in the nineteenth century, in such remote country of South America, where nevertheless was manifested the transmuting presence of the grail of Christos Lucifer. 23rd Day It is time now to talk about St. Dominic and the Order of Preachers. Dominic de Guzman was born in 1170 in the village of Caluroga, Old Castile, which was under the jurisdiction of the bishop Osma. Before his birth, his mother had a dream in which she saw her future son as a dog carrying in its jaw an ardent labrys, i.e., a burning axe of double blade. Such symbol interested vividly to the lords of Tarsus, because they considered it a sign that St. Dominic was predestined for the cult of the cold fire. Thence the lords of Tarsus watched attentively during his childhood, and once concluded the primary instruction, they arranged an area for him in the University of Palencia, in which that moment was located in the zenith of the academic prestige. The motive was clear. In Palencia, the famous Bishop Peter of Tarsus taught theology, better known by the Sabricate Petreño, who enjoyed of unlimited confidence by part of the King Alfonso the Eighth of whom he was one of his main counselors. What occurred fifty years before to his cousin, the Bishop Lupo, was an admonition that could not be overpassed and due to its potreño lived behind the walls of the university, in a very modest house, but which had the advantage of being provided of a small private chapel. There he had for his contemplation a reproduction of Our Lady of the Grotto. In that chapel, potreño initiated Dominic de Guzman in the mystery of the cold fire, and was so great the transmutation produced in him that soon he became man of stone, and a Hyperborean initiate, provided with great thaumaturgical powers and not minor wisdom. Such deep was the devotion of St. Dominic de Guzman that, it was said, the own Holy Virgin responded to the monk in his prayers. He was who communicated to Petreño that he had seen Our Lady of the Grotto with a rose necklace and Petreño indicated that such ornament was equivalent to Skull's necklace of Fraya Caliber. Fraya Caliber, seen from out of himself, appeared dressed of death and wearing the necklace with the skulls of her assassinated husbands. The skulls were the accounts with words of the deceit. Instead, Fraya, seen from the depths of himself, behind her veil of death that represents her terrible for the soul, was the naked truth of the Eternal Spirit the virgin of agartha of absolute beauty and immaculate would be natural that she would wear a necklace of roses in which each sprout represents the hearts of those who were loved by her with the cold fire dominic remained vividly captivated with that vision and not stopped until he invented the rosary which consisted in a cord with three sets of sixteen fixed small balls with rose petals the sixteen thirteen plus three corresponded to the mysteries of the virgin the rosary of St. Dominic is used to pronounce orderlies' prayers, or mantrams, that goes producing a mystical state in the devotee of the Virgin and finally turning on the cold fire in the heart. Must not surprise that I mentioned sixteen mysteries of the Virgin, and that today left only fifteen, neither the variation in the number of accounts of the rosary, nor that today the rosary is associated to the mysteries of Jesus Christ and that the mysteries of Our Lady of the Child of Stone have been occulted, because all the work of St. Dominic has been systematically deformed and distorted, as by the enemies of his order, as by the traitors that existed in greater and greater amount inside of it. Dominic reached to dictate the Cathedral of the Sacred Writing in the University of Palencia, but his natural vocation for the preaching and his desire to divulge the usage of the rosary in the most remote regions of Castile and Aragon and this action stood out enough as to convince the lords of Tarsus that they were before the right man to found the first anti gollum order in the history of the church. Dominic was capable to live in extreme poverty. He knew to preach and to wake up the faith in Christ and the Virgin. He gave proofs of real sanctity, and he surprised with his inspired wisdom, 
to him would be difficult to deny the right to gather those who believed in his work. But to make that such right could not be denied by the Golems was necessary for Dominic to become known out of Spain to give the example of humility and sanctity. The bishop of Osma, Diego de Acevedo, who shared in secrecy the ideas of the lords of Tarsus, decided that the best place to send Dominic was the south of France. Region in that period was frenzied by a struggle with the church. The majority of the Octanian people had converted to the Cathar religion, that according to the church constituted an abominable heresy, and without that the Benedictians of the Cistercian and Cluniac order, so powerful in the rest of France, would have achieved to avoid it. With that purpose, the bishop Diego obtained the representation of the infant Don Fernando to arrange the marriage with the daughter of Earl de la Marca. What gave him the opportunity of traveling to France carrying Dominic de Guzman with him, to whom he had named Presbyter. That journey allowed him to get internalized in the Cathar heresy and to project a plan. And the second journey to France once dead the daughter of the Count and decided the mission of Dominic both clerics traveled to Rome. There the Bishop Diego prepared for the terrible Gollum Pope Innocent III, the authorization to go around the Languedoc preaching the gospel and teaching the use of the rosary. Once obtained the authorization, both travel from Montpellier to preach in the cities of La Midi. They made it barefoot and begging sustenation, not differing too much from the pure men that transited profusely the same paths. The humility and austerity is notably contrasted to the luxury and pomp of the papal legacies, which in those days also traveled the country trying to put end to the Catharism, and with the ostensible richness of the archbishops and bishops. However, they pick up proofs of hostility in many villages and cities, neither for their acts, that the pure men respected, nor even for the preaching, but for what they represented, the Church of Jehovah Satan." But such results were already disposed by the Petreño and Diego de Osma, who had imparted precise instructions to Dominic about the strategy to follow. The perspective of the lords of Tarsus was the next. Observing from Spain the open combative attitude assumed by the people of Ock to priests of Jehovah Satan, and considering the experience that the house of Tarsus had in similar situations— the evidence conclusion indicated that the consequence would be the destruction, the ruin, and the extermination. And the opinion of the lords of Tarsus the collective suicide was not necessary, and on the contrary, that only benefited the enemy. But was also clear that the Cathars were not warned completely about the situation, perhaps for unknowing the diabolical evil of the Gollum that constituted the secret government of the Roman Church and for perceiving just the superficial aspect, and more shocking, of the Catholic organization. But even if the Cathars, not supposed that the Gollum, from the College of Temple Constructors of the Cistercian Order, they had decreed the extermination of the pure men and the destruction of the civilization of Ock, and that they would comply that sentence up to its last details, was not less true that such possibility would not concern them at all. As touched by a mystical madness, the pure men had their eyes nailed to the origin in the grail, and they were indifferent to the future of the world. And was already seen how effective was such tenacity that allowed the manifestation of the grail in the universal emperor, and caused the failure of the white fraternity plans. In front of the intransigence of the Cathars, Dominic and Diego appealed to an external procedure, which could not be discouraged by the church. They warn, to whom wanted to hear, about the secure destruction that will guide them, the declared sustenance of the heresy. But they not listened, to the believers that constitute the majority of the Octian population, and that, as all religious mass, didn't comprehend the philosophical subtleties. It is impossible for them to believe that the evil could triumph over the good, that's to say, that the Roman Church could effectively destroy the Cathar Church. And to the Cathars, who know that the evil can triumph over the good in the earth, they don't care about it, because in every case are just variations of the illusion. For the pure man, the unique reality is the spirit, and that truth means the definitive and absolute triumph of the good over the evil, i.e., the eternal performance of the reality of the spirit, and the final dissolution of the material world. In the year 1208, and while the population is affirmed in these positions, the Pope Innocent III announced the crusade in reprisal for the death of his legacy, Peter of Castelnau. 
It is too late to make effective the preaching of St. Dominic. However, the main objective of the mission, though, is to impose the saint image of Dominic and to make known his aptitudes as organizer and founder of religious communities, was having success. In such year, while the slaughter of Bezier and other Gollum atrocities, St. Dominic realized his first foundation in Fanjo, near Carsacone. He had comprehended immediately that the Octanian ladies manifested a special predisposition for the spiritual love, and due to this he established there the monastery of Proye, which nuns would be dedicated to the children's care, and to the cult of the Virgin of the Rosary. The first abbess was Maia de Tarsus, great initiated in the cult of the cold fire. She was sent from Spain to that function, and she applied then one of the strategic principles signalized by Petreño. To escape from the Gallen control, in some measure, was indispensable to dismiss the regula monocorum of St. Benedict. Henceforth, St. Dominic gives to the nuns of Proye the rule of St. Augustine. Of course, St. Dominic and Diego de Osma not acted alone. They were aided by some nobles and clerics that professed in secrecy the cult of the cold fire and received spiritual assistance of the lords of Tarsus. Amongst them were the Archbishop of Narbonne and the Bishop of Tolosa, who contributed to that work with the important sums of money. This last one, Genose, initiate, called Fulco, infiltrated by the lords of Tarsus in the Cistercian order, and would not be discovered until the end. In such days the bishop Fulco passed as sworn enemies of the Cathars, defensor of the Catholic orthodoxy, and he took advantage of that prestige to promote, before the papal legacies and his superiors about the Cistercian order, the monastic work of Dominic and his personal sanctity. In the next years, St. Dominic tried to carry out the plan of Petreño and found a semi-secular brotherhood, to the type of chivalric orders, dominated, Militia Christi, from which would emerge the Tartuis, Ordo, de Penitentia, Sancti Dominici, whose members were known as tertiary friars. But soon this organization resulted ineffective for the searched objectives, and had to be thought in something more perfect and of greater amplitude. For many years was planned the new order, taking in consideration the collected experience and the formidable task that was proposed to carry out. This is to fight against the Gollum strategy, collaborated with St. Dominic in such projects a group of sixteen initiates, coming from different places of Languedoc, who gathered periodically in Tolosa. Amongst them was the Bishop Fulco. As a consequence of those speculations was decided that the most convenient was to create a Hyperborean circle, hidden behind a Catholic order. The circle would be a super-secret society directed by the Lords of Tarsus, which would operate inside of the new monastic order. Only in this way, they concluded, would be obtained the searched objective with the principle of security. Such secret group, integrated in a beginning just by sixteen initiates that I've already mentioned, was called Circulus Dominicanis i.e., Circle of the Lords of the Dog. That name is explained remembering the promontory dream of the mother of Dominic de Guzman, in which his future son appeared as a dog who carried a burning axe, and considering that for the initiates in the cold fire the dog was a representation of the soul, and the Lord, par excellence, was the spirit. In every Hyperborean initiate the spirit must dominate the soul and assume the function of Lord of the Dog. Thence, they adopted domination for the circle of the initiates, which also had the advantage of being confused with the name Dominicani, that is, Dominicans, that the people gave to the monks of Dominic de Guzman. It must be added that to be a lord of the dog in the mystical of the cold fire is analogous to be a lord of the horse, which means a knight, in the mysticism of the knight age where the soul is symbolized by the horse. One of the initiates, Pedro Celari, had donated many houses in Tolosa. Some of them were destined to secret places for meetings of the circle, and others were adopted for their use of the future order. When all was ready, was arranged to obtain the authorization of Innocent III for the foundation of Preacher Mendicant's order, similar to the founded by St. Francis of Assis in 1210. To this order, Innocent III had approved immediately, but the new solicitude came now from Tolosa, a country in holy war in which everybody was suspect of heresy, and was necessary to act with caution. The plan was ambitious, but just the unquestionable personality of St. Dominic would smooth away all difficulties, just as the own St. Francis did. 
It must not be forgotten that the Gollum controlled all the Occidental monasticism from the Benedictine order, and that they were hostile to the creation of new independent orders. The opportunity was presented only in 1215 when the Bishop Fulco was convoked to the Fourth General Council of Lateran and took with him St. Dominic. There they stumbled with the closed negative of the Innocent III, who, as it is known, only seated after dreaming with the Belisca of Lateran, threatening to collapse, was sustained in the shoulders of Donmanic de Guzman. However, the authorization was merely oral, although perfectly legal and was limited to accept the rule of St. Augustine, re reformed proposed by Dominic, and to recommend the mission to fight against the heresy. After the death of Innocent III in 1216, Honorus III gives the definite approval of the Order of Preachers, or Ordo Prediacatorum, and allowed its expansion. Due to it, in that moment, it only had the monasteries of Proye and Tolosa. In first instance entered to the order all the clerics of the House of Tarsus, that, as I said, were in majority, university professors carrying with them many other wise and erudites of the age. In a short time, because the order became an organization suitable for the high-level teaching, nonetheless, that the first general chapter gathered in Bologna in 1220, declared that it was treating about a mendicant order, with minor rigor in the poverty, that the one of St. Francis. St. Dominic died in 1221, leaving the control of the order in the hands of an initiate of pure blood, the general master blessed Jordan of Saxony. However, in that moment, the Gollums were struggling to achieve the institutionalization of a systematic inquisition of the heresy that allowed them to interrogate any suspect and to obtain the information conducive to the sight of the grail. If such institution was entrusted to the Benedictines, as was pretended, the end of the Cathar strategy would be faster than the predicted. Not giving time to Frederick II to realize his plans to dilapidate the Gollum papacy. Thence the insistence and the eloquence deployed by the Dominicans to present themselves as the best prepared order to perform such sinister function. But the Dominicans had some real advantages over the Benedictines. They not only constituted a local order, Autochthonus of the Languedoc, where the Benedictines had lost influence long time ago, but they also disposed of monks with great theological instruction, appropriated to analyze the declarations that the Inquisition of the faith demanded. The Dominicans disposed of indubitable capacity of mobilization in the Languedoc, and when the Gollums were convinced that the new order would be under their control and would allow entry of their own inquisitors, they also approved the concession. In 1224, the Emperor Frederick II, who even being already confronted with the papacy, he had cleared the situation of the Languedoc and the necessity to support the order of preachers, renovates through a new imperial law the old Roman legislation that considered the non-official cults as less majesty, i.e. liable of death sentence. In this case, the law would be applied to the repression of the heresy. In 1231, notwithstanding that they were already working, the Pope Gregory XI institutes the special tribunals of the Inquisition and entrusted its office to the orders of St. Dominic and St. Francis. In the last instance, the Friar Elias, a secret agent of Frederick II, in the Franciscan order, who would be general minister from 1232 to 1239, and that at the end, discovered by the Gollum, would pass openly to the Ghibli side. However, prompt would only remain the Dominicans in charge of the Inquisition. Two facts must remain clear when evaluating the step taken by the Order of St. Dominic when accepting the responsibility of the Inquisition. One is that represented the minor evil for the Cathars, due to the repression executed directly by the Gollum, would have been terribly more effective, as was demonstrated in Bazir and in that way would be achieved, at least sabotage the quest of the Grail, and to retard the fall of Montsegur, objective that was reached in great measure. And the other fact was that the lords of Tarsus were perfectly conscious that the order would be infiltrated by the Gollum, and that they would open the doors to the most cruel and fanatic personages of, of the Catholic Orthodoxy, who would destroy without mercy neither remorse the Cathars and their work, the balance indicated that it would be preferable to run that risk and allow the golems to be managed by their own account. To the most fanatic inquisitors that soon would act in the order, should not be hampered openly because that would alert the golem. The tactic consisted then to subtly deviate the false clues or other forms of heresy. In the first case, in fact, the lords of the dog achieved to, under the charge of heresy, 
to liquidate in the stake the totality of the criminals, thieves, prostitutes of the Languedoc. They naturally never contributed with any information that could be useful to the Gollum, even if they were obeyed to confess the heresies by means of the torture. In the second case, the Dominican Inquisition produced an effect, not desired by the Benedictine Gollum, the one that they were capable to counteract, justly by the same reasons that the lords of the dog could not avoid the Gollums to exterminate the Cathars, that is, to not remain in the contradiction with the act of laws. The Gollum could not avoid that the members of the chosen people be repressed, easily accused under the charge of heresy, and the lords of Tarsus, who had not forgotten the accounts that they had pending since the age of the Visigoth kingdom of Spain, and the participation that they had in the Arab invasion as for the subsequent intrigues to destroy the house of Tarsus. They now had their hands with the Inquisition, a formidable arm to return every hit. Was in this way how the Gollum verified with the unpleasant surprise that the repression of the heresy ended in many opportunities in the systematic persecution of the Jews, who were sent to the stake with the same or major cruelty of the Cathars. That was, naturally, the effect of the occult task of the lords of the dog, which unfortunately was not as effective as they wanted, due to, as the Cathars, the Jewish heretics had to be offered the possibility of the Catholic conversion, what saved their lives, thing that they used to accept without problems to converting themselves. In Murano, or Anusims, in other words, conserving their religion in secret and simulating to be Christians, aversely to the pure men who preferred to die before the fall of the honor and lie about their religious beliefs. In some time passed by, the Cathar heresy was giving way to the most reassuring Catholic religion. The initial furor of the Inquisition was appeasing, and the order of preachers was contemplating unjustified fame of repressor organization, with other fame more appropriated to the spirit of its founders. The one of order dedicated to the study, the teaching, and the preaching of the Catholic faith. The great theological system of the scholastic is consequence in high grade to the work of notable Dominican writers and thinkers, who in almost every case were not initiates, but they were guided secretly by them, to develop that activity to the order, was concentrated in two prestigious universities. The one of Oxford and Paris will be enough to remember the professors as the German Saint Albertus Magnus or Saint Thomas Aquinas were Dominicans, to comprehend that the acquired by the order was completely justified. But were also the Dominicans Roland of Sermona, who taught in Paris between 1229 and 1231, Peter de Tarantasia, who did it from 1258 to 1265, and reached to be Pope with the name of Innocent V in 1276, Roger Bacon, Richard of Fischera, and Vincent de Bovas in Oxford, etc. We must have present Dr. Signigal that the lords of Tarsus possessed the Hyperborean wisdom, and, in consequence, they worked according to the ancient historic perspective. They considered, for example, that in those decades of Gollum influence were inevitable, but that finally would pass, so would reach the moment to expurgate the order, because that was strategically important, to preserve the control of the order and the institution of the Inquisition for a future opportunity, when this occasion would be presented, all the force of the horror and the repression unleashed by the Cistercian golems, as a hit of jujitsu, could be returned against their own creators, and no one would feel offended for that, especially in Languedoc. The weight of the strategy, as is adverted, rested in the capacity of the lords of the dog circle to maintain in secret their existence and conserve the control of the order. That would not be because the golem ended to suspect that a strange will inside the order was frustrating all the plans of the order, but every time that someone was near to the truth, the Domini Canis executed him secretly, and they attributed the death to predictable vengeances of the Octian heretics. To these motivations purely strategic that animated the lords of Tarsus to work occulted and the circulus Domini Canis would be added soon the pure necessity to survive, as a consequence of the events occurred in Spain, and that I will begin to expose tomorrow, as will be seen the destruction of the Templar order, and with it the failure of the synarchic plans of the white fraternity, would become a matter of life and death for the house of Tarsus. The last strategy of the circulus will take us to that exoteric cause of the enemy plan's failure. That was Philip the Sixth, and of whom I referred four days ago. 24th Day While the order of preachers was evolving according to the plans of the lords of Tarsus, something terrible would happen in Spain. 
the return of Bera and Bersha. And that event almost meant, Dr. Signagel, the end of the House of Tarsus. I will show you now how occurred the facts. Remember, Doctor, that the ancient Anuba, the major city of the Turdotani, was since the 8th century under Arab dominance, who dominated it, Yulva. In the year 1011, was the head of the Tifa's kingdom. Being its first sovereign, Abu Zayd Mohammed ibn Ayyub, followed by Abdul Mozad Abeldaziz, but in 1051 was promptly annexed to the kingdom of Seville until the year 1241. As I already explained, during those centuries of Arab occupation, the House of Tarsus survived without problems and reached an enviable economic power. The village of Turdus, whose existence depended in the essential of the properties that the lords of Tarsus exploited in the region, had grown and prospered a lot. Counting in that time with some 3,500 inhabitants, a part of the direct nucleos of the family Tarsus Volter, that lived in the signorial residence and was composed of some 50 members. In the village of Turdus lived many families of the lineage of the House of Tarsus, but of collateral bloodlines. So in the year 1128, when Bera and Bersha were celebrating the Golem Council of Mozan, the kingdom of Huelva was subordinated to the Taif of Seville. The king of Castile and Leon, Ferdinand III, the saint, reconquests Seville in 1248, but he died there in 1252. His son, Alfonso X, the wise, ends the campaign conquering, in 1258, the Algarve in the regions of Huelva and Niebla. The king gave this region as dowry of his natural daughter Beatrice, who joined it to the crown of Portugal when she married with Alfonso III. As such, annexation affected the ancient rights that the House of Tarsus had over the region. The crown of Portugal compensated the knight Odeleon of Tarsus Volter with the title of Count of Tarsival. In reality, the armorial achievement that Portugal gave to the House of Tarsus was engraved with the legend Con Tars et Val, with which was abbreviated the title of Count of Tarsus and Volter. The subsequent direct lecture ended to agglutinate the syllables of the abbreviation and to form such word, Tarsival. That identified the House of Tarsus in the next centuries. The design of the blazon was the product of a hard negotiation between Odeleon and the Portuguese heralds, in which the new count imposed his perspective appealing to difference in the language and to a whimsical explanation of the requested emblems. Assuming that, in the ancient Lusitania, no one remembered the House of Tarsus, they claimed the print-making of many familiar symbols in the armorial achievement, and they went accepting in this manner the presence of the rooster as representations of the Holy Spirit in the left and right sides of the arms of Tarsus. The barbell unicorn, chimerical animal, as the symbol of the demon that surrounds the umbilicus of the house of Tarsus, and the fortress of the umbilicus as equivalent to the ancient property of the house of Tarsus the rivers Odiel and Tinto as part of the country, and necessary to defend the scene, etc. And finally they included the image of the wise sword as expression of the lady, in that time the virgin of the grotto, to whom the knights of Tarsus were consecrated. On the blade, the heralds engraved the war cry of the lords of Tarsus, Honor et Mortis, the next king of Castile and Leon, Sancho IV reintegrated the region of Huelva to the crown of Castile and installed as lord to D. Juan Mate de Luna, but he assimilated the title and the arms of the House of Tarsus to that kingdom. As we will see right now, the county of Tarsival, victim of a great mortality years before, was feudalized by a Catalan knight who had given rights of his rising Mediterranean county in exchange of those further Andalusian shires. More than a century had lapsed since Bera and Bersha ordained the Golem to execute two missions, to comply with the extermination sentence of the Cathars, and to edify a Templar castle in Aracena. The first mission, as was seen, was carried out with neatness by the Cistercian Golems, about the second instead with no advance yet. While Ferdinand III, the saint, reconquests Seville in 1248, his son Alfonso X, the wise, seizes in 1258 the Algarve and Huelva. 
and King Sancho II of Portugal, a short time before his death in 1248. He conquered Aracena, region that passed to integrate the crown of Castile in 1252. It can be assumed the urgency with which acted the Templars since the same moment in which Huelva was reconquered. In 1259, they had obtained a certification from Alfonso X that authorized them to occupy a property in the mountain range of Aracena and to fortify it conveniently for the effects to shelter and defend the garrison of 200 knights. However, a few years before the omission of such certification, the Templars had localized the cave of Odiel, once charted the plans and excavated the foundations of the castle. All the mountain range of Aracena remained under the Templar control, including the population of Aracena and many minor villages. But the members of the chosen people who accompanied the Templars in the enterprise didn't come to an unknown place. The name of Aracena, in fact, comes from the Hebrew root Arai, which means mountains, being Arunda, the mountainous, synonymous of Aracena. This curious etymology has nothing mysterious if it is thought that the village was founded by the Jewish traders who traveled with the Phoenicians during the occupation of Tharshish, a thousand years before the actual age, which later was called Archelasis by Ptolemy, Aracena by the Greeks, and Vriato, which resisted on it to the Roman legions dominated by Arisana. For the Arabs was Dar Hazan, and due to the horrible food that the Saracens made when the Christians took by surprise the village, the Moorish Aracena. Since 1259 were dispatched troops to Aracena from many regions of Spain and even France. By luck, that during the construction remained 2,000 knights camped, assisted by 3,000 servant brothers. Such forces were distributed around the hills and performed a rigorous surveillance to avoid that the near dwellers could get closer to watch the works. The mates of Solomon, the Mason Guild, controlled by the Cistercians, concurred to the request of the great master due to, even if the order of the temple counted with their own division specialized in the military constructions, this fortress would have something different. In first place, it had to possess a great church, and in second term, that church would need to have a secret entrance communicated with its ships with the underground cave. So it was indispensable, the assistance of the College of Temple Constructors. The college entrusted the edification of the church to the master Pedro Milan. This one was authorized by the fiery Gollum Pope Alexander IV, the same who in these moments excommunicated Manfred de Saubia and procured the extermination of the Hohenstaufen and the ruin of the Giblian party to consecrate the church to the cult of the sorrows. Such dedication, of course, was not casual, but it obeyed to the Gollum plan by substituting to the Virgin of Agartha, the divine Atlantean mother of Navutan, for a Jewish Virgin Mary, who cried, distempered her heart, of fire due to the pain of the crucifixion of her son, Jesus. The Virgin of Agartha, on the contrary, didn't cry, neither experienced any pain in her heart of ice when his son of stone crucified himself in the tree of terror and died, but she rejoiced and shed her grace over the incarcerated spirits, because his son had died as the bravest white warrior who faced the illusion of the potencies of matter. The celebration of the cult to the Virgin of Sorrows was instituted, as could not had been in any other way by the effable Gollum Pope Innocent III when he introduced the sequence Stabat Mater in the Mass of the Sorrows, the Friday of the Passion of Jesus Christ. The Master Pedro Milan raised, then, for the Templars, the Church of Our Lady of Sorrows, Patroness, thence of Aracena, consecration that contrasted openly with the Virgin of the Grace and Happiness, Our Lady of the Grotto, who was venerated in the neighboring Signory of Tarsus, or Turdus, when the temple was finished, was deposited in her altar the image of Our Lady of the Greatest Sorrow, which is still conserved and received by the urban fourth, the hierarchy of priorate of the order of the temple. Simultaneously was feverishly worked in the construction of the castle, elevated with the church, to seven hundred mounts, fencing with walls and pits an adjacent area of Mudajar Tower. Five years later, the church and the castle were finished, and the surplus troops, as the constructors, brother of Solomon, were withdrawing serenely from the zone. Nevertheless, would pass many years before the local villagers would dare to get closer to the hill of the castle of Aracena.
But the task was not at all what the Templars undertook against the House of Tarsus in those years. The castle of Aracena was an obligation imposed by the immortals, to which they had given loyal accomplishment. Now they would wait patiently the return of Bera and Bersha, for make that them use it in their plans. But this patience didn't mean immobility. On the contrary, once reconquered the regions and power of the Arabs, the order launched a campaign of occupations in all the country of Huelva, either seating garrisons and fortress in rescued cities, or building new churches and fortifying areas. The distribution of those occupations would not occur arbitrarily, but it obeyed to a rigorous plantification, which objectives near lost the necessity to surround the House of Tarsus and conspire against the Pact of Blood. To remember the most important sites of those deployments, it is worthy to mention the session obtained over the convent St. Mary of La Rabida in Palos de la Frontera, in front of Huelva, from which I will talk again, or the complete possession of Lepe, the ancient Leptia of the Romans, situated six kilometers from Cataria, with a clear purpose to control the mouth and the river's piedras, from where they supposed that the lords of Tarsus could navigate secretly, or the suspicious interest to reside in the insignificant Trigueros, twenty-five kilometers from Valvedere del Camino, very near to Tertus, where they constructed a parochial church that still exists, is due to Trigueros, ancient Roman population is nestled in the middle of a fertile and extensive campaign which constituted in remote times the heart of the Iberian Tartessos on its fields, where wisely disseminated tens of dolums and meniers, heritage of the Pact of Blood, that the Templars were dedicated in those days to destroy prolixly. Only one dolmen was saved in the village de Soto, that can be visited today due to the lords Mayano de la Sera, of the blood of Tarsus and traditional candy and honeymakers, prevented the Knights of Satan to fulfill their infamous mission. The village de Soto is located five kilometers from Trigueros, and the dolum is in the cave of Zanacoron de Soto. In the house of Tarsus, as is logic, such movements not passed unnoticed and obeyed to the lords of Tarsus to take some precautions. They fortified also the village of Tertus in the signorial residence, because they believed that the golem were preparing to outbreak a crusade against them, claiming some heresy, perhaps denouncing the cult of the Virgin of the Grotto, and placed themselves in the area a force of five hundred Almogavers, and fifty knights, that was the maximum permitted to arm the Count of Tarsival for other purposes that were not reconquest. Unfortunately, nothing of these would be necessary, but the lords of Tarsus didn't achieve once again to prevent the diabolical plans of Bera and Bersha. To all this you will wonder, Dr. Signagel, what happened with the wise sword? Since that day in which Tartessos fell and the Vrayas occulted in it the secret cavern? The answer is simple. It remains in the cavern all that time. That's to say, for some 1,700 years until this moment. It was carried out, in this manner, the vow that the men of stone made. The wise sword would not be exposed at the light of day again until the opportunity to leave not appears until a future man of stone could see reflected on the stone of Venus the lytic sign of Katagar. For it, the lords of Tarsus established that a guard had to remain perpetually with the wise sword. What was not always possible, due to only a few initiates, were able to enter in the secret cavern. As you will remember, doctor, the secret entrance was sealed by the Vrunas of Navotan since the age of the White Atlanteans, and resulted impossible to localize it by anyone who was not a Hyperborean initiate. That's to say, initiated in the mystery of the pure blood, by the men of stone, by the wise warriors. However, except for a few and obscure periods, the House of Tarsus never stopped to produce initiates capable to perform the guard of the wise sword. But they were not such numerous in the times of Tartessos, when the cult of the cold fire was practiced at the light of the moon and existed a college of hierophants. In the next centuries it had to be occulted the truth of the cold fire to the Romans, Visigoths. Arabs and Catholics, being reduced to the celebration of the cult to the strictly familiar ambit. Even inside of such reserved familiar ambit, it had to be called only those who demonstrated a convenient Gnostic predisposition to face the test of the cold fire, which in nothing had changed and continued, being as terrifying and mortal as before. Except for those periods that I have mentioned, no member of the House of Tarsus was capable to enter in the secret cavern.
The usual was the minimum formation of two initiates by century. In the worst ages, and of five or six in the most proliferate, if the initiate was a lady of Tarsus, was given to her the title Vraya, in remembrance of the Iberian guardians. If he was about a knight, he was called Noyo, which had been the name, according to the White Atlanteans, of the Hyperborean pontifexes that in the Atlantis guarded the Ark. It means the basal stone of the infinite stairway that they knew to build and that guided to the origin. It is obvious that, to comply with the vow of the men of stone, the Noyos and Vrayas had to become in hermits. That's to say, they had to dwell in the secret cavern and remain all the possible time with the wise sword, and no one could sever them, because nobody but them could enter in the abode. But such loneliness lacked of the importance for the initiates. The renounce and the sacrifice that demanded the function of the guardian of the wise sword was considered a high honor to the lords of Tarsus. According to what referred by who had entered and departed from the secret cavern, the work realized for many centuries by the initiates that remained there had gifted the site of some amenities. In fact, even though in the beginning was agreed to not introduce cultural objects, the truth is that the Noyles and Vrayas were carving patiently the stone of the cavern and modeled chairs, tables, beds, altar, and a representation of the goddess of the cold fire. And in front of the countenance of Pyrene burnt once again the flame of the perennial lamp. But the countenance of the goddess not emerged this time from a manier, but was sculpted over a giant green stalagmite. Neither existed a mechanism to open the eyes, because they had been deeply excavated and were always opened, ready to reveal to the initiates the infinite blackness of themselves. In front of the countenance was the altar, which consisted of a cubic column topped by two echelons. The surface of the superior echelon reached to the chin of the goddess, and, over it, was a vertical hole in which was introduced the hilt of the wise sword, up to the quillion, in such manner that the same remained straight and aligned with the nose of the goddess, as if it were an axis of symmetry of the countenance. Thus the stone of Venus that was crippled and the cross-guard of the hilt appeared in the center of the scene disposed for the contemplation." and the surface of the bottom echelon, under the level of the hilt, was placed the perennial lamp. Such section of the secret cavern had form of semi-spherical nave, being the stalagmite with the countenance of pyrene in a near extreme to the wall of stone. This appeared gushed of lava and salts, while in the roof was presented bristly of greenish stalactites. The floor, on the contrary, had been carefully cleaned from the protuberances and leveled, in such manner that it was possible to put comfortably in front of the countenance of the goddess and contemplate as well, the perennial lamp and the wise sword with the stone of Venus. The necessary nourishment to subsist was provided by the lords of Tarsus, maintaining always filled the pantry of a chapel that existed at the foot of the hill Calendaria. Such chapel that had been constructed to the indicated purposes remained locked most of the year, and was only visited by the lords of Tarsus who went there to pray in the major loneliness. Therefore they took advantage of it to deposit the victuals in a small hind quarter, which unique door guided them to the hillside. The initiates descended there furtively, at night preferably, many times in the year, to provide themselves with food. Normally they found a sumpter and the adjoining farmyard, which they used to carry the lumps up to the secret entrance, and that they liberated later, because the animal returned meekly to the hedge. But in other opportunities, the lords of Tarsus awaited in the chapel entire weeks until they coincided in some of those nocturnal visits. Then, in the middle of the joy and reunion, the Noyos and Vrayas received news from the house of Tarsus. Specially, they inquired about the young members of the family, if one of them prepared seriously for the test of the cold fire, and if they noticed possibilities that he could overcome it. Nothing worried more to the men of stone and caliber ladies than to not be replaced by other initiates that the wise sword remained without custody. The lords of Tarsus, by their part, inquired to Noyos and Vrayas about the mystical visions. The lytic sign of Katagar has not manifested yet? Have they received a message from the liberator gods? When, O oh gods, when would come the day of the final battle? When the total war against the potencies of matter? When would they abandon the infernal universe? When the origin? It always occurred in a similar form until then. Because since the castle of Aracena was finished, some tens of kilometers from the hill of Calendaria, a threat halo seemed to spread through the entire region. Was necessary, then, 
to extreme the precaution measures to supply the secret cavern, and were reduced to minimum the meetings with the hermit's initiates. In that time dwelled in the secret cavern three initiates, an old Vraya, woman of no more than seventy years, who for fifty years never abandoned the guard, a Noyo of fifty years, Nosa the Tarsus, who until the thirty years was a presbyter in the church Our Lady of the Grotto, and now was officially dead, and a young Noyo of thirty years old, Godo de Tarsus, who realized the function to supply the cavern. But Godo, son of the Count Odoleon de Tarsival, was not an improvised in risk issues, taken since he was a child to Sicily by one of the Argonese, who served in the court of Frederick the Second. He was a page in the palace of Palermo, and then shielded bearer of the Teutonic Knight in Holy Land. Named knight as well in his twenty years, he entered the order of Teutonic Knights and fought for five years in the conquest of Prussia. Since seven years ago, he was in the guard of the secret cavern, although he passed for being still fighting in the north of Germany. He was an expert warrior, who knew how to move with precision in the battlefield. His incursions in the chapel were carefully studied, seeking to not be discovered by the enemy. I clarify this to discard the case that this negligence was the responsibility of what occurred later. The truth is that the enemy knew such place, and this was not ignored by the members of the House of Tarsus. According to the familiar saga, indeed, in the place where was the chapel of Hill Calendaria, the immortals, Bera and Bersha, had killed the Vrayas seventeen hundred years before. Since then the lords of Tarsus thought to change the provisioning point, but the intense surveillance that they maintained in Aracena not revealed any moment in direction to the chapel, and all remained as this for the next four years. Every three or four months the Noyo Godo descended from the mountain range by surprise and unpredictable, and proceeded to transport the provisions to the secret cavern, and only once a year he established contact with some of the lords of Tarsus. But the news were invariably the same. The Templars didn't effectuate any movement in such direction. But even if they not acted now, they were there, very close, and their presence constituted the threat that was perceived in the atmosphere. Naturally, the Templars didn't act because they were awaiting the Immortals, and they finally reached 140 years after the murder of Lupo de Tarsus in the fortress de Mazon. A ship of the Templar army coming from Normandy landed in Lisbonin, 1268, with the abbot of Clairvaux, the great master of the temple, and a custody of fifteen knights. The great master explained to the Queen Beatrice that the expedition had for destiny the castle of Aracena, who would be named a provincial, obtaining all her support and subsequent authorization of King Alfonso III. The presence of Baron Bersha were not noticed there because they simulated to be servant brothers and were dressed like them. Days after the travelers took the ancient Roman road, which started in Lisbon and Seville and passed through Cortejana, a few kilometers from Aracena. Once in Aracena, the immortals approved all what the Templar did, referring to the edification of the castle. In the interior of the church, the floor of the apse, was the trap door that connected with the cave of Odiel. In reality, the cave was not exactly under the church, but it was necessary to reach it by a ramp tunnel, which access was in a wood stairway in the apse. But Bera and Bersha overlooked the details of the construction because their major interest was focused in the cave. They explored it inch by inch, for hours, speaking to each other in a strange language that their four accompanists didn't dare to interpret. They were the abbot of Clairvaux, the great master of the temple, both golems, and two Templar preceptors, experts in Hebrew language. It means two rabbis, representatives of the chosen people. Apparently the inspection had positive results, that they divined by the expressions of the immortals because they were extremely serious in all what referred to the cave in their presence there. In any case, they only made one request, the adaptation to some symbolic form which they described with precision, the mirror of a small underground lake, which was fed by a trickle of minimum volume. Also, such affluence had to be momentarily interrupted, diverting to the eroded water course of alimentation and in certain places had to be distributed around the lake, seven menorah candelabrums.
25th day. The immortals exposed the actual situation to the Cistercian Order, the Templar, and the Rabbis. The Supreme Lords of the White Fraternity, Ruj Gaipo, and the Supreme Priest, Melchizedek, had received with displeasure the betrayal of Frederick II and his pretension to become a universal emperor. These acts debilitated the power of the papacy and avoided until the present to fulfill the plans charted by centuries by the Gollum. The triumph was still possible, but it had to be worked with iron fist, eliminate from the root every possibility of opposition. The crusade against the Cathars had been a success that was too late to avert the disastrous influence of the Grail. For these reasons, Rouge Gaipo ordered in first place to exterminate the dam lineage of the Hohenstaufen and to dislodge the house of Awabia from the Sicilian kingdoms. Such directives had been already communicated to Pope Clement IV. In second term, the blessed Lord sent to the execution the old sentence that was pending over the house of Tarsus, and the white fraternity was not forgotten that the stone of Venus of the Tartessians could not be found until then, and now was not possible to run the risk of a surprising apparition of a new grail. The solution consisted in to eliminate ipso facto to their possessors and possible operators. The beloved of the one wanted that this time that the mission of the immortals would be approximated to the perfection, and due to this he entrusted them in an extraordinary gesture, the Dorsch, his divine scepter. With it, according to what explained with excitation the immortals, all was possible. Such scepter of metal and stone formed part of a set of instruments that the traitor gods made for the supreme priests when millions of years before they founded the White Fraternity and pledged to work for the maintenance of the uncreated spirit incarcerated in the animal man, and to stimulate the evolution of the created soul. With the Dorsch the word acquired the power of the word, and the voice became in the verb, all the created and named things by the one were sensitive in the logos of the owner of the scepter. Of course, the name that the immortals gave to the instrument was other, but the French translated it the best they could in the word Dorsch. In some, the elder of the days wanted no fails in the new attempt of the immortals to destroy the lords of Tarsus, and he had gifted them with a terrible weapon. He had transferred his power. What would do the immortals with the Dorsch? They would try to disintegrate the fundamentals of the lineage acting over the blood, over the message contained in the blood, and for it they needed a sample of that blood a representative of the damned lineage by the one to obtain such sample the immortals would go personally due to they clarified the lords of tarsus were terrible beings to whom the templars could not even dream to stop them for the surprise of the golem because the hill calendaria was many kilometers away from aracena they manifested their intention to travel by foot but the astonishment was huge when they watched the next acts of bera and bersha they stood up facing each other, separated by a distance of five or six steps, and they looked each other straight in their eyes without batting an eye. Then they started to pronounce in counterpart a series of words in an unknown language, to which they impressed particular rhythmic cadence. One moment after that, both made a prodigious leap which elevated them over the walls of the castle. They were in the weapon courtyard, and when they were thrown they gained a major height than the walls, and they lost in the night." The golem ran through the stairs up to the battlements and squinted in direction of the horizon, and they looked under the light of the moon at a large distance, two little points that were fading away in huge leaps. They were Bera and Bersha advancing towards the chapel of the hill Calendaria. Since the advent of Bera and Bersha the facts occurred, in a vertiginous manner, leaving the lords of Tarsus practically without reaction capacity. Just fifteen days the immortals had to wait in the surroundings of the chapel of the hill Calendaria. Once concluded that time, Godo of Tarsus, who inexplicably didn't notice the presence of his foes, was in front of them. When he realized that a few steps from him were those personages dressed with their robes of Cistercian monks, in an instinctive impulse he took his sword, but nothing else. Then this he could make, with great rapidity, Bera raised the Dorsch. He pronounced a word and an orange ray hit the chest of the young Noyo, throwing him many meters away. Then the immortals took the unconscious body of Godo by the elbows, and after they repeated the series of words in counterpart while they looked each other straight in the eye, they left the place, realizing such huge leaps that allowed them to cross the kilometers in just a few minutes. 
Bera and Bersha would lose some time trying to obtain the confession of Godo, about the key of the secret entrance. With that purpose, they didn't kill him immediately, and they tried to do what they had already practiced other times without success. But this time, with more calm, they concentrated in his psychic structure, trying to read in some memory the register about the manner to enter and leave from the secret cavern. Nevertheless, all was in vain again. Neither the key seemed to be registered in his mind, nor the most refined torture achieved that Noyo released the tongue. To all this the lords of Tarsus received the sad announcement of the disappearance of Godo. Once elapsed twelve hours since he left the cavern, the Noyo Noso comprehended that Noyo would not return, and he decided to warn the Count of Tarsival. Then he descended from the hill Calendaria, and he went to the shore of the Odiel, where the lords of Tarsus had a little boat for similar cases. One hour later he landed two kilometers from the signorial residence. In this way the Count of Tarsival knew that his son Godo had been kidnapped by the Gollum. "'In some day you decide to visit Huelva,' appreciated Dr. Signigel. "'Surely you would want to know the Cavern of the Miracles and the ruins of the Templar Castle in Aracena. For it you will have to take the road that passed through Valdeverde de Camino, very near from the ancient emplacement of the House of Tarsus. Until Zalamea la Real, there is necessary to bifurcate to a secondary road that goes up to the mines of Rio Tinto, which were exploited in remote times by the Iberians.' and after twenty kilometers it reaches to Aracena. Of course, there is no touristical reason that justifies to go by other path, at least if it is desired to travel through better roads, and if it is continued, from Zalamea la Real to Jabugo, that connects with the broad route which goes from Lisbon to Seville, and follows the old Roman scheme from where Burr and Bersha came. But if it is not the motive and wants to enter in unnecessary complications, then you can go through this last path and prepare to take a small carriageway, which deviation is at some two kilometers after the bridge over the river Odiel. There is necessary to drive with caution due to the trail is usually careless, when not completely impassable. There are a pair of villages of uncertain names and some farms bit prosperous, dwelled by hostile people to the strangers. If someone decided to enter through those places, he should go disposed to all, due to no help could be expected from its dwellers. It seems a lie, but seven hundred years later still persists the fear for what occurred in the moments that I am referring to. It is not exaggerated, in all the region is perceived a gloomy climate, threatening, which goes increasing towards the north, and the villagers more and more hostile, or frankly aggressive. They retain many familiar legends about what happened in the days of the House of Tarsus. Although they take care to not comment them with strangers, the fear lies in the possibility that the story could be repeated, and that terrible punishment of those days could fall again over the country. For this reason it is convenient to not with them, much less make any specific question about the past. That would be suicide. After thrilled or terror in the interrogated, undoubtedly would mount in wrath and that would attract other villagers, and then, if he doesn't reach to escape at time, would be attacked by all, and would be lucky if he saves his life. After roaming some eighteen kilometers, very near Aracena, is arrived to a tiny elevated valley situated in the heart of the mountain range of Aracena. There exists a village which has to be crossed very fast to avoid the blows of stones of the children, or something worse. It is a population of the fifteenth century, and it not seems to have evoked much since then. The majority of the housings are made of stone, with the apertures masked with wood worked by axe and roofs of uneven states, and many of these housings are uninhabited, some of them totally destroyed, showing that an increasing decadence affects the village, and that only the tenacity of the ancient families have prevented its extinction. Its name, Alquitran, or Tar, was imposed in that age and constitutes a kind of curse for the dwellers, who never achieved to change it by other, due to the persistence that neighboring villages have. The origin of the name is at two kilometers ahead, near to the end of the valley, where a colorless cartel expresses in Latin and Spanish, Campus Pix Pisis, Campo de la Pes, Tar Pits. Logically, it is useless to search the Tar Pit, there because such denomination comes from the thirteenth century, when existed much tar in that field. At least something similar. From there the name of the near population of miners, who when they founded it in the fifteenth century, had to support the tenebrous name imposed by their neighbors, and they ended to accept it without resignation. But from where had come the tar was distinguished 
that lost valley within desert mountains, that pitch, that tar, Dr. Signigel, is all what remained of the army that the Count of Tarsival raised to attack the castle of Aracena and rescue his son Godo. In such valley, in fact, the Count Odilion, encamped with his troops that overpassed the thousands effectives. Fifty knights, five hundred brave Almagavars, and five hundred men of the village, more than sufficient to attack and raise the Templar castle which just counted of a garrison of two hundred knights, although the Templars had fame to fight three to one. Nothing could do against the forces five times superior. All that was required to end with the Templar threat and rescue Godo if he was still alive was to prevent that the castle could receive reinforcement, and for it would be fundamental to dominate the surprise factor. For this reason, the Count Odilion decided to march towards Aracena through a cornice path, which only the lords of Tarsus knew, and that passed for that valley where they went to camp the nocturnal hours to appear by surprise at the dawn. But the dawn would never reach for these lords of Tarsus. At eleven o'clock in the evening, Bera and Bersha began the satanic ritual. The Noyo was lying at the shore of an underground lake, still alive but fainted due to the received tortures and the multiple suffered mutilations. He had lost his hand and feet nails, the eyes, the ears, and the nose, and as, and as the last act of sadism and cruelty, they had cut his tongue as a prize to his fidelity to the house of Tarsus and the White Atlanteans. Curiously, they didn't apply torment to his genital organs, perhaps due to the devotion that those sodomite priests professed for the phallus. Even though the forty-nine candles of the seven candelabrums illuminated a lot, the cave of Odiel, the aspect of the seven personages that were present was glum and sinister. The abbots of Clairvaux, the great master of the temple, and the two Templar preceptors were involved in a taciturn funeral air. Their stillness was such absolute that they would have passed as stone statues, if it were not due to the malignant brightness of their eyes revealed late in life. But who would really infuse terror in any unwarned person that would have the opportunity to witness the scene? Were the immortals Bera and Bersha? They were dressed with linen tunics, now hideously stained with the blood of Noyo, and they were wearing pectorals of gold studded in twelve rows of stones of different sort. But what would impress the witness would not be the clothings, but the fiery of their faces, the hate that sprouted from them, and which was propagated in the environment as a mortal radiation. But it mustn't be thought that the hate contracted or twitched the faces on the immortals. On the contrary, hate was natural in them. It could not be distinguished in the countenances of Bera and Bersha a single gesture that would indicate by itself the tremendous and inextinguishable hate that they felt for the uncreated spirit and to all what opposed to the plans of the one due to their own were entire complete in their expression of the countenances of hate and hate that would charge the sacrificial victims the offering that jehovah satan was claiming the ritual if it is judged by the acts of bera and bersha was rather simple but if are considered the catastrophic effects produced in the house of tarsus it would be necessary to agree that such acts were the end of deep and complex causes the unknown manifestation of Ruj de Gaipo. In this way was developed the ritual. While Bera was sustaining the Dorsch with the left hand, the arm outstretched to the level of the eyes, Bersha lifted the head of the Noyo, taking a handful of hair with the right hand and placing a silver knife on his ear with the left one. Disposed in this way, the scene of the ritual, the head of Godo de Tarsus, was suspended some few centimeters from the water mirror. Then a simultaneous action, evidently prearranged. Bera pronounced a word, and Bersha beheaded the Noyo with one skillful slew in the throat. Really, the extreme of the knife had been supported in the left ear of the Noyo, and when Bera pronounced the word, he uttered a perfect curve that sectioned the throat and concluded in the right ear. Literally, the Noyo was beheaded from ear to ear. The blood gushed, and then it fell, mixing with the water, while Bera continued reciting other words without moving the dorsh. Little by little occurred the first miracle. The water, that was barely staining with the blood, started to become red, and to spread out until the whole lake seemed to be an immense clot. In that moment a reddish luminosity was emerged from the water in form of steam, an intense resplendence similar to the one that an incandescent oven would emit. When all the water was converted in blood, that's to say, when not a single gout fell any more from the exogyne corpse of Godo de Tarsus, Bera put down the dorsh and signalized to the lake while he released a lurid scream. 
Then the color of the lake turned red to black, and its sustenance was transformed in a kind of pitch or dark tar. And there concluded the ritual. It must be added that such substance, similar to the pitch, was nothing else than an organic synthesis of a human corpse, as it would be obtained after a geologic period of evolution of millions of years, but accelerated it to an instant with the wonderful power of the Dorsch. Such black pitch was then the essence of the physical death, the last extreme of what had been the life and which is potentially written in the message of the blood. But the blood is unique in each lineage. Due to this, the consequence seeked by the black magic of the immortals consisted in the propagation of that transmutation to the rest of the members of the lineage, to those who participated of that damn blood. It means to the lords of Tarsus, repeating the aforementioned, if it is judged the ritual of the immortal golem by the catastrophic effects produced in the members of the house of tarsus it must be agreed that the occulted a great secret relating to the power of the sound the meaning of the words and to the function of the dorsch because in the same moment that the lake of blood changed of color and oz transmuted in black pitch the ninety per cent of the members of the house of tarsus exhaled the last breath only the man of stone survived it means those who had transmuted their human nature with the power of the spirit. Of course, within them was the Noyal and the Vraya, but both too old as to procreate new members of the lineage. However, some hundreds of kilometers from there, other men of stone were also living, and they would comply with the familiar mission. From the rest of the house of Tarsus, no one survived to tell it. The Almogavar sentinels who guarded the Biovac of the Count of Tarsival started to worry when they perceived the buzz. They could not say when it began, but the truth is that it had been increasing and now filled the whole valley. Nevertheless, when it turned audible, the rude warriors believed to recognize extraordinarily such sound. Was the exact tone, the oscillating sound of a swarm of bees, but amplified tremendously by some unknown frightful cause. But the buzz being surprisingly abnormal, and have gained intensity able to produce days, soon was forgotten. The sentinels, in fact, warned that something severe would happen due to a terrifying scream, broke the continuity of such impressive vibration. But such scream didn't come from out, but from inside the biovac, and it not consisted of in one but a multitude of lament that had coincided in one instance. The instance when the water of the underground lake was transmuted in the blood of the lords of Tarsus, then all the members of the lineage experienced a scorching heat a thousand times more powerful than the warm fire of the animal passion, and they screamed with one voice. But no one would reach to help them, due to minutes later he died, in same moment in which the water of the lake turned in dark pitch. In a few minutes the buzz ceased, completely and the sepulchral silence seized from the valley, and the madness began from the scarce two hundred survivors of the army of the Count of Tarsival. All of them were Almagavars, native from the region of Braga, that's to say of Celtic race. At the beginning the terror had paralyzed them, but those fearsome warriors were not susceptible to run in any circumstance. The dawn instead surprised them deliberating in the middle of the encampment, According to the customs, in the absence of the lords or knights, they would choose an adelid amongst them. That charge fell over a subject who was as brave in the war as simple-minded of it. He was known as Lugo de Braga. This chief was as perplexed as the rest, due to the sudden mortality. And after a prolix inspection, through all the tents and places where the warrior had died, was concluded that the cause of evil was an unknown pestilence. The corpses, in fact, not presented at the moment any sign which could reveal what type had caused the death, but what doubts existed that it was about a pestilence. Only a pestilence, according to the criterion of the age, was able to kill in that manner. Naturally, in the Middle Ages, the pestilence was feared as the worst enemy, a part of those that the lords signalized as such and had to be faced. The soldiers would have escaped then, but they could not abandon the impunity, the presence of so many nobles, nor the Count of Tarsival, due to that they would be persecuted through all Spain. But they could neither move a corpse contaminated with pestilence. The correct, explained Lugo, was to overcome the fear and give Christian sepulture to all the dead, therefore dominating the fear to the contagion that they had suffered. The brave Almagavars aligned the 850 corpses that would descend to the sepulchre. They had planned to excavate three kinds of tombs, a mass grave for the Almagavars, other equal for the villagers, and individual tombs for the knights. They were dedicated to that work and to make the crosses and to recue the convenient to return to the barracks.
when someone discovered the liquefaction of the corpses and released the first scream of terror. Pix pisis! Pix pisis! That's to say the pitch. In a few seconds everyone ran to the corpses and they realized that an incredible process of organic disintegration was, were reducing them to a black and viscous liquid, similar to the asphalt, but from which emerged a swifter juice similar to the black bleach. From there the identification with the pitch, made by a startled Almagavar, but such abrupt process of decomposition of a corpse, much more than those superstitious minds could bear without relating it to the sorcery and the black magic. For this reason, when all ran away very fast this time to the mounts, many who fell prey of the panic exclaimed, Brutia, Brutia! That's to say, tar, tar, and others, Lixtivia, Lixtivia! It means bleach, bleach! And the rest, Pix Pisis, Pix Pisis, the pitch, the pitch! When they reached to the village of Turdes, Lugo da Braga encountered with the amazing spectacle that the pestilence had reached before him. But there the havocs of the plague were tremendous. From the thirty-five hundred dwellers of the village, five hundred died in the valley, with the Count of Tarsival. And from the rest of the three thousand, only five hundred were alive, all coming from different regions and races of the Iberians of Tartessos. What occurred had been analogous to what happened in the encampment of the Count. First the buzz, then the scream, realized with the voice of all the victims, and at last the horrible simultaneous death. It seems that the transformation of the lie was slower there, but the symptoms were already exposed in the corpses, and no one knew if such pestilence was contagious, neither its previous symptoms. Hence Lugo de Braga decided to run from the region for ever, but before they did the most reasonable, common reaction of the age, he pillaged the village with his two hundred companions. The lords of Tarsus not existed any more, nor knights or nobles, to defend that patrimony. Lugo de Braga went to the signorial residence, and he plundered it thoroughly, but he didn't dare to burn it, as his people claimed. Then he left the country, taking the booty with him. Naturally, all of them would be persecuted years after for that crime, and many would end in the gallows. Although no one could imagine it then, when the pestilence attacked the house of Tarsus, there still remained some of them alive that later would claim their own. With this exception, the majority of the members of the house of Tarsus had died of the same cause, and in the same calamitous night in such distant sites as Seville, Cordova, Toledo, and Zaragoza. Twenty-sixth day. Dr. Signigal, you will agree with me that the immortals almost had success executing the extermination sentence against the House of Tarsus. At least Bera and Bersha thought it, who presumed about it before the golems and rabbis. They were still in the cave of Odiel, the lake broomful of pitch, was still bubbling, releasing sickening odors. In the first place, the fiery image of Bera excelled, the immortal that the golem called Baphol, and the Templars Baphomet, and they idealized him as expression of the perfect androgynous. Without leaving the Dorsch, he said in excellent Latin, Finally, the damn lineage of the house of Tarsus is extinguished. That will rejoice the supreme priest. You've contemplated a great prodigy. You have seen in action the power of Yahweh. Sebauth, affirmed Bersha in the same language. Is this peradventure the death of the body? He dared to interrogate the abbot of Clairvaux. The asphalt, the pitch, the death, and the pestilence are one thing. We, answered Barrow with security. Don't you recognize this substance? asked Bersha to the rabbi Nasi. Yes, he affirmed, is bitumen of Judea the same that contaminates the lake Asphatides, which we denominate Dead Sea. The Gollum and rabbis knew that Bera and Bersha were the last kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they also knew how they had obtained such high hierarchy in the white fraternity. During their reign, in a moment of wonderful illumination, they discovered the secret of the supreme holocaust of fire. Then fell the fire of heaven, which calcined these populations— and Bera and Bersha went to Chang Shambhala, one of the mansions of Jehovah Satan and his ministers, the Seraphim Nephilim. Thus, much before the existence of Israel, when its seed was still in Abraham and no one offered sacrifices to the God One, they had been capable to give their respective populations in holocaust for the glory of Jehovah Satan. The bitumen of Judea, evident residue of the annihilation of their people, evented for them to the region of the Dead Sea. 
but such sacrifice allowed them to be received by Melchizedek, the supreme priest of the white fraternity, who consecrated them in the highest grade of his order. What priest of the cultural pact would not desire to imitate Bera and Bersha? Oh, thought the four present there, what would not give a priest to dispose some day of an entire population to sacrifice, as undoubtedly Bera and Bersha did? They would be a sacrifice worthy of Jehovah Satan. What is the curse of Jehovah Satan for those who don't comply with the law? asked Bera to the rabbi Benjamin. I will send you wild beasts upon you. I will smite you seven times for your sins, and I will send a sword upon you. And when you are gathered in your cities, I will send the pestilence among you. I shall break the staff of your bread, synthesized Benjamin, repeating to Isaiah. Thus is written, confirmed Bersha fiercely. That would be the punishment for our weakness, but it can also be our force. You must think on it, as Bera and I did millenniums ago, when the law was not written in the manner in which you have expressed. Then we were capable to comprehend the secret of the supreme holocaust, and to carry it out in Sodom and Gomorrah. For this reason, and by the will of Jehovah God, now we are the pestilence. You must mediate about the curse with composure, we advise you because only who have the calm to contemplate the beginning and the end of time could understand the secret of the supreme fire holocaust, the end of the humanity. But the reward of such knowledge means the immortality of the soul, the high priesthood and the power that you have seen us applying. Reflect on it, priests. We, the six of us, are the manifestation of Jehovah, and we mustn't break the law, but we can induce the Gentile to do it to make that the curse fall upon them, to produce the pestilence among them. Then will be possible the supreme fire holocaust. In what consist? roared the abbot of Clairvaux, unable to resist. There is the answer, Burra said, signalizing with the dorsch the lake of tar. But this would only be comprehended by who understands that our war is between the stone and the bleach. The stone placed in the beginning of time is the enemy, and mankind placed the end of time is the bleach, the supreme holocaust, and the purification by the warm fire that demands the priesthood of Melchizedek. Notwithstanding the instance of the immortals, no one of the four of them understood that they had revealed to them the secret of the supreme holocaust. The matter of what was between the stone and the lie seemed very mysterious for them. Only Nasi asked, Are you referring to the death of the final judgment, the burning death of the condemned? No, it is written that the flesh will not really die, even though the corpse is disintegrated in the tomb, because all men would resuscitate to be judged according to their sins. That will be possible because men exist in many worlds simultaneously, worlds that have been and worlds that have not been, but from those worlds will be extracted the corpse that will be reborn. Perhaps for a thousand years, perhaps for much more, some of them will be condemned effectively and will die definitely, but others will live again over the earth is not then about that death which we are talking about. Really, we are referring to something much posterior and conclusive, of the extinction of the human consciousness. The end of mankind will come when the warm fire embraces all the worlds where men exist, and the soul of men, and will only remain the lie as witness. In that moment we, the manifestation of Jehovah Satan, will reach the perfection of the soul, the divine finality projected since the beginning. But not the Gentiles, who will have no reason to exist in the worlds any more, due to the objective of their creation was to stimulate our perfection. Will be the will of the Almighty that the ashes cover the earth, to produce that the salt water of heaven turn them into rivers of lie. Listen well, priests of the Almighty. As soon as mankind can be calcined is as soon as you will approach the perfection. Convert men in lie, and you will consummate the supreme holocaust that the Creator awaits in the end of time, explained Bera, displaying notable patience. 
And he continued speaking, because the four priests had muted. Is the faith in the final perfection that the believers in Jehovah Satan will obtain by the priesthood of your cult, which will make the greatest miracles? If you are capable to see the end, you would anticipate the end. The perfection will be in you, and the moment of the supreme holocaust would come. Your unbreakable faith in the final perfection and the comprehension of the end will bring to the present the warm fire of the end, which will calcinate the imperfect man, and over their ashes will rain then the water and salt of the Creator, and the abominable sign which is in the stone of fire will be cleaned with the bleach. That's what occurred in Sodom and Gomorrah, and in other ten cities of the Valley of Sidim. When Bersha and I reached the final perfection, and we established the difference with the imperfection of their dwellers, achieving to make them exhibit only their only degradation, then the Shekinah of God descended, and the angels of God, and fell the fire of heaven that reduced to ashes those senseless populations." and fell the water and salt of God, and appeared the lake Asphaltides, the sea of bitumen of Judea, the Dead Sea, really the sea of the bleach. That was, priests, our holocaust to Jehovah God, but such sea of lie was insufficient to clean sign from the stone. Such mission is reserved to the chosen people of Jehovah Satan, to the sacred race of him, when they will be enthroned over all the Gentile populations of the earth, when the whole humanity will be subjected to their world government, then will come the moment for the supreme holocaust. For it you must work without rest, with the faith placed in the final perfection, and the effort applied to fulfill the universal synarchy of the chosen people. Only the supreme holocaust of all mankind by the priests of the chosen people will produce the lie that will clean the abominable sign in the stone of fire. All our followers, the great priests, know this secret, and they have consecrated their populations with the sign of the ash. Even the Brahmin priests have anointed the Aryans with the sign of the ash, attempting to cover the abominable sign, and waiting that the grace of heaven give them water to form the lie and clean the stone of fire. For that reason the ash has always been a sign of pain and affliction, sign of repentance and penance. The man anointed with ashes is who begs for divine mercy, who kneels before the Creator and asks for the forgiveness of his sins specially the greatest sin, to be himself before the Creator who is everything, sin that can only be cleaned with bleach. The members of the chosen people anoint their heads with ashes in sign of penance, but the priests of the lambs add holy water to the ashes, to create the lie of the forgiveness of Jehovah. But nothing will save men from the fire holocaust, and from the ashes and lie of the final judgment." Jehovah warned millenniums ago against the false priests who employ the ashes of the incense to give a false forgiveness. Only the human ashes constitute the lie that cleans the abominable sign, and Jehovah promised to convert in ashes the false priests who not respect the necessary fire holocaust. Repeat, Cohen's of Israel, the words of Jehovah. The rabbi Benjamin repeated in the act, And behold, there came a prophet of God from Judah, unto Bethel, by Jehovah's command, where Jeboram stood by the altar to burn incense. And he screamed against the altar, by Jehovah's command, saying, Altar, altar, thus saith Jehovah, Behold, a child named Josiah shall be born unto the house of David. He shall offer upon thee the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee. Upon the altar man's bones shall be burnt, and the bones of the false priests. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign that Jehovah hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. Thus is written, Only of human ashes is composed the lie that claims the justice of Jehovah, and that are the ashes of the real penance, which Job employs when he confesses his sinsuto Jehovah. Benjamin didn't need more than a gesture to clarify the quote. Then Job replied, 
I recognize that thou canst everything, and that nothing can be withholden for thee. I am who hideth thy plans with senseless reasons. Therefore I have uttered about I understood not, things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will ask and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee only by the hearing of the ear. But now mine eye seeth thee, thus I recognize myself guilty, and I repent in dust and ashes. The scarlet heifer is the symbol of the consecrated mankind unto Jehovah, for the ritual sacrifice of ash and bleach, for the elaboration of the lustral water. Jehovah said unto Moses, and the supreme priest Aaron, and opposed them, the duty to sacrifice the scarlet heifer of mankind to purify the chosen people that will be perpetual law for Israel. Remember it, Cohen. Speaketh Jehovah unto Moses and Aaron, and who burneth the scarlet heifer shall wash his clothes in water, and bathe his flesh in water, and will be unclean until the afternoon. An Israelite that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the scarlet heifer, and lay them out of the camp in a pure place and it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel to prepare the lustral water. It is a sacrifice for the sin, and who gathereth the ashes of the scarlet heifer shall wash his clothes, and will be unclean until the afternoon. And it shall be a perpetual law for the children of Israel, and for the foreigner that sojourneth amongst them, declaimed Benjamin without mistake. And how does Tamar purify himself, who had been raped by her brother Ammon? And Tamar put ashes upon her head, Benjamin answered quickly. Only the lie will clean the abominable sign, for that sin there is no forgiveness or redemption except for the bleach. The repentance and penance or mortification of the hair cloth are not enough. Only after the sprinkling with lustral water on the ashes, the penitent will wear the hair cloth just as the chosen people did when was attacked by Holferns, who was beheaded by the divine Judith. Benjamin referred the quote. All Israelites cried with feverence to Jehovah, and all men of Israel, children and women who dwelled in Jerusalem, prostrated before the sanctuary. They put ashes upon their heads, and covered with hair cloths, and they claimed with one accord to Jehovah. Now you will understand the meaning of this ancient law. The sages of Zion, said Jeremiah, have covered their heads with ashes as sign of penance. And then the prophet with Jehovah's word speak to his wife, Israel Shankna, and warned her that this will not be easy to erase the stain of infidelity. Very pleased, Benjamin recited the metaphor of Jeremiah. Saith the Lord, go and tell this to the ears of Jerusalem. For of old time ye have broken thy yoke and thy bands, and saidest, I will not serve, when upon every high hill and beneath every leafy tree thou laid as a whore. Yet I had planted as chosen vineyard, wholly a genuine seed, when thou art thou turned into the misbegotten plant of a strange vineyard unto me. For though thou washest thee with nitre, and take thee much bleach, yet thine iniquity is dirty before me. Oracle of Jehovah Sabbath. The Lamb also ordained to the chosen people to repent in ashes and hair cloth, but the Gentiles took the prevention to the letter, and they have supposed that it is so easy to take off the abominable sign, but for their impurity will be no other purification than to convert those populations in bleach, as we did to clean the stain of Sodom and Gomorrah. That was also foreseen by the Lamb. Repeat, priest of the Lamb! Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you have been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have covered long ago in hair cloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be less rigor for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. But once sacrificed the lamb, his own disciples are repented in the lustral water. Yes, affirmed the abbot of Clairvaux. During the Lent, before the resurrection, the penitents receive the ashes and the holy water, and they repent of their sins, they confess, and await the salvation of the final judgment. But they don't understand that the abominable sign can't be cleaned in such way, notwithstanding the priests tell them, Remember that you are dust, and in dust you'll be converted. 
Here ended Bera, but Bersha added, The moment of the triumph of the created over uncreated, of the being unto the not, of the light unto the shades of the soul is near. Soon the synarchy will be a reality, and humanity will remain at kneeling before the power of the chosen people, the time to blandish the men to obey him to exhibit their imperfection and beastliness would have come, such primordial evil, which he hoards in the depths of his soul, will be the time to replace the serpent of the paradise for the dragon of Sodom. Remember, priests, that a temptation of the serpent sinks man into the sin, but leaves intact his viral function, and that the virile man can always ascend from the moral misery by means of the war and heroism, and fall under the power of the enemies of the creation. The virile man, the warrior, the hero, will delay the fulfillment of the final holocaust, and will not be enough to prevent it, the massification and equalization of mankind that the synarchy of the chosen people will exert over them, and the vices and perversions which in it will prosper due to the temptation of the serpent. If man preserves his virility, and becomes in warrior and hero, if he disposes of the will to rebel against the plans of the white fraternity, which is the hierarchy of Jehovah Elohim. The temptation of the serpent of the paradise. Nothing can do against the Luciferic determination to be and exist beyond the created beings by God the One. Only the dragon of Sodom has the power to remove from man his virility, and only we, the pestilence, know how to convoke it. Respond, Cohen's. What is the emblem of Israel? In front of the unexpected question, Benjamin hastened to respond. Thus is written by the prophets that the emblem of Israel is the dove. The sons of Israel shall walk in the wake of Jehovah. He shall roar like a lion, and they shall come as a dove, said Hosea. Because Jehovah has ordered, by the words of Jeremiah, Israel be like the dove that maketh her nest in the edge of the abyss. Continued Bersha, satisfied with Benjamin's answer. You must never forget, priests, that the emblem of Israel is the dove, because that symbol will signalize the end of time. I said before that the moment of the triumph is near, that the synarchy of the chosen people will be established soon. Therefore the emblem of Israel will be imposed to men and would have reached the opportunity of our intervention. This will be made due to the white fraternity decided it, and was approved by Melchizedek, the supreme priest. In all the world, thousands and thousands of priests and followers of the cause of Israel will adopt this emblem. Only the virile men will resist, and they will try to escape from the social massification by means of the rebellion and war. They will try to found a new moral order, based on the aristocracy of the blood, but they will be drowned in their own blood, and we will respond to the clamor of those who have the emblem of Israel by sign, and we will release amongst man the dragon of Sodom, and man will lose his virility and will be softened. He will turn as a woman. Even when he could procreate, he will to fight will be debilitated by an increasing effemacy, which will be extended through all humanity." Perplexed, many will confuse the sodomite moral as a product of the high civilization. But really will occur that the heart will dominate the mind and will enervate the will. At the end, all will end accepting the synarchic way of life, and men will replace the eagle for the dove, the war for the peace, the heroic risk for the passive comfort. But such peace of the dove they will enjoy with the synarchy of the chosen people will be the shortest path towards the final holocaust in which they will be sacrificed unto Jehovah Satan, to the ocean of pitch in which will be converted to clean the abominable sign in the stone of fire. This is the pestilence that the curse of the Almighty assures for those who remain out of the law. Immediately as though their minds would be strangely synchronized, Bera took the floor again. Yes, priests, let's make come the synarchy of the chosen people. The humanity adopt the emblem of the dove, and we will return to bring the pestilence of the final death, the warm fire and the salt water of heaven. But we will be predicted by the dragon of Sodom, the herald that will announce our arrival. 
You have seen the extremes of the process in this cave, the blood degraded with the water, and the water converted in blood, and after the lake of blood, the pestilence of the final death, the bitumen of Judea, the black pitch. Tell me, priests of Israel, what is the first plague that Jehovah sent to Egypt to impose the cause of Israel? The water was converted into blood, said Benjamin. And what was the last plague with which the triumph of the chosen people was assured? The pestilence among the Gentiles. The pestilence offered the lives of the Gentiles unto Jehovah as holocaust for coming glory of Israel. Only those who were stained with the blood of the Lamb were not touched by the pestilence. And now respond, priests of the Lamb, what will be the plague that the third horseman will bring at the end of time? The water will turn into blood, answered instantly the abbot of Clairvaux. And what is the plague of the fourth horseman? The pestilence among the Gentiles. The warm fire will embrace them, and the pestilence will offer their lives as holocaust unto Jehovah for the coming glory of the new Israel and the advent of the new Jerusalem. Only those who have the blood of the Lamb and hold the symbol of the dove will not be touched by the pestilence. And what will come after the pestilence, which will be the last plague? The complete destruction of mankind in a sea of sulfur and fire sustained categorically the abbot of Clairvaux, undoubtedly inspired by the speech of the immortals. Bera clarified the meaning that should be attributed to those answers extracted from the Apocalypse of St. John. Think it over, priests, about these prophecies and what you have seen us making in this cave. There will appear the secret of the supreme holocaust, the water, the blood, the warm fire, the death, the pitch, the pestilence. We, here's the mystery." about how the curse of Jehovah God, which is our weakness, can be our strength. That was and that will be. If you have understood us, you will make your words that Jeremiah uses, to whom are a part of the law. They represent our strength over the Gentiles. Thus saith Jehovah, to whom are out of the law, the captivity, the famine, the sword, the pestilence. The countenance of the rabbi Benjamin shined when he repeated the four forms of the curse of Jehovah, because now the words of the prophet were full of new sense. And you will know then, continued Bera, what is our real weakness, mystery that the Gentiles must never comprehend. And Benjamin added the forthcoming words of Jeremiah. Jehovah admitted to the people of Israel about the four classes of evil before they would be weak. Be careful with the sword it can kill, and the dogs they can tear, and the fowls in the sky they can devour, and the beasts in the earth they can annihilate. Thus is written, approved Bera, and against such weaknesses we possess for remedies, that the Gentiles must never know, completed Bersha. Against the sword, the peace of the gold, against the dogs, the illusion of the rage, against the fowls, the illusion of the earth. Against the beasts, the illusion of the heaven. That was more than mysterious, and the priests remained momentarily mired in deep reflections. The great master of the temple, notwithstanding, who until now had been quiet, was thinking in other things. Oh, Tisduck, he said, your explanations continue the brighter light of our understanding, and many of us appreciate the privilege of hearing them. I'd not want to abuse of the favor that you have dispensed us asking for clarifications that perhaps you must have given. But I can't stop telling that our hearts would be full of joy if you could talk something else about the stone of fire. You say well, priest. The stone of fire contains a very big mystery. I will talk about it, but we will be brief because it is time to return to the East. It was evident that Bersha was speaking in an allegorical key, because the immortal would not leave until the next day. But before we leave, we will also talk about your next mission. Now that the damned seed of Tarsus died, and will be fruitful to do it in the mark of that mystery, have you brought the book that we requested? As you demanded, the book has been transferred here, affirmed the abbot of Clairvaux. It is in the library of the castle, under permanent custody of three knights, who will kill to anyone who try to get closer to it. We also brought from Clairvaux, clairvoyant master sculptor, who awaits our call in his cell. Let's go up, then, to the library, ordered Bera, 
while he was hiding the fearsome dorsch under his robe. They ascended from the trap-door that guided to the church Our Lady of the Highest Sorrow, and a few moments later the six of them were in a hall, which suite consisted in bookcases and tables covered with books and rolls. Many lecterns exhibited, opened, some enormous books, of exquisitely illustrated pages by the Benedictine monks, and constructed with tops embedded with gold and silver, of a reinforced bunker with the riveted fittings and voluminous lock, the abbot of Clairvaux extracted the sufferer each, and he placed it over a major table, of inclined double flat but well illuminated by central candelabrum. The four priests sat in front of the book, while the immortals remained standing, one on each corner. "'Open it in the page twelve, lamb,' demanded Bersha. It had only images, that's to say, it didn't have any text, apart for the words distributed on the images, and the requested page remained expossessed, the representation of the ten, Sifiroth of the Creator One, in form of the arbor Philosophica. All were paying attention to Bera, who immediately took the floor. 27th Day As it is known, Dr. Signigel, the sacred book par excellence for the Jews is the Torah, which is essentially composed by the five books of the Pentateuch, just as was presented by scribe Ezra in the 5th century B.C., but this is the written Torah, Torah Shibiktab, which must be considered as a profane doctrine, exoteric, due to its real divine wisdom, Chokmah. Due to its real divine wisdom, Chokmah is encrypted in the writing, and it can't be interpreted unbeknownst the cryptographic keys of the Kabbalah. Also exists an oral Torah, Torah Shebelpeh which treats about these keys and constitutes the esoteric doctrine of the members of the Kabbalistic chain. Shel Shelet a Kabbalah The main theme of the Torah is the Sinaitic revelation. It means the chokmah that Jehovah, Yehovah, reveals to Moses in the Mount Sinai, and from this fact must necessarily emerges the Kabbalistic chain due to Kabbalah comes from the verb Kabbal, which means receive. However, if Shel Shalet a Kabbalah begins with Moses, it must be remembered that he received two tablets of the law. The first just contained the revelation of the divine wisdom, Hokmah, object of the esoteric doctrine of the Kabbalah. The second was an esoteric synthesis of it, and was encrypted as the whole written Torah. According to the Kabbalah, the first tablets proceeded from the tree of life, that's to say, the intelligence of the one, Bina. Meanwhile, the second were taken from the side of the tree of good and evil. The tree of the science of the good and evil, whose fruit had eaten, was the cause of the expulsion of Adam from paradise. And Jehovah God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, for knowing the good and evil, and now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live, become immortal. Therefore Jehovah God sent him forth from the garden of Eden, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden, cherubim, armed with flaming sword, to keep the way of the tree of life. Genesis 3. Therefore the second tablets are destined to those who want the redemption of Adam's sin, but who still remain subjected to him. The first, instead, reveals the chokmah to whom have elevated themselves above the human condition, to the Adamic state, and deserve to gain the immortality that proceeds from the bina, the intelligence of the tree of life. They can only be, of course, the highest priests of the chosen people. For this reason, Moses veiled the chokmah to the population, and he only communicated it to Joshua. Joshua transmitted it to the elders of Israel, and he sealed magically the concealment in such a manner that they could only be found in the 12th century A.C. by the Templars, who transported it to Clairvaux. Other prophets nonetheless communicated the Hokmah verbally to the priests of the great synagogue, who continued the Kabbalistic chain. After the captivity of Babylon, there were no more prophets in Israel and Esdras. The scribe presented to the Jewish people the exoteric doctrine of the written Torah, based on the second tablets of the law. That doctrine was sustained by the priests of the great synagogue, who were then called scribes, Sophorim, until the advent of the Tanim. From the first to the third century A.C., the great Kabbalists of such period, amongst them stood Simeon bar Yochai, named the Holy Lamp, 
they achieved to transcend the written Torah and to obtain the Chokmah again. Then the oral Torah was transmitted again by the Amoraim, and rabbis, rabbi, until the Middle Ages. Apart from the written Torah, three books can be considered as the most important for the Jewish Kabbalists, the Sefer HaZohar, the Sefer Yetzirah, and the Sefer Iche. The Sefer HaZora, or the Book of the Splendor, was written by Simeon Bar Yochai in the 2nd century AC, but the unique existence version since the 13th century is the translation to Aramaic effectuated by the Spaniard Kabbalist Moses de Leon. The Sefer Yetzira, or Book of the Formation, is older, and the traditional Kabbalistic chain traces its origins to Abraham. But by far the most secret and mysterious book, as the most coveted by the Kabbalists, is the Sefer Iche, or Book of the Fire Holocaust, which is supposed contemporaneous of Adam, and that precedes as the first man from the Garden of Eden. Really, the original book had been written in paradise by the angel Raziel, for the instruction of Adam, and its content would be the own Hakma. Such mystical book must not be confused with the book of Raziel, written in the twelfth century by the Kabbalist Elazar ben Judah of Worms, and based in of second-hand news of the Tablets of Sapphire. According to the rabbinical tradition, the real book of Raziel, engraved tablets of sapphire, had been stolen from paradise by Rahab, king of the sea, and hurled to the ocean. Then it would be found by the Egyptians and would remain for millenniums in the power of pharaohs. Moses would carry with him the exodus, and he would bequeath it to Joshua, from whom, following the Kabbalistic chain, would come to the king Solomon. He would obtain his famous wisdom, Hakma, by the interpretation of the tablets of sapphire, the book of Raziel but noticing its enormous power, he would hide it in the temple in such manner that only the Gollum Templars would find it within the ruins twenty-one centuries later. It is clear, Dr. Signigal, at the light of what I have already exposed in this letter, that the tablets of sapphire and the tablets of the law are the same thing. That's to say that the first tablets, with a hakma proceeding from the Tree of Life, are nothing else than the Book of Raziel given to Moses in Egypt by the priests of the cultural pact. The explanation is the next. If we despoil the Hebrew myth from its cultural custom, results that Rahab is no other than Poseidon, the king of the sea, and legendary ruler of the Atlantis, we arrive in this way. To the Atlantis, the Garden of Eden, homeland of the first man, of such lost paradise came the swarthy Atlanteans, founders of the Egyptian priestly hierarchy. After the cataclysm, they had transported to Egypt one of the Book of Crystal that existed in the library of Atlantis, which contained the register of the construction of the universe by God the One, Jehovah Elohim. That Book of Crystal would be the Book of Raziel, in which were engraved the Thirty-two operations executed by the Creator to build the universe, ten sephiroth, and twenty-two letters. In other words, the tablets taught by means of signs the twenty-two sounds and measures of the sacred alphabet, employed by the Creator One, Yehovah Elohim, from which comes the Hebrew alphabet and the cosmic form adopted by Him to create and sustain the universe. That's to say, the ten sephiroth is what is known as the secret of the serpent. In the age of Moses, the Egyptian priests ignored how to interpret the tablets, but they remembered that the swarthy Atlanteans had left them there to be given to the chosen people by the One, as a fundament of a divine covenant. Moses received in secrecy then the tablets of stone, and he went with his people to Mount Zion, where Jehovah celebrates with his lineage the covenant of fire, Bereth Esh, and reveals the chokmah of the tablets of the law. The retribution demanded by Jehovah to the chosen people would consist, as it can be concluded from the statements of Bera and Bersha, in the supreme holocaust of fire, Iche, from where the book adopts the name that the immortals requested to the four priests in the castle of Aracena. In some, the Templars found the first tablets of the law, the book of Razel, which made possible to the Gullum Church the attainment of the Chokmah for the College of the Constructor of Temples and to outbreak the Architonic Revolution of the Gothic or Gaelic. But even if the mathematical Kabbalistic decoding, it means Gematria, the Book of Raziel, permitted to know the secrets of the construction of the cosmos, as certain images that were seen on it remained 
incomprehensible for the Cistercian golems. Such visions were represented symbolically by the rabbis and golem priests, which constituted the book Sefer Iche. The figures referred in great measure to the Supreme Fire Holocaust, entitled in Hebrew and Latin, that the golems were recently starting to understand with the explanations of Bera and Bersha. Today, Dr. Segnagel, it is believed that exists just one exemplar of the Sefer Iche, which is hidden in a secret synagogue of Israel, to which only the sages of Zion have access. They don't permit to realize copies of it and only authorize to the highest rabbis and initiates of the Kabbalah a visual contact, being condemned with the ritual death any representation or reproduction after the observation. However, apart that Israelite exemplar, there is another copy of the Sefer Iche, is the one that was kidnapped by the Inquisitor Richard the Cruel, Richard de Tarsaval, that's to say, the father of Lito de Tarsis, and that he brought to America in 1534. It is a quite reliable replica of the Templar book, dated in Granada, 1333, that's to say, after the dissolution of the order, and surely copied from the original that the golems and rabbis carried when they escaped from France, from the Grenadine edition, which for centuries has remained in a chest of our house in Tucuman, is the facsimile of the page 12, the attached one for the better comprehension of the descriptions of Bera and Bersha. "'Well, priests!' exclaimed Bera, while he was examining attentively the image that exposed in the page 12 of the Sefer Iche. "'Your order has realized a great work representing with images the wisdom of the Book of Rizel. But the peril of such Hakuma, be in power of the Gentiles, is huge. Thus you must avoid the unnecessary copies of this book and submit it to the most rigorous control. What would be of our plans?' That are the plans of Jehovah, if the Gentiles could remember the secret of the pomegranate, the tree Rimon, practically revealed by this draw. What would we answer if we knew again that a pomegranate was the tree of life, the tree of the paradise that was not allowed to Adam to avoid him to know the secret of life and death? The Gentiles already know that the tree of science of good and evil was an apple tree, and they have relationed it with the rose understanding that it treats about a family of plants which counts also the almond tree amongst them. They know, then, that in all them there are different parts of a unique message, of an idea impressed of the Creator One. However, they will never reach to relate the pomegranates with any tree to form the family because Rimen is archetype of the creation. On it will be discovered similar elements to all the rest species but the same could not be derived of any other thing as Jehovah, contains all them with this form, but he is not contained by any one. The mission that we entrust you is related to the pomegranate of the life, but it is specially referred to one of its fruits, the Sapphira Bina, in which you should inspire to fight against the awful heresy of the house of Tarsus. Yes, priests, even though the lineage of Tarsus died, there still subsists the effect of their luciferic acts, from which is not minor the cult to the virgin of the grotto. Against that impostor you shall fight immediately, developing the attack according to the instructions that we will give you now. In this moment of history, that the very holy as designed for the chosen people is smiling to us, Soon will be established in Europe the universal synarchy. Then will appear the world government of the chosen people, during which will be manifested, upon the Gentile humanity, the irresistible power of the Messiah, for whom will be offered the fire holocaust. But much before such wonderful act be fulfilled, I'd say that in the present days, if it is possible, the order of Melchizedek will raise to the scepter of Spain a child from the house of Israel, gifted with the verb of the Metatron. He will possess the necessary hakma to close the doors that the Hyperborean demons have opened, and to open the doors of the heavenly palaces. Hekoloth, from Eden, the Kabbalistic name of the supreme priest, is Quiblon, will be gifted with the great power. He will emerge from the now and will drag the entire Spain behind the gold that he will offer to them in abundance. Blind as Perseus, Spain will rise the sword and will cut three heads of Medusa in a shelter, beyond the Tenebra Sea, and now a Tartarus, 
which path he will show them. Heed, priests, because we are prophesying it. Is the word of Jehovah which is sprouting from our lips, I repeat. Quiblon will be sent from heaven, an ambassador of Jehovah, and you must know that this region of Huelva has been signalized by Melchizedek as the seat of the embassy of Quiblon, as ports and breakwater for his magical voyages. Yes. The land where the greater sacrifice after the Atlantis was committed. The land where the white Atlanteans gave birth to their luciferic plan. Destined to predispose the uncreated spirit. To outbreak a final battle against the goodness of the creator one. This land, priests, will be redeemed of its sins. Blessed and sanctified by the triple holocaust of the Quiblon. For this reason we let you know, at this time, that you had to occupy the boulder of Saturn. You did it? In fact, O divine Arlem, confirmed the great master of the temple, who was still awaiting the explanation about the mystery of the stone fire. Once received your message, we requested the papal authorization in the same site of the boulder of Saturn. Well, you must know, also, that Ruz Baal, or Boulder of Saturn, is a place consecrated to Bena, the aspect with which Jehovah is manifested as Great Mother. When Quiblon reaches to that sacred place, Jehovah will reflect in him the Shekinah, and he will gift him with the verb of Metatron, how many times descended to Shekinah to the earth. Ten times in front of Israel, hastened to respond the Rabbi Nasi. First in the Garden of Eden, as they heard the voice of the Jehovah Elohim walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hide themselves from the presence of the Jehovah Elohim amongst the trees of the garden. Second, to watch the Tower of Babel. And then Jehovah came down to see the city and the tower that the children of men built. Third, in Sodom, speaketh Jehovah. I will go down now and see whether they have done according to the cry of it, which is to come unto me, and if not, I will know. Fourth, in the burning bush, then Jehovah appeared unto him in a flame of fire, out of the mist of a bush, and Moses looked, and behold, the bush burnt with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Fifth, in Egypt, therefore, I come down to Egypt, to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them out of that land into a good and large land, into a land that floweth with milk and honey, in the place where lives the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Havites, and the Jebusites. Sixth, over the Mount Sinai, Jehovah came down upon Mount Sinai on the peak of the mountain, and Jehovah called Moses up into the mountain. Seventh, on the elders, Jehovah came down in a cloud and spake unto him, and took of the spirit that was in him, and he gave it unto the seventy elders. As soon as the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they failed to do it again. Eighth, over the Red Sea, he bowed to the heavens, come down, and dense clouds he left under his feet. Ninth, in the sanctuary of the temple, Jehovah said unto me, This gate shall be shut. It is not to be opened, and no man shall enter it by it. Because the Jehovah God of Israel hath entered in it by it, therefore it shall be shut. Tenth, he will come in the age of Gog and Magog. Then Jehovah shall go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of the battle of the Atlantis. His feet shall stand upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west, and there shall be a very great valley. The half of the mountain shall remove towards the north, and the other half towards the south, and Jehovah shall be king over all of the earth, and in that day Jehovah shall be one, and his name shall be unique. All the land shall be turned as a plain, from Jeba to Rimon, that's to say Granada, in the Negev, but Jerusalem shall prevail. And in one time amongst the chosen people, added the abbot of Clairvaux. Eleventh on the Messiah, and Jesus, once he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of Jehovah descending like a dove, coming upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I have pleased. Take note, then, 
of the other two more times in which the Shekinah will descend to the earth, suggested Bera. The eleventh, that the abbot has mentioned, is signed with the letter Alf, which reigns the essence of the air. It was a pneumatic descend, symbolized by the fowl of the standard of Israel. It means that Christianity constitutes a holocaust of air for Jehovah Shaddai. The twelfth, now that we announce you, will occur in the boulder of Saturn, in Rus Baal, before Quiblon, when Quiblon seek there the intelligence of the great Mother Bena. That will be a descent, signed by the letter Mem, which expresses the essence of the water. That means that the discovery of Quiblon will constitute a holocaust of water for Jehovah Shaddai. And the thirteenth will occur during the world government of the chosen people. Then the Shekinah will descend on the Messiah before Israel, and the Messiah will be the one with Israel, and Israel will be one with the Shekinah, and Israel will be the one with Jehovah, and Israel will be Jehovah, blessed by the mystery of Israel, and Israel Shekinah will end as always with all the Gentiles, and with two-thirds of its own blood propitiating the judgment of Din of Elohim Gebor, the rigorous judgment of Jeburah, and Israel Shekinah will comply the sentence of Jehovah Sabbath, which has already been pronounced in heaven. That will be a descent characterized by the letter Sin, that defines the essence of the fire. It means that the sentence of the judgment of Din, the final judgment, will constitute a fire holocaust for Jehovah Shaddai. The four priests attended with boundless interest the words of the immortals. But who were more impressed with the great master of the temple? direct responsible of the occupation of Rosbaal from the covenant of Our Lady, La Rabida. 28th Day Rosbaal, the boulder of Saturn, is located at five kilometers from Anuba, the actual city of Huelva, over an elevation of 37 meters, which dominate the Comarca de Palos. It means on the left shore of the confluence of the rivers Tinto and Odiel. In the age when the Phoenicians conquered Anuba, they edified the temple of Rus Baal, specially to satisfy the request of the Hebrew merchants. They were who transported the ships towards those far ports, were the days of Solomon when the riches of Israel could rent the Phoenician fleet, and all the drinking vessels of King Solomon were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver, it was nothing accounted of the days of Solomon." For the king had at sea a navy of Tarsus with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tarsus, bringing gold and silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. As can be read in the chapters of the Book of the Kings, Solomon, who effectively possessed the Chokmah, discovered that Jehovah was also manifested under other aspects, generally identifiable with foreign gods. He worshipped them, or allowed the priests to do it and to raise altars and temples. With the navies of Tarsus they traveled, due to the priests who ordered the construction of the temple of Rus Baal in the far Tartessos. Two hundred years after Solomon, and five hundred before the fall of Tarsus in hands of Carthage, colony of Tyre, Isaiah, who also possessed the Chokmah, knew the plan of the Golem. He could prophesy with mathematical precision its end. Howl, ye ships of Tarsus, for your port is devastated. Who hath taken this counsel? Jehovah Sabbath hath proposed it, to stain the pride, to debase the glory of all the lords of that country. But in the days of Solomon, the most important colony, a part of Tyre, was Zidon, to whose port reached in departure the navies of Tarsus. Well, Zidon is not a Phoenician name, but Greek country with which the Punic men were allied against the Persians. What meant the name? What was its origin? Well, neither more or less than the great tree of the pomegranate, due to the pomegranate in Greek, is side Zion. About the origin, the Greeks gave it such a name because a Hebrew cult was practiced there under King Solomon's auspices. This is the cult to the divine mother of Egypt, side the great wise pomegranate, Rimon Bina in Hebrew. Side as Achiro was wife of the King Solomon in the Greek myths. The Hebrew priests also transported the cult of the great mother Rimon, Bina, to the Phoenician colonies and gave name, amongst others, to the actual Andalusian city of Granada. 
The Phoenicians, in fact, founded a fortified factory which they called Ramon, in honor to the cult practiced by their main customers. However, the Iberian native populations, who wore Pelasgians as the Etruscans, dominated the fruit with the voice grana, which was the same root that the Roman Etruscan malum granatum, that's to say, fruit of many grains. To that citadel of Semite merchants, Ramon was locally called Granada, Granad, and Granada. In reality, the chosen site by the Phoenicians to install their factory was a crossroads of Iberian paths, already occupied by the own Iberians and Greeks, as would be then by the Torduli, Tartessians, and Celts. But being the main objective, the commerce, it is understood that each population fortified their own urban base and appeared in this manner, many citadels, extremely very close to each other, in such way that their posterior unity constitutes the modern city of Granada. Existed, for example, in front to Granada, an ancient city, contemporary to Tarsus, called Vira, Viria, an Indo-European language, according if it's pronounced in Sanskrit or Iranian. And that means demigod man, hero, man who participates of the divinity, wise warrior, etc. Both cities, one dwelled by followers of the Pact of Blood, that's to say Vira, and the other by staunch defenders and propagators of the cultural pact, Granada. They could not live without permanent conflict. Nevertheless, time would show that at least in this case, the god of Granada was stronger than the god of Vira. And Granada ended dominating Vira and the other cities absorbing them into their walls. The Hebrew took this as an unequivocal sign of their messianic destiny and would never forget it. Vira must not be confused with Liber, or Liberi, or Eliberi, or Eliberge, that the Greek Hecaton mentioned, because they were different cities. During the Roman dominion, the cities were still separated, and such situation was maintained even with the Visigothic. The Arabs, in compensation for the provided favors for their invasion, concede to the Hebrews that the control of the city of Granada, or Granatha, according to the new domination, since they would refer to it as the castle of the Jews. But they did even more. After the destruction of Liberi, they installed their farmstead, the heart of Castala, Casala, or Gacela, commonly known as Castilla, another adjacent city and they favored the economic expansion of Medinat, Granata, the mansion of the Jews. That is the end of Elvira, whose inhabitants have to capitulate thousands of years of resistance, and abandon the hill of the same name, and move to Granada. The will occur with Medinat Alhambra, and Medinat Castilla, all would end under the control of the Jews of Granada. In the 13th century, when the narrated event occurred, only subsisted the Arab kingdom of Granada, being the city composed by the influential Jewish neighborhood, situated in the primitive location of the castle of Granada, the Arab neighborhood of the Alhambra, the Mozarab neighborhood of Castilla, of primal Gallo Roman root, and the depopulated Elvira. Finally, I will add that if the Hebrew dominate Rimon to the pomegranate, the Arabs know it as the Roman, which explains why for some time the city was called Hinza Roman, which means Castle of Granada. But in one idiom or other it is proven that the meaning of the name not changed in thousands of years. At the light of such missionary activity of the Hebrew priests who traveled in the navies of Tarsus must be appreciated the foundation of the Temple of Rus Baal, or of the Boulder of Baal. The Phoenicians consecrated every city to Baal and designated the West with a particular name. So the Baal of the Sidons was called Baal Sidon, and one of the Tyre, Baal Tsur, and one of the inhabitants of Tarsus, Baal Tars. From the three main aspects of Baal, this is Baal Chon, the producer, Baal Tammuz, the conservator, and Baal Moloch, the destructor, the Hebrews accepted the last as a personification of Jehovah Sabbath, the aspect of Netza, of Jehovah of the armies, whose guides to the victory by the destruction of the enemies of the chosen people, or Shekinah. The temple of Rus Baal was dedicated nonetheless to the cult of Baal Tammuz, or Jehovah Adonai. When the house of Tarsus was in charge of that Iberian signiory, once free from the Phoenicians after a bloody war, prevented the maintenance of it with the cult of Baal Tammuz Jehovah, 
and dedicated the place in a first moment to the cult of fire, and in a second cultural instance to the cult of cold fire. After the invasion of Halmakar Barca and the destruction of the Tartessian Empire, the Golems established the cult to Baal Moloch in Rus Baal until the Roman reconquest. They recognized in Baal Moloch and Jehovah God of Saturn, who dominated Baldur of Saturn to Rus Baal. But Saturn was no other than the Greek god Cronus, or Kronos, who in that time was active in the Roman pantheon. The priests of Saturn, as will be seen, only replaced the cult of Saturn for the one of his granddaughter, Proserpine, or Persephone. It is easy to demonstrate in comparing the Hebrew myth with the Greek that Jehovah is equivalent to Kronos, and of course, to Tammuz, to Moloch, and Saturn. To begin, Kronos is the son of Uranus, the supreme heaven, as Jehovah Elohim is of Ehye, and both Kronos and Jehovah Elohim are gods of the imminent time of the world, Kronos or Berechit. And the most important, both are enemies of the Cyclops, it means of the White Atlanteans. In regard to it, it is convenient to remember what the Greek myths tell us about Uranus, Kronos, Zeus, Demeter, and Persephone, and clarify such legends by means of the Hyperborean wisdom. Uranus is the supreme heaven, father of the Titans, the Titanus, the Cyclops, and the Hecatoncheris, generations of God from whom descend all the others Greek, divinities, and the humanity. That's to say that Uranus is another representation of the origin, from which had come to the universe his own creator, Jehovah Satan, and the successive Hyperborean spirits, the first gods, as the traitors who incarcerated his comrades to the animal man as the loyals or liberators, who seek their orientation and return to the origin. But one of the sons of Uranus, Kronos Jehovah, castrates his father and declares the war to the Cyclops, to whom he avoided to dwell in their habitual abode, and precipitates in the infernal Tartarus. It means that Kronos Jehovah closes the access to the origin, point of provenance and return of all the uncreated spirits as himself castrating the generator principle of the gods, preventing his divine birth. Therefore he is involved in a war with the Cyclops. But who were the Cyclops? The White Atlanteans, the weapon constructors of the Atlantis, according to the Greek legends. The Cyclops fabricated the Ark and the arrows of Apollo, the Hyperborean and the ones of his sister Artemis, the bear goddess. Previously, during the war of Kronos Jehovah, they had provided Zeus with the arms of the thunder, the lightning and the ray, the Poseidon, king of the Atlantis, the arms of the trident, and to Hades or Vides, the famous helm of invisibility. After the battle of the Atlantis and the cataclysm that submerged its continent, the white Atlanteans had to march towards the infernal lands, which was only dwelled by the animal man, and the most degraded hybrid races of the earth. There, when the legend represents to the Cyclops, divine constructors roaming through the infernal regions. And during their transit for such lands of madness, we have seen, they were closely persecuted by the swarthy Atlanteans, the minions of Kronos Jehovah. But Kronos, notwithstanding all his efforts, can't avoid the birth of Zeus, other son of the origin. The image of Zeus has been outrageously degraded by the priests of the cultural pact, but reviewing the older versions of the myth, it is possible to recognize him to Christos Lucifer, the Lord of Venus, who descended to the Atlantis to bring the grail that would make possible the orientation and liberation of the incarcerated spirit to the matter, the awakening of the spirit of man. For this reason, Zeus is a natural ally of the Cyclops, who provide him with the arms with which he beats Kronos Jehovah and secured his power in the Olympic region of the earth, it means in Katagar, where is initiated the path towards Venus. Zeus Lucifer fights against Kronos Jehovah in company of Poseidon and Hades, and with the technical support of the Cyclops, once victorious in a primitive version of the Battle of the Atlantis, the gods are established and determined parts of the universe. Zeus Lucifer goes to the Olympus, that's to say, to Katagad, but through its door, its real domicile is constituted in heaven. It means in Venus, Poseidon and the Atlantis as king, and also as god of the sea, and Hades goes to Katagar too, but without returning to Venus, as Zeus Lucifer did, but remaining as lord of the terrestrial abode of the liberator gods to the spirit of man.
a place that the priests of the cultural pact, according to what I have exposed to the tenth day, would identify with the infernal Tartarus. Hades is Vides, the lord of Katagar. With Demeter, a daughter of the origin, Zeus procreates Persephone, the goddess that the Roman priests of Saturn Kronos Jehovah evoked in Rus Baal, for her cult and to whom they dedicated the Carthaginian temple of Baal Moloch Jehovah. She was a cruel goddess, who dwelled in the infernal Tartarus with Hades, and consolated perfectly with such remote region of Tartessos, famous for the ancient legend that signalized her as the residence of Medusa. Demeter was the goddess of the wheat, who gave to men for the first time such cereal, and lived with Zeus in the Olympus. He had no other sons, a part of Persephone, who was raptured by Hades and guided to the Tartarus, to a mansion that required to cross the country of the deads to reach her. The Greek myth that saddened for her absence, Demeter, abandoned the Olympus and descended to the earth to seek her, because she ignored her infernal location. She learns in this manner that Zeus has been accomplice of Hades in the rapture. For nine nights Demeter seeks in vain to Persephone, carrying a torch on hand, finally guided by Hecate, the goddess of the sorcery, to whom she found in the crossroads of certain paths. She finds out that Persephone is located in the country of the deads. She goes down there alone, to warn that the definitive return of her daughter is impossible. Persephone has eaten a grain of pomegranate, and she can't go back to the world of lives any more, because all who eats food of the country of the dead remains prisoner there forever. In the hells is precise to make fasting to avoid the death. At last, Demeter returns to Olympus with Persephone, who notwithstanding that has to return periodically to hell to perform the death the myth of Persephone, formed part of the Eleusinian mysteries, where were explained esoterically to the initiates. The attributes of Demeter, by other part, were the ear of wheat and the crane. Until here the Greek myth, but what is hidden behind the legend of Demeter and Persephone, I already explained that Hades is the degraded name of Vides, the lord of Katagar, to whom the conspiracy of the cultural pact equated to a god who is lord of the hell or Tartarus. In the same way the priests threw there Persephone, an ancient white Atlantean goddess. Who am I referring to? To Freya, the wife of Nabutan, to discover the real facts behind the story of Persephone and interpret the cause of the Kalmani. It is necessary to take present that for the white Atlanteans, as for every member of the Hyperborean race, the wife is also the sister, identity which goes further than a simple symbolic association, and refers to the mystery of the original couple of the uncreated spirits. Freya, a part of being his wife, is sister of Nabutan, to whom the Greek priests of the cultural pact equated to Demeter, the goddess who gave to men for first time the plant of the wheat, the keeper of the seed. Thenceforth it is said that never to have a son of Demeter, to whom she would have conceived being virgin in Venus, that's to say, in the Olympus, as I already related the twelfth day. Her spiritual son Navutan, who auto-crucified himself in the tree of terror, the pomegranate of life, to discover the secret of the death, and would be his wife, Freya, who would resuscitate him, revealing with her dance the secret of the life and death. For this reason the legends only mention Freya Persephone, whose name was very ingrained amongst the populations of the Pact of Blood, and they cast the veil of taboo over the feet of Nabutan. The swarthy Atlanteans and the priests of the cultural pact wanted to hide by every means the posterior legacy that the resurrected great white chief made unto men, i.e. the mystery of the labyrinth. Was Nabutan in fact the real inspirator of the mystery of the labyrinth? in whose course was administered to the Hyperborean initiates a cult sign, Tyro Dingerber, formed with the uncreated runes, such sign permitted to the incarcerated spirit to wake up and orient towards the origin, finding the exit of the labyrinth of the illusion in which was strayed. Nevertheless, as in the case of the feet of Nabutan, the exit could never be found by the hero with absence of his original couple. Another way he can die, a spiritually, after the nine nights hanging from the tree of terror. Thereby, in that the cultural humbug of the priests wanted Ama Demeter to search for Freya Persephone for nine nights. Who guides her, finally, is Hecate, with whom she coincided in a crossroads of paths. It means, in the inferior of a labyrinth, 
Hecate, is then a general representation of what Freya would be individually for Navutan. Their original couple, for the ancient Greeks and all the crossroads of paths was Hecate, pleased to orient the lost journeyman towards his better destiny symbol, that as it is seen, came from far away. Notwithstanding this wonderful goddess, to whom Tricephalus statues were erected, that indicated the triple nature of the white man, physical, soul, and uncreated spirit. She was finally converted in a goddess of the sorcery and witch, consequence of course of the cultural pact. Naturally, the rapture of Freya Persephone is a spiritual rapture, realized by herself to resuscitate her husband. It means in the impulse of a sacred ecstasy. Zeus Lucifer, allegedly the father of his own Navutan, and Hades Vais, the lord of Katagar, are the sages of the age to whom she asks about the manner to save his husband. And the counsel that she received from them was to make her decide to go down the hell of illusion, the homeland of the spiritually dead. It means to the earth, the world of the asleep men, and it is known that who eats from the illusion, who let her enter inside himself the great deceit of the one, remains changed forever in the matter, unable to return to the origin, lost in the enchanted labyrinth of the warm life. However, Freya had not tasted the forbidden fruit, was free to go back, if she wanted, to the origin, keeper of the secret of the death was her decision to resuscitate Navutan, revealing by means of the dance, the knowledge of the Kalachakra key. But for it she had to believe in the death. She had to eat a grain of the pomegranate and become a patridge. She had to transcend the mask of the death and reach to the end of Navutan's being. And Navutan, when he saw the death head on, he awakened and understood the death, resurrecting then and revealing to the asleep man the secret of the labyrinth. But in this legacy, Navutan compromised his divine wife, who agreed to remain periodically in the infernal Tartarus, that's to say, in the world of the asleep man, and to show herself before them with the image of the death, to make them transcend in the mystery of the cold fire and resuscitate also as men of stone, as Hyperborean initiates, as wise warriors. A pallid reflect of this part of the story is conserved in the legend of the young Perdix, sister, therefore wife, of Daedalus, the inventor of the labyrinth. It means of Navutan. When Perdix was falling into an abyss, the goddess of the wisdom, Athena, felt mercy for her, and she converted her in patronage. From where emerged the Greek belief that the patronage's dance resolved the enigma of the labyrinth, which gave place to the college of priestesses bent on reproducing such dance. I already explained that Kronos, Saturn, Jehovah closes the access to the origin, point of province, and return of all the uncreated spirits. That's to say, he cuts off the path towards the exit of the labyrinth. And the Cretan myth, the inventor of the mystery of the labyrinth is Daedalus Navutan, who cuts off the path to the exit, is the Minotaur, a half-human, half-bull being. But the god who has also had the feet of a bull was Dionysus, defect that obeyed him to wear the boots of buskins. And Dionysus, the god of wine, was classically assimilated to Jehovah by the ancient Hebrews, who signed both of them to the god of barley. In this manner is closed a circle traced by the priests of the cultural pact in which are collected, in different ages and places, the representations of Kronos, Saturn, Jehovah, Dionysus, Sebastio, and the Minotaur, our guardian of the exit. Finally, I will tell that in times of the prophet Amos, the 8th century B.C., the identity of Jehovah and Saturn was established and accepted by the priests. But ye have borne the sanctuary of Sikoth, Saturn, the idol of your God. Therefore I will deport you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith Jehovah, whose name is Adonai Sabbath. But the situation didn't change after the captivity, because in the age of the prophet Ezekiel the sixth century BC, was worshipped interchangeably as Jehovah or Tamus Adonis. That's to say, Adonai. Then he brought me to the door of the temple of Jehovah, which was towards the north. And I saw there sat women weeping for the death of Adonis, Ramon Tammuz. Twenty-ninth day. To comprehend the reason of the cult of Persephone in Rusbaal, it is necessary to advance a lot in the historical time, and reach an age in which the priest of the cultural had obtained to confuse profoundly in the individual fears of Demeter Ama and Persephone Freya. 
to whom they just called the goddess. The objective of the priests was to replace the Hyperborean Atlantean goddess for the image of the great mother Bina, one of the aspects Yehovah the Creator won. Is here where must be located the myth of Adonis, Greek name of Adonai, the Lord Yehovah. According to the Greek myth, the mother was Mira, the one that the gods had converted in tree when she was pregnant of Adonis. Mira, the same vegetal that one of the wise men of the East sent by the white fraternity offered to child Jesus. The tree of the Mira gives birth to Adonis, born a child who represented the beauty, which is not more than a symbolic manner to say that the Tifereth, the beauty in the heart of Jehovah, one of his ten aspects, born the tree of the pomegranate, continues the myth stating that Aphrodite, the goddess of fire of love, in other words, the archetype of the warm fire in the heart, falls in love for this child, and she entrusted his care to Persephone. We have already presented then that the great mother Bina, the aspect, intelligence of Jehovah, both goddess Aphrodite and Persephone, end competing to conquer the love of Adonis Adonai, which means that to the animal man or common man representations of Adam. It is normal to enter in conflict with the warm fire in the heart, Tiferet, and the intelligence that Bina infuses in the mind. This ambivalence can be seen in the irresolution of the myth. Adonis Adonai must be pleased to stay alternatively with each one of the goddess. Although the preeminence that the priests concede to the heart as seat for the soul, wanted God Beo to pass a longer time with Aphrodite than with Persephone. The heart is connected to the symbol of the rose, and is in this manner that the death of Adonis Adonai brings to the world red roses, born from the blood of her wound. Is Artemis the bear goddess, who causes that a wild boar hurts mortally the god. The opposition between the wild boar, one of the manifestations of Vishnu, and the bear is a classic theme in the Hyperborean wisdom. I will only tell that the wild bear is related to the mystery of the golem, as were seen in the murder of the Vrayas of Tarsus, and that the myth indicates allegorically a grade reached by them, a hierarchical level, which will allow them to carry out the ensign of Israel, when the own chosen people be unable to do it, when Adonis Adonai be draining blood momentarily in the Pardes Rimomenon to create the roses that will flourish during the universal synarchy. In Phrygia, the Golem officiated as priests of Sebele and adopted the practice of the ritual sodomy, vice that still subsists in the high grades of the masonry created by them. The Phrygian myth of Adonis Adonai was one of the Addis, in whose cult the Golem would develop a fundamental leading role. There the great mother Bina was called Sibele, goddess that propitiated scandalous orgies and demanded to her priests of the dog to be eunuchs. In the course of the cult was common that, taken by the orgiastic frenzy, many participants castrated themselves voluntarily, as the archetype Addis, passing to integrate then, survived from the mutilation, the court of sodomites that worshipped and served to the goddess. According to the Phrygian legend, Sebele was worshipped as stone of fire, eager to copulate with her, Zeus Hokma, places over the stone his semen, act that impregnates the goddess. The Adgitis borns, an androgynous being who has been drunk and castrated by Dionysus Jehovah with the finality to individualize his sex. From the wound of Agdictus drains abundant blood, which is transformed in the tree of the pomegranate. Reason why Addis, as Adonis, was called Rimen, pomegranate. However, the maimed phallus of Addictus, hurled to the earth, is transformed in the tree of the almond, a member of the family of the roses, a pomegranate, fruit of the pomegranate of Agdictus, impregnates Nana, daughter of the god Sanguinary River. From this pregnancy borns Addis, a beauty god similar to Adonis. And as Adonis for Addis will fight for the great mother Bina and the goddess of the warm fire in the heart, Tipereth, Agdictus, now converted in woman, falls in love with Addis, as also Sibylle, with whom she has to dispute the favors of the beauty god. Evidently, Addis is a Phrygian, Adonis, a representative of the beauty of Jehovah in the heart, pretended simultaneously by great mother Bina Sebeli and by Tipereth Agdictus Aphrodite. But the Phrygian myth contains more details. 
Addis, Madra Dictus, castrates herself and dies due to the mutilation. During the cult of Sibylle, the goddess buries him and plants on her tomb an almond tree. Addis was then a eunuch and a sodomite. Signed by the symbols of the pomegranate and the almond, what clearly proves that the origin of the myth is Hebrew. Remember Dr. Signagel, on the other hand, that the Jacobins, who developed the French Revolution, whose chiefs were Jews and Gollum, identified themselves with the Phrygian hat, that's to say, the hat of the priests of Phrygia, which comes formed of cranied foreskin, to indicate the sodomite character of the priests of the great mother Sibylle Bena, the goddess of reason, of the encyclopedists. Must not surprise at this point that Dionysus Sabasio was a god of the barley as Jehovah, who castrated Agvictus after he drunk with him wine of barley. Jehovah had sanctified the Saturday, the day that in all the Mediterranean was dedicated to the cult of Saturn, into which was dedicated the pomegranate. Saul, the first king of Israel, consecrated the kingdom Melkahuth. The pomegranate which represented to Jehovah, Dionysus, the one of the bull's feet and boots, was a hobble god, as a minotaur, as hobbling was the dance of the labyrinth that they had practiced, and that they still dance, the male patriages. This dance was performed by the Hebrew priests of Baal Tammuz Adonis in times of Elijah, ninth century B.C. And the priests took the bullock, which was given to them, and after they prepared it they called on the name of Baal Tammuz Adonis from morning until noon, saying, O oh Baal, hear us! But there is no voice, no answer. Meanwhile they danced hobbling next to the altar which they had made. The Hebrew word pesach, which designates the Easter, means precisely hobbling dance, because such festivity was the same than the one Baal Adonis, the god Ramon who was killed by a wild boar. This identity is the origin of the prohibition to eat hog meat on the Saturdays. Also, the Levitical tradition decreed that the Easter lamb, the victim of the Holocaust of the Easter, had to be served over a platter of pomegranate's wood. The pomegranate was the only fruit that could be introduced in the Sancta Sanctorum, and the supreme priest to make the annual entrance in the temple. It had sewn on his ephod little tassels of pomegranate's form. The roll of the Torah was wrapped up in a stick called Es Chajim, i.e., the Tree of Life which was topped on each extreme with two carved pomegranates. And the octuple candelabrum, Chanuka, possesses a pomegranate crowning each arm in which Yod shines, the eye of Jehovah. The septuple, candelabrum, on its part, menorah, has seven shafts of almond flour that evokes the institution of the priesthood of Aaron, when the almond's rod flourished that Moses gave him, and occurred that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and the rod of Aaron, of the house of Levi, was budded, and brought forth buds, and bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds. To perpetuate the remembrance of this miracle, Jehovah said, Thou shalt make a candelabrum of pure gold, of work beaten out with the hammer shall the candelabrum be made. Its shaft, branches, bowls, knops, and flowers shall be the same. Six branches also shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candelabrum in one side, and three branches of the candelabrum on the other side, three bowls like unto almonds in one side, one knop and one flower in one branch, and the same in the other. And according to the vision of the prophet Zechariah, these seven lamps are the eyes of the Jehovah which run through the whole earth. That is a representation of the Shekinah. The cults of Rus Baal, the ancient of Baal Tammuz Adonis, practiced by the Hebrew priests, and the one of Baal Moloch, officiated by the Golem, were interpreted by the Romans as different forms of adoration for Kronos Saturn, a god equivalent to Jehovah Adonai, or Rimon Addis Adonis Dionysus. Since the 3rd century BC, the priests of the cultural pact who proliferated in Rome dedicate Rus Baal to the cult of Persephone, the infernal lover of Adonis. In the same age and at a short distance the lords of Tarsus consecrated to the cult of Vesta of Tarsus and the goddess of the fire of home, behind her they veiled their conception of the cult of the cold fire. Both opposed cults, the fire of Vesta from Tarsus, and the other of the warm fire of Persephone de Palos, are performed simultaneously without any of them surpass the other. And it is worthy to repeat that such version of Persephone was equivalent to the late Persephone, closer to the great mother Sebel Benah.
then the old Persephone, or Freya, the wife of Navutan, in the 2nd century A.C. Always furtively, Bera and Bersha reached to Huelva. But this time they didn't attack the house of Tarsus, but they go to Rus Baal, to supervise the cult of Persephone under the command of Melchizedek, a supreme priest of the White Fraternity. The temple of Comarca de Palos started to gain fame for the miracles that the goddess realized. The main of them was the cure of the hydrophobia, that all the regions of the peninsula and even overseas came the bitten or infected by the dog's bite to recover the lost health. Only when they heard to Bera and Bersha against the dog the illusion of the rage. The four priests understood those ancient miracles were related to the powers of Bera and Bersha. One century later, in the year 159, the missionary, Syracus, converts the cult of Rusbael in Christian by the simple process of identifying Persephone with the Virgin Mary. Since then called Our Lady of the Ribat, because the goddess continue healing the hydrophobia. But in that time as Mary, Mother of God, Persephone was already a completed image of the great Hebrew Mother Bena. The name of the Rabbit was then 500 years older than the denomination Rapta or Rapita, which the Arabs used to signalize the hermitage edified in Ruspael. Over the foundations of the ancient chapel of Our Lady of Ribat, once occurred the reconquest, the hermitage passed in a beginning to the hands of the solitary monks of San Francisco, who built the convent with its actual dimensions, but soon was given by the Pope to the Templars, who occupied it until the dissolution of their order. The bishop, St. Macarius, to celebrate the liberation of the convent, made a donation to the Constantine soldier, Daniel, of a sculpture that the tradition attributed to the Apostle St. Luke and that represented the Virgin Mary. The moment which I am evoking, when the immortals Bera and Bersha were gathered with the four priests in the castle of Aracena, such sculpture was still in the convent of the Ribat in Ruspael in front of the Comarca de Palos. Thirtieth Day The four priests of Jehovah Satan were meditating about the announcement of the immortals. Then the twelfth manifestation of the Shekinah would occur, very near from there in Ruspael and there would be protagonists of the extraordinary portent. Only other priests of Israel could comprehend the ecstasy that the four of them experienced before such possibility. Because only the soul of a Jew is capable to understand the Shekinah, the most excited was the great master of the temple. Oh, what a great honor, he shivery thought, that to my order has been entrusted the custody of such sacred place. The own God will descend now amongst the hours. And with this style, each one of them released their golem in rabbinic fantasies. Indeed, priests, approved Bersha, reading the thought of the presence. You will contribute as nobody to execute the plans of God. Thousands of golems, monks, and Hebrew doctors are working for the establishment of the universal synarchy. All of them are favored by Elohim, and they will be magnificently rewarded. But only four of you know today the announcement of the Shekinah, and only to you, and to whom you call to collaborate, Yehovah will consider responsible of the water holocaust that Quiblon will offer in this day. Rejoice then, priests, because the triple holocaust of Quiblon, one of the most signiary of history, will attribute to you if you comply with the mission that will entrust you. Of that depends the realization of the plan of Jehovah. On it rests, priests, one of the pillars of history. Now that the evil has been extirpated from Huelva, continued Bera, now that the blood of Tarsus has been converted in pitch, we will entrust you a very simple mission, which is to affirm the good on earth. And the good is Jehovah, and Jehovah can only descend in holy land. To you correspond, priests of Jehovah, the purification of the earth. The gaze of Bera was questioner. Yes, exclaimed Nazi and Benjamin with one voice. The purification of the earth is the work of the priests. To sanctify it is faculty of God. Agree, priests, we, the representatives of Melchizedek, command you to purify this land of Huelva, erase any vestige of the mystery of cold fire, clean the stain of the cult of the Virgin of the Grotto, and above all, remove the remembrance of this tenebrous deity. 
because there will be no peace, nor in earth, nor in heaven, and Rusbael will not be holy land, while the perturbing presence of Virgin of Agatha keeps carrying the damned seed. Naturally, said Bersha, that such atonement will only be effective if a cult is replaced by another. In consequence, we also command you to implant in all the necessary places the new cult of the Virgin of Miracles. She will illuminate with her warm fire the shades that the intruder shed. When the Gentiles give their hearts unconditionally, the intruder will be forgotten. The remembrance of her abomination will be obscured, and the earth will be purified. Then, and only then, the Shekinah will descend in Rusbael. But that cult already exists, interrupted the great master of the temple. Precisely in La Rabida is worshipped the virgins of miracles, the ancient Persephone the Palos, Lady of the Rage. You are wrong, priests, assured Bera, smiling horribly. I am referring to a new cult that will also replace the one that you are mentioning. The cult of the great mother Bena, to whom you will advocate as virgin of miracles to avoid that the Gentiles suspect the substitution, but who will receive many sacred names, only knew by the initiated priests, golems, and rabbis. I am referring to the virgin of pomegranate. Or the Virgin de la Cinta, or the Virgin de la Barca, or the Virgin of the Earthen Child, or the Virgin of the Warm Fire. Bring, priests, now the sculptor monk that you have brought from France. The abbot of Clairvaux went out hasty from the library, and one instant later he was entering, followed by a humble Cistercian monk, who was carrying in his hands a scroll of parchment and a smut of charcoal. The monk stopped before Bera, followed by the abbot and contemplated, terrified, the diabolic countenance of the immortal. "'Listen well, miserable!' snapped Bera with his eyes full of hate. "'I will make you a warning, and what you'll see in this place you'll never talk with any one. You will comply with your work, and then you will cloister forever in an enclosed monastery, and you don't dare to disobey our mandate because the earth will be small to hide your betrayal. However, we don't trust you, and you will be watched day and night since now. But you must know, mortal creature, that not even death could save you from us, because the own hells will go to punish you. Have you understood the risks that you run? The poor monk had thrown himself to the ground, to the feet of Vera, and he was trembling as a frightened dog. No, no, I never did dare to betray you. He was babbling, without lifting his gaze from the feet of Bera, without daring to see again the mortal threat of his eyes. "'You'd better be telling the truth,' said with irony such king of the lie that was Bera. "'Get up, dog,' he ordered with rudeness, "'and watch the page of this open book. What do you see on it?' The four priests looked at each other, astonished, because the immortals were showing to the sculptor monk, who was neither theologian nor cabalist, and much less an initiate, a secret drawing of the Sefer Iche. Trying to calm himself, the sculptor supported both his hands on the edge of the ramp table and observed the indicated page. What he saw made him forget immediately the bitter previous moments, and he would repeat to himself all his life. That rewarded all the afflictions suffered before that moment. For first time he felt free of guilt, without sin, forgiven by the piety, which came from inside of the soul, as if the soul was participating by a divine joy, and who inspired such feeling of anemic freedom. That security of being accepted by God and loved by Christ was the most beautiful and majestic image of the Mother of God that the monk had ever seen. Because, in peace, as though she was alive, while sustained the child in her arms, the mother looked at him fleetingly and was in that moment that he felt forgiven, in peace, as if she would have to tell him, Go, son of God, that I will intercede to make the rigor of his law, but not be recalcitrant with you. Comply with your mission, and do a portrait of me, and the plenitude of my holiness, to make the men could see also the miracle that you see. Comply with all your talent, and the great countenance of God will smile on you. It's so beautiful! screamed the sculptor, completely hallucinated. Only a few hands guided by the grace of God, and a stone blessed by the Almighty, could realize the work that they asked me. 
but I will put my hands to the service of God, and you, who are powerful, will provide me of the best alabaster stone of the world. And deploying the scroll next to the book, he started to draw feverishly the portrait of a virgin with a child of the newfangled features. The four priests were surprised, due to it was evident that his vision not came from the book Sefer Ice, at least from the page that was at sight, but rather another reality, of a celestial world that had been opened before his eyes and had revealed the lady of his inspiration. With unusual patience, the immortals awaited a large hour until the monk seemed to return to reality. Over the table was placed completed the graphic synthesis of the supernatural vision. Eminences, now I understand your reserves said the carver, still excited. You undoubtedly, with the authorization of the Lord, have allowed me to lean out in heaven and contemplate the Holy Mother. I assure you that even if I will always remember it, and my work remains as testimony of this vision, I will never say a word about the origin of the same. As you warned me at the beginning, I respond for it with my life. But, he narrowed his eyes and reflected aloud for himself, what is death? before the even more terrifying possibility to lose favor of the mother of god to fail her i will comply he said screaming now oh yes i will comply for her do you feel capable to carve the statue that we need asked bertia without many contemplations of the mystical state of the sculptor monk oh yes i will put all my art and the divine inspiration overwhelms me to make the most perfect finish to this image and he signalized the charcoal-sketched drawings over the fine leather of the scroll. In these were exposed a sublime mother, gifted of a beautiful countenance of Israelite features, and dressed with the same nationality, with the head covered by a large mantle down to her waist, and sustaining the child with the left hand, while in the right one she wore a scepter crowned with pomegranate. The corpse body of the mother gave the impression of being slightly inclined to the left peradventure to leave that the divine child occupies the center of the scene the child by his part was looking straight and blessing the observed with a gesture of the right hand while on the left he sustained a sapphire of bis and tare both the mother and child were crowned the mother was wearing a queen's crown that the sculpture annotated which was constructed of pure gold and the child had a hoop of silver and halo three almond flowers proportionally separated from the sixth petal of each flower sprouted nine rays, symbol of the nine powers of the Messiah. To the feet of virgin, diver symbols, as snails and fishes, indicated the marine nature of the devotion. She by herself was situated over the waves. "'We will trust you up to a point, although you will be watched,' threatened Bersha after he examined the sketch. "'We like what you have seen and what you want to do. You are fortunate, Lamb of God. Now go back to your cell. You have much to pray for and meditate.' Moments later, the six of them were gathered before the Sefer Ice. "'What was the vision of the monk, O oh immortals? Certainly that was not the figure of the page lament,' asked the abbot of Clairvaux. "'Certainly not.' answered Bersha. Bera made the sculptor to eat a grain of this fruit, and he signalized the pomegranate bana. In fact, confirmed Bera, we have allowed the monk to peek into the seventh heaven, the palace where the Messiah dwells, and the divine couple of the aspects of Jehovah that reigns the seventh heaven. The mother bana shedding the creator intelligence of Jehovah Elohim with the warm fires of his love, and the blow of Jehovah is the soul of the Messiah. The child whose form is Metatron, whose horse is Araboth, the clouds whose round is realized over the waters of Avir, the ether, and whose manifestation is the Shekinah, the descent of Jehovah onto the kingdom. We have done this because we needed to represent such vision over a first stone, and to exhibit in La Ravida, to replace the statue of Bishop Maricus, that the Templar guarded. The carving will be realized in secrecy, and when it is finished, you will substitute it with major discretion. It will be affirmed then, with more emphasis than ever, that the same is work of the evangelist, that the own Saint Luke carved in the first century. It is important to do it in this way, because Quiblon some day will reach to Ruspaal to confirm the key. That will be Sam." It means Shekinah, Avir Metatron, the universal key of the Messiah. For the new image of the virgins of miracles, he will know that there will be manifested the Shekinah you gift it with the verb of Metatron through Avir, the ether. 
As you know, the image of the Sephirotic Remen tree symbolizes Adam Elah, the man of above, also called Adam Kadamon, the primordial man, the human form of Jehovah, which is reproduced in Adam Harishon, the terrestrial man. In the fruits of the divine pomegranate of life are the ten archetypical names, numbers, with which he adopted the aforementioned form and gave existence to all the created entities. These names, numbers, called Sephiroth, are the nexus between the unity of Jehovah and the plurality of the entities. For Jehovah the Sephiroth are identical, and one with the one. For the world the Sephiroth are different, and give existence to the multiple that constitute the reality. Seen from the world by us, the created beings, the ten Sephiroth emanate successively from the one without dividing it, and springs from the tree Ramon. The first fruit is Kether, the crown of Aye, the essential aspect of Jehovah. Beneath the Kether is the throne of God, the highest of the creation. Kether is the saint elder. Atika Kadish, or even more, the ancient of the days, Atika del Kadim. He sits on the throne, and even he reaches alone to Metatron, who descends some time amongst men. As he spoke with Moses in the Sinai, and guided them to the ancients of the days, is what said to Moses, I am who I am. Eir Asher Eye. The power of Eye is extended directly over the seraphim, Hayoth, Hakadosh, that's to say, holy souls, constructor of angels of the universe. From Kether emerges the second of the Sephiroth, the Sephira Hokmah, the wisdom of Yah, the Father God. The Hokmah is the divine thought of all the entities. There is nothing that already existed, exists or will exist that was not before in potency in the Hokmah. Many are the grains of this fruit, father of all the fruits of the earth. This same image of the tree Ramon is product of the Sephira Hokmah, which in this case reveals to itself. Who is present in the Hokmah and introduce men in the sphere of the Father? is Raziel, the angel who wrote for Adam in the first book of the law. But the wisdom of the father crosses the duct Dahat, and is reflected in Bena, the third Sephirah, which divine intelligence is necessary to fulfill the creation of the thought entities. Bena is the great universal mother. For her the wisdom of the father produces the fruits of the world and the content of the worlds. The warm fire of his universal love floods the ether Avir, and transmits to all the worlds the intelligence of Jehovah Elohim. The third aspect of the One, under his power are the energic angels Aralem, who acts in the sphere of Saturn. But the main angel, the one who communicates men with the Divine Mother, is Sephakil, who is guider of Noah, the great navigator. Bina is thereby lady of the seamen. Kether, Hokma, and Bina constitute the great countenance of the elder Iraka. The seven Sephiroth of construction that remain form, the small countenance of God, reflection of the great countenance, and first access to the one that man can obtain starting from any created thing. The next Sephiroth are numerations which emanated from the essential trinity Kether, Hokma, and Bina. Hoesed and Netza that are at the rights of the tree Ramon. They are male as the father, Din and Hod, female as the mother, Fructify from the left of the pomegranate, and the central column of a trunk grows the neutral fruits that synthesizes the opposites of two successive trinities, Din, Tifereth, Hosed, creator and productive, and Hod, Yesod, Netza, executor and consecrator of the entities. At last, in the center is Malkuth, the kingdom that reflects the Kether. The crown and the synthesis manifests the form of the Ancient of the Days. For the kingdom descends the Shekinah to the earth, and the kingdom of God will be concentrated in the earth when the Shekinah takes the form of the chosen people governed by the King Messiah. The fourth Sephirah is thereby Hosed, the grace of Elohai. His mercy and piety is the right hand of Jehovah, and under his power are these creatures of the heavens called Dominions and Hasamilim, which act in the sphere of Jupiter. The main angel is Zadkiel, which guides out of Abraham. 
the fifth Sifra is Din, the rigor of Elohim Gibor. From this fruit comes the law of God, and its grains are the sentences of his tribunal. Every human act and every entity of the creation must submit to the judgment of Jeburah, of Elohim Gibor. Is the left hand of Jehovah, and under his power are the authorities called Seraphim, who influence in the sphere of Mars. The main angel is Kamiel, the protector of Samson. The sixth Sifra is Tifereth, the beauty of Jehovah, united with the Sifra Hosed and Din, conform the triad productor of the created entities, Din, Tifereth, Hosed. But in reality Tifereth is the heart of Jehovah, the seat of the warm fire of the great mother Benah. The Tifereth, the form acquires the archetypical perfection of the supreme beauty. The acts of men inspired by Tifereth can only be acts of love, and the created entities are relegated amongst them by the universal love that the heart of Jehovah irritates. In Tifereth everything is beauty and perfect, because the wisdom of Chokmah, of the flawless thought things, and the intelligence of Binah, of his conception, produced by the grace Hosed, and adjusted to the rigor Din of the law, shines in its fruit. But Tifereth is not a pomegranate, but a strawberry, a rose, other part of the message one, the love of Jehovah towards the anemic man. The strawberry Tifereth is transformed in rose when the heart of the terrestrial men shelters the warm fire of the animal passion. Under his power are the angels that operate through the sphere of the sun, the virtues called Malachim. And here exist two powerful angels. One, Raphael, who was guider of Isaac, and the other, Peliel, who leaded the destiny of Jacob, some angels who should be higher act here. They are the seraphim Nephilim, that the white Atlanteans accuse of traitor angels, but really they serve to Jehovah with energetic dedication, carrying out their plans of human progress and favoring the creation of the universal synarchy of the chosen people. They founded the white fraternity, and established their residence in the heart of Jehovah, and of them depend the cult, hierarchy of priests of the earth. The seventh Sifra, Netzah, revealed the victory of Jehovah Sabbath. The god of the celestial armies is the right column of the temple, Jaquim, and under his power of the principalities are Elohim, the angels that influence from the sphere of Venus. Serviel, the director angel of David, chairs it. The eighth Sifra is Hod, the glory of Elohim Sabbath, the left column of the temple Boaz, who dominates the archangels Ben Elohim, which is expressed from the sphere of Mercury. Michael, the inspirator of Solomon, is here the main angel. The ninth Sifra is Yasad, the fundament of the creation of Jehovah Sadai, the Almighty, is the reproductive organ of Jehovah, and with Netzah and Hod, compose the last constructor triad or executive. Hod, Yesod, Netzah, its power includes the angels known as cherubim, who are manifested from the sphere of the moon, and the main angel is Gabriel, protector of Daniel. And the tenth Sephirah is Malkuth, the kingdom of Adonai Melech, the lord king of the creation last reflect of the ancient of the ancients. For this reason, under his power, are situated all the members of the occult hierarchy and the white fraternity, the Isim of the chosen people, and for them the main angel is Metatron, the soul of the Messiah. Malkuth is the inferior mother, as Benah is the superior mother. But if the descent of the inferior mother is externalized in the chosen people, and this passes to be the Shekinah, the mystical wife of Jehovah. Thirty-first day. You know well all this, added Bera, who is describing the draw of the Sefer Iche. But I have repeated the essential to avoid misunderstandings. But immediately we will explain the mystery of the stone of fire. Such explanation that was requested to us by the great master of the temple needs the previous and exact comprehension of the work of the One, the creation of Jehovah, from his manifestation in the created as the tree Ramon of the eminent and absolute principles, of his triple eminent action, Shekinah, Avir, Metatron. 
sighed relieved the great master, who already feared that the demanded explanation will never come. Watch the roots of the pomegranate of life. From the tenth Sifera emerges, the kingdom that carries on its trunk the sign of the almond. As the candelabrum menorah, the roots are seven, and culminate in the chalices of the almond's flower, from where poke out the terrestrial world the eyes of Jehovah, the eyes that never sleep, the eyes that see everything, the eyes that prophet Zechariah saw. These optical roots of the tree of Jehovah represent the Israel Shekinah, the chosen people being one with God. They show the fulfillment of the plan, the chosen people performing the world government in the name of the One, in reality, will be the ineffable One who will show himself in the Shekinah of Israel at the end of time. The prophet said, continued Bersha, Yehovah saith, Heaven is my throne, and the earth the stone of fire beneath my feet. Yehovah rests because his feet, the roots of the tree Ramon, over a stone of fire which is nothing else than the soul of the Messiah, manifested in the Shekinah. The terrestrial stone is the replica of Metatron, the celestial man, archetype of all the men of warm clay, because this stone of fire, which was since the beginning of creation, but that was not employed by the constructors will fit the justice the end of time when the time will end and will become in cornerstone key of the vault of all the edification the stone which the quarrymen refused to become cornerstone and where is the seat of the stone fire the soul of the messiah metatron which is the model of all the men of warm clay according to the prophet Thus saith Adonai Yehovah, Here I am to put in Zion the foundation of a stone, a tried stone, precious, fundamental, corner, a grounded. He who believeth shall not move from such foundation. The mortal men, stones of clay, shall be the end as the fire stone, as Metatron, the celestial man. Thus, shall be when the temple be ready, and each one will occupy his place in the construction, according to the model of the Messiah. Thus shall be in the days in which the kingdom of Jehovah will be concentrated in the earth. And with the reign of the Messiah king, and the Shekinah will be manifested as the chosen people, because only for Israel has created Jehovah, the kingdom and the king. No Gentile population has ever a real kingdom even if it seemed to. Neither has existed a real king out of the chosen people. For this reason the name Melchizedek, the supreme priests of our order, really means the one who dethrones the kings, and not the king of Zedek. As we have made believe to the Gentiles, Melchizedek and those who belongs to his order must destroy every false kingdom and king ere the real kingdom of Jehovah be reproduced in the earth. Malkahuth, with the world government of the chosen people. However, priests, the plan of God has been disturbed, and now it will be necessary to sacrifice the men of clay in a fire holocaust. The end of time, justly when the temple be erected, and the kingdom be realized in the Shekinah of Israel. As we assure you, the firestone, which is a pure archetype in the beginning of time, was multiplied without losing its singularity in the one that characterizes to all the Sephiroth. And each stone of fire, identical to the one of the beginning, was a soul that would reach the perfection at the end, when all would be one with the one. The men of clay would reach in this form to be stone of fire, similar to Metatron for it only should comply the law and travel through time towards the end. Where is the perfection? And was there when they, the seraphim Nephilim, creatures of the white fraternity, engraved the abominable sign in the stone of fire over which each soul of the man of clay is seated? And abominable sign cooled the stone of fire, Abin Esh, and removed it from the end. Therefore, priests, the stone that must be cleaned with pitch at the end is the cold stone that would not be where it is, due to it was not placed in the beginning by the Creator One. 
damn stone, stone of scandal, seed of stone. They placed it after the beginning in the soul of the man of clay, and now it is in the beginning. Time is the constant stream of consciousness of the one. Between the beginnings and the end of time is the creation. And at the end of time is the perfection of the soul as stone of fire. Is the will of Jehovah that the soul reaches the final perfection, according to the model of Metatron. But now the soul can't see the cold stone that is sunk in it, not perceives it unless it crosses its path and becomes in stumbling stone for the soul, in an insurmountable obstacle to reach the good of the final perfection. Without the seed of stone in the soul of the man of clay would not have existed evil nor hate for the creation. The evolution would have been realized by the force of the love to the Creator. The final perfection would have been assured for every created soul. Now that plan of Jehovah will be impossible to be accomplished. And the judgment of Din, the Ancient of the Days, determines that only those who reach the good of the final perfection, in any time, will reach alive to the end of time. Instead, those contaminated by the evil, the men of clay whose souls incubate, even unknowing it, the seed of stone, will be dissolved and converted in pitch, to clean with it the abominable sign and the stone of fire. Yes, priests, continued Bersha. Eye created all beings, including the stone. He extracted it from the warm fire, and because of this, he designed it as stone of fire. And he puts all the created beings in the becoming of time, which is his flowing consciousness, because before the beginning not existed nothing except the ineffable supreme being. The spirit of the one went out at the beginning of the Eansof, the actual infinite, which represents the knot for all the created souls. Thus the one who also appeared from that knot brought all the created beings from there. The first of them was the warm fire, created the first day, giving in this way beginning to the time. The souls of the men of clay created after started to evolve thenceforth, in direction to the final perfection. But that evolution was very slow. To accelerate it, the seraphim Nephilim came with the consent of the one, also appeared from the Insof, to those angels, our enemies called traitor gods. The truth is that they extracted from the knots the abominable uncreated sign and engraved it in the warm fire, and that was the origin of evil. The signalized stone was transformed by that sign in cold stone, and it was instantly moved to the beginning of time, moved backwards from the initial knot to sustain an abominable existence out of time. Amongst the created beings, within the created stones, the cold stone refused the order of the creation, rebelled against the will of the one and was declared enemy of the creation, who had introduced the uncreated sign in the world, placed the cold stone in the soul of men as seed of stone to make it grow, to mature and fructify, to make that the force of its development obtain rapidly the soul to the final perfection. But such seed, as we said, would produce a fruit extremely hostile to the God One and His creation. A fruit would only accept to exist out of the time, before the beginning. A fruit would only yearn to abandon the world of the created beings and get lost in the original nut. A fruit that could not be foreseen by the soul, because its seed would remain invisible since the beginning a fruit which would be denominated the self. And the cause of that fruit would not be the cold stone, neither the seed of stone, but those inhabitants of the abyss that you know as Hyperborean spirits. They are our real enemies. But fortunately, they only can be manifested in the soul of men through the cold stone. You will comprehend that what incarcerates them to the soul of men, without being aware of that, is the cold stone in the beginning. However, if the warm stone was extracted of the warm fire, and the cold fire, contrarily, has sprouted from the cold stone, 
By that uncreated fire, the damn lineage of Tarsus, that will have just exterminated, escaped for centuries to our control, and infested the world with men of stone who tried to destroy the basis of the cult. It seems that the Seraphim Nephilim didn't count that with the cold fire would sprout the cold fire and would reveal to the luciferic man what they denominate infinite blackness of himself for it is necessary since that hateful mystery was possible to avoid in the future that the seed of stone mature and fructify the birth of child of stone that will receive the revelation of the cold fire and that will turn off the warm fire of the heart it is necessary to clean the cold stone with pitch to recover the warm fire the fire must never abandon the heart of man. Really, priests, even if they blame the one and his terrestrial representatives for the disgrace that affects them, where the Hyperborean seraphim, those who dwell in the heart of Jehovah, Tifereth, who preserve the spiritual incarceration, it is true that they worked with the consent of the one, and no one know when nor for what he created them, nor why he gave them also the power to extract beings from the knot at least if it is granted credit to what they affirm that they are not beings created by the one but they come as ehye from a world that exists beyond the einsoft and that their spiritual nature is equal to the one but to believe them would be to commit the greatest heresy against the hokmah of the master of everything because was not the own one who declared his absolute unity and exclusive? To whom then will ye compare me? saith the holy elder. Lift up your eyes on high and see who hath created these things. Thus saith Jehovah, King of Israel, and his Redeemer Jehovah Sabbath. I am the first and the last, and a part of me there is no other stone. Ye are my witnesses. Is there a God except from me? There is no God. I know no other. Ye are my witnesses, saith Jehovah, and my chosen people, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am Ehye. Before me there was no God, neither shall there be after me. I am God, since always and also since today. I am the same, and there is no one that can escape of my hand. I will do what I want. And who will change it? Yes, priests, we must not doubt of the one, but neither forget that the Hyperborean Seraphim founded the white fraternity, to which all of us belong, and in which hierarchy we have reached the highest priesthood. In sum, according to the plans of the Seraphim Nephilim, while the seed of stone is being developed, the soul of the Earthian men would evolve undoubtedly accelerated towards the final perfection. But the reality contradicted these plans. Such germ of evil, when it be fructified, far of impulsing the soul to raise it towards the final perfection, would be sunk in the terror of abyss without name, in the eternity of an infinite blackness. And finally, the seed of stone would end, dominating the soul of the man of clay, and converting him in an enemy of the Creator and the creation hardening his heart and turning him into a being without love, converting him in a man of stone. For this reason we, the perfect priests, must propitiate the fire holocaust that will clean the pitch at the end of the abominable sign in the stone that is planted in the soul of the man of clay, concluded Bersha. 32nd Day Immediately, Bera added the next. For millenniums in the submersed continent of the Atlantis, that the Gentile must never know that existed. The priests of the One fought against the hostile effect that the cold stone caused in the souls of men of clay. Was attempted by divers means, that the uncreated spirit, incarcerated to the soul by the cold stone, forgets its origin by the Einsoft. And the results were encouraging then. Finally, the blood of men of clay had been degraded in such a way that the uncreated spirit was incapable to orient itself to the cold stone that would reveal the divine origin. 
then existed a cultural golden age in which other chosen people similar to israel established the universal synarchy and was prepared for the kingdom of shekinah was in that moment that some men of stone who escaped the extermination that the priests and the seraphim nephilim submitted them and they achieved to extract for their help other seraphim called hyperborean who entered to the created universe through the sphere of venus the most terrible of those seraphims was lucifer phosphorus hesperus due to facing all the celestial legions of jehovah sabbath he precipitated to the earth to bequeath his own crown to the spirit incarcerated in the earthian man he placed here then the damned gem of the grail which has the power to avoid that the spirit forgets its divine origin once realized he returned from where he had came but leaving the fertilized germs of the luciferic lineages against which we are all still fighting in all similar to the house of tarsus that we have recently exterminated and with those condemned lineages by jehovah especially the ones that emerged from the white race the ones that would never forget the origin the ones that would try to germinate the seed of stone in all the earthian men which would unbind the rebellion against the law of jehovah and the hate for the creation thus was reached inevitably to the battle of atlantis which ended with a planetary catastrophe however the greatest evil not happened yet this one overcame because of lucifer and that woman the intruder ama who is capable to enter in the sphere of venus and to obtain the secret of the seeds of stone yes priests the seraphim lucifer gave to the intruder the spikes of the seeds of stone that until then was only possessed the seraphim nephilim and with his return the greatest evil fell over the earthian men because the intruder chose the bravest ones and started to plant in their hearts the seed of stone that turns off the warm fire of the animal passion the love of the great mother bina each seed of stone would be one wise warrior a man of stone situated out of the law of jehovah instead of the name identical to metatron which was destined to be at the end of time with her indescribable act the intruder the virgin of agartha offended profoundly to the great mother bina to whom she snatched the love of many sons for this reason the land of huelva must be purified that for many centuries has been dedicated to an impious cult only in this way will descend the shekinah in rusbayal she priests is our most powerful enemy her evil is above all the evil her hostility for the creation surpass any man of stone her courage to face the one overpass the bravest wise warrior before her and her infinite mystery all tremble of terror and behind the terror and the death will only survive the uncreated spirits who are of the same hyperborean essence she returned from venus carrying the spike of the seeds of stone bringing in her belly the demon of the war navutan her uncreated son all was a conspiracy of the seraphim lucifer he wanted that ama to have a child of stone a son that would be at the head of the white race and would found for his members a mystery and that the initiates in that mystery could obtain the immortality and receive in their hearts the seed of stone of the virgin of agatha look at the sefer Iche, ordered bera to whom this part of the history produced a strange mix of hate and terror here nevuton crucified himself he signalized the branches that ranged from the trunk unto the pomegranates housed in din the ace was tied from the right and the left arm of the holy elder under his great countenance and without realizing that the stone of fire aben esh was hanging over his head nine nights agonized in the cross of rimon until freya a female demon as terrible as ama went out from the eye and found the secret of the death but to reveal it to navotan who had just died she had to eat a grain of the pomegranate hokma and become a partridge 
she performs for Navutan the lame dance that allows to go out of the labyrinth of the illusion of the death. However, such food incarcerated her to the illusion as Persephone, and she couldn't return to the origin from where she had come to save his husband. Thus Freya, a new enemy of the creation, remained with Vides, the lord of Agartha, the refuge of the uncreated demons, and with Navutan, his husband, to carry out the essential war against the One. Navutan, by his part, resuscitated and revealed to the members of his race the secret of the death through the mystery of the labyrinth, in which course the initiates receive in their hearts the seed of stone of the Virgin of Agartha, and become men of stone. Disciples of Navutan were the white Atlanteans, who planted in the world of impious stones, who opened the doors of the celestial mansions to take them by assault. For this reason, don't forget, priests, the conditions of the cultural pact. The men of stone are our most terrible enemies, because they are proposed to impede the fulfillment of the plans that Jehovah has disposed for the humanity. And there are also the stones of the men of stone. Not forget that their damned stones must be destroyed because inside of them could exist seeds of stone germs of inconceivable beings that could fructify and born in determinate moments of history. Don't forget that the cold stone is invisible for our souls, but ready to manifest their essential hostility when the opportunity, that's to say, the Kairos permits it. We ignore, if from such manier will emerge the men of stone, but in any case we must destroy it. Remember that we declared the essential war against the enemy of the creation, and that our war is between the pitch and the cold stone, between the warm fire and the cold fire, between the created and the uncreated, between the being and the not. Bertia spoke again to talk exclusively of the mission that the immortals left to the priests. The meeting was ending and would pass before many years, their return. Perhaps then, as before, as always, would exist other priests to receive them. They shouldn't thereby miss any word that they were telling, because no one could repeat it after, and the error in the order of Melchizedek was severely punished. "'You already know in part your mission,' said Bersha. "'You will dedicate all your powers and influence to purify this region of Huelva. The house of Tarsus has been destroyed, and even if we are not recovered the stone of Venus, it neither would be used against you. That was one of the last stones of Lucifer, that allowed the Hyperborean initiates to orient in the labyrinth of the illusion of life. Without them, the guardian of the labyrinth can be tranquil, Jehovah Adonai. Only the priests of Israel know the lame dance that signalizes the exit. Priests! The enemy is almost defeated. The synarchy of the chosen people will be a reality soon. The Shekinah will descend prompt, and the Messiah King will reign. The Holocaust of Fire is drawing nigh. Quiblon will come to Ruspael to search for the great Mother Bina and will exhibit his name, Sam, Shekinah, Avir Metatron, and she... Lovely will plant the earthian seeds of the pards, Rimon, the germ of Metatron, that at the end will be stone of fire, perfect soul of the chosen people. Demolish without considerateness the altar of the impostor. Remove her hand from the abominable spike of hate. Make that nobody remember her essential sacrilege, her seeds of stone condemned by Jehovah. Destroy her places of cult and her images. Kill even her memory. And, of course, burn it to ashes and make pitch with it to all those who believe in the Virgin of Agartha and aspire the seed of stone. Be hard, priests, because the enemy deserve it. Raise altars for the sweet mother Bena instead. Put in her hand the wonderful pomegranate of the love of Jehovah. Let that everyone know her essential sacrifice of being depository of the earthian seeds blessed by Jehovah. 
Build places for her cult and invoke her images. Generate in the people her remembrance. And of course, reward with the greatest dispenses to all those who believe in the virgins of miracles, or of the ribat, or of the pomegranate, or of the ribbon, or of the boat, or of the earthian child, or of the warm fire. Be effective priests, because the plans of Jehovah demand it. In sum, you will start substituting the statue of the bishop, Macario, by the new sculpture, Our Lady of Miracles, that the monk will carve accordingly to the vision of the Sefer Ice. You will place this sculpture in the covenant Our Lady of the Rebat, but immediately you shall dedicate to the work and the propitiate the near edification of a great sanctuary for the Virgin of the Ribbon. This one will have to shelter a brotherhood of seamen and owners of nows, who will request her protection and will gather round her cult. The ideal site will be a hill near the sea, from where could be descried the estuary of Odial, the city of Huelva, Palos, La Ravida, y Moquer, and the image that will be worshipped there will be very similar to the one seen by the sculptor monk but gifted of major sacred attributes. The great mother Bina will exhibit in her left hand the pomegranate, the acid fruit of the warm life, halved in from the vulva and showing the aperture its grains of the seed of stone, and with the right hand will hold the Messiah, who will appear completely naked except by his feet, that will be covered with getirs to dismantle his lameness of Dionysus. The left hand of the divine child will be directed to the pomegranate, while the right will sustain the sephirotic ribbon, the cord, with the ten measures of the universe, the symbol of the overseas navigators. But in the dress of the mother of God, visible and contrasted, must be the Hebrew letters of the name Quiblon, Sam, that is Samek, Alf, and Mem. Finally, about the image of the Virgin of the Ribbon, you will portray two of the Seraphim Nephilim, sustaining in their hands the Celtic symbol of the Kala Chakra Ki. You will also make other images and sculptures inspired in the recent descriptions, but have present that in every case the Messiah child must be despoiled from the sacrilegious book that holds the child of stone of the Virgin of Agatha, the book of the Hyperborean wisdom. On its place, you'll put a sapphire orbis tare, as symbol of the universal power that the Messiah King will reach in the kingdom of Israel Shekinah. Similar to it, due to they will be the images and sculptures that you'll distribute in all the places that be necessary. And lo, priests, because we'll prophesy you one last time. Hear this message. It will be accomplished at any time and place because is the word of Jehovah. Jehovah Sabbath saith, Days of glory shall come for the chosen people. I shall come, Shekinah upon it, and I will reign in the midst of the fire holocaust in which the impious shall fall before me. And in those days, when the glory and the victory of Israel be drawing nigh, I will send an univocal sign, announcing that the time hath come. Such signs shall be the fall of the pomegranate, the mansion of the Jews. In reality, will always be the pomegranate what shall signalize this hour, pomegranate that will be in possession of a decadent kingdom, that shall be conquered by a nascent empire. The triple holocaust of the Gentile people shall be offered then. Thereupon I shall come, and the glory and victory of Israel will have become. Quiblon, whose voice closeth the doors of hell, and openeth the doors of heaven, shall offer me the triple holocaust, and will announce me, thus will signalize the time of Israel. Rejoice, priests of Jehovah Sabbath, that today the lineage of Tarsus has been exterminated, and we will announce you the forthcoming Shekinah. Comply, comply with firmness and exactitude our orders, and soon Quiblon will come to receive the verb of Metatron and celebrate the triple holocaust awaited by Jehovah. Be the victory, Netza, of Jehovah with you. Saluted Bera. And the glory heart of Elohim Sabbath crowns your efforts. Ended Bera. And the next day, the immortals had gone to Shambhala, 
leaving the four priests mired in deep musings. Of course, the diabolic arrogance of Bera and Bersha would be appeased a little if would have been suspected that still existed lords of Tarsus alive, and that the condemned lineage, as the phoenix, would reborn of their ashes in the house of Tarsus. Thirty-third day. I hope you have the patience and enough time to continue reading. Perhaps this letter has overextended, but it was impossible for me to abbreviate more, because I run the risk of obscuring the message that precisely I want to reveal you, with its lecture. Certainly I have limited to mention just the most important facts of the complex history of the House of Tarsus, with the other expositive criterion would have been impossible to reach even here. Thence, I will try to resume even more the part that is missing, not because the message is already revealed, nor because the next lacks of importance, but because I run out of time, because I have a presentiment that they are getting near each moment, and I wish that you, doctor, rather I beg you to effectuate its entire reading and judge after. I know that my condition of mental disease rests not credit to its content if the same is rationally judged, but I must not deny it. I trust that you will adopt at the end another point of view. I have to abandon, thereby, the satanic immortals, who would not delay to return to the temple of Melchizedek to talk again about the lords of Tarsus. Now will be understood how the necessity that the house of Tarsus had to survive influenced and gave definitive orientation to the strategy of the Circulus Dominicanus and how this strategy culminated when the inspired management of Philip IV fulfilled its objectives. Noso of Tarsus was prepared to return to the secret cavern when the pestilence made its presence in the house of Tarsus, immediately comprehended, there, that he was the only survivor, and dominating the warrior fury that was sprouting from his spirit, he tried to evaluate with calm the situation. Being a golem's attack was not convenient to encourage hopes about the rest members of the family, except for the men of stone who, as he, were evidently invulnerable was disposed then to await the confirmation of what occurred with the expedition of the earl of tarsival and during that wait he checked with horror that the corpses of his relatives were transformed in bitumen of judea when lugo de braga came in the beginning of the pillage noso didn't need more information to know the fate of the count and his knights and in that moment he only thought in the balisca of the virgin of the grotto and her image the most valuable that remained there for a man of stone without thinking it two times he ran to the church sword in hand where fifteen soldiers had already arrived perhaps with the intention to steal the golden chalice and he had to face the fury of the wise warrior unequal combat for the almagavers and for any non-initiated warrior which cost their lives when noso approached to the altar who was sure that he came first he warned amazed a mutilation in the statuette of the child of stone Someone had dissected the hand of stone that expressed the Vala Vrun, but that was not the moment to solve the enigma. Noyo wrapped the busts of the Virgin and the Child with a cape, and won a horse the left shore of the river Odiel, where an unfrequented footpath would him to the mountain range of Kalendaria. The news about the extermination of great part of the family affected the strong old woman seventeen hundred years before. Another Vraya had lived a similar situation was not possible she said almost to herself that all the effort was in vain even by all the attacks suffered until then the house of tarsus achieved to overpass always the difficult moments although no one such critical at the present but the progress were also many the familiar guideline was almost accomplished the cult of the cold fire since centuries ago that was given men of stone to the lord of tarsus and they had preserved the stone of venus the most valued trophy for the enemy was only missing a last effort of blood purification, that the family could produce a man of stone able to understand the serpent with the symbol of the origin. That's to say, someone capable to project the symbol of the origin over the stone of Venus. That Hyperborean initiate would reach in this way the highest wisdom. The localization of the origin and the stone of Venus would show them the lytic sign of Letakar. Then the lords of Tarsus could march towards the destiny that the liberator gods had reserved for them, and that moment not seemed to be far, the house of Tarsus conscious that the imminence with which would reach a man of stone that would be pontiff and would comprehend the major secrets, that they were awaiting him with anxiety since many years ago, but they were all agreed that he could come soon, and the signs of the gods were coincident. 
How then? How is occurring now this disaster? Had they underestimated the enemy again? Undoubtedly that was the answer. Was not maintained a sufficient state of alert and was allowed to the enemy to act, who had to be attacked preventatively once he approached to the region of Aracena. Being as this, the occurred was explained, at least strategically, because against the knowledge employed by the immortals they had no defense a part of the purity of blood. Was not possible, repeated the Vraya, that the liberator gods have abandoned us at the will of the golems. Such hit could not mean the end of the house of Tarsus, not before the accomplishment of the familiar mission. With security would remain some lords of Tarsus alive to save the lineage and make possible the generation of the awaited man of stone. Was necessary to search for them. Noso of Tarsus would have to leave and go around the places where lived other relatives, although it was not convenient to keep hopes about the survival of no one who was not initiated. And these last ones, the men of stone, were all incorporated to the order of preachers, working in different monasteries and universities of France and Italy. The Noyle would travel immediately. She would remain on guard, rationing all that was possible the available victuals would resist six months, then naturally would die there, if Noso not returned at time. The Vraya was right. There still existed lords of Tarsus alive and with possibilities to save the lineage. But was not less true that this would be the most critical situation that they ever faced, including the destruction of Tartessos. This time, sixteen members of the family achieved to survive. Now remained only eight, considering the old Vraya and the Noyo. In fact, during his journey to Seville, Cordoba, and Toledo, Noso only found the mourning and fear of the non sanguinous relatives to whom nothing had happened, and he realized that the pestilence knew not distance. Recently in Toledo, Noso met another man of stone, who was aware that something terrible occurred and he was preparing to travel to Turdus. There also had died many familiars by the weird pestilence. When he learned of the bad news, he decided to travel with Noso to Zaragoza and Toleso, in the Languedoc, where lived the chief of the Dominicanes. In Zaragoza, they realized that the final death was converted in Bitumen, the beautiful family, of one of his cousins mother of twelve children. The thirteen of them died in the same moment, in the same fateful night. His husband, a Byzantine knight, talented professor of Greek, had no consolation. According to what he said to the lords of Tarsus, the deceased had revealed years ago that an esoteric sect integrated by some terrible people called Gollum was persecuting since ancient times to the lords of Tarsus. When he exhaled such frightful scream before he died, she clung to Pedro de Creta, and he believed to have distinguished the word Gollum, modulated with the last breath. For this reason he swore later, over the thirteen corpses, to revenge those dead if they were really consequence of the Gollum's black magic, just as was suggested by the horrible decomposition that was seen in the bodies. His life, explained Pedro, was destroyed, and he would have accepted to die that night before to survive bearing the pain to remember those he loved so much. He would consecrate his existence to search for the Gollum, now his own enemies, and he would try to comply with his vow. He would revenge or die in the attempt. Was evident, he said with innocence, that only the fury that was burning in his blood allowed to maintain him alive. Pedro de Creta ignored where to start the quest when the monks came. Relatives of his wife, relatives of his wife, he would surely know to orient him. The man of stone whose dead familiars were counted by hundreds were not the mood to be affected by the small drama of the Byzantine knight. Nevertheless, they were admired for his noble naivety, the courage without limits that he exhibited, and the wonderful fidelity for his love. It was obvious that he had no idea of the enemies that he was facing and that he lacked of any chance against them, but it would be almost impossible to find them by himself, and the impotence would constitute his major protection. The lords of Tarsus were withdrawing, without saying a word, when they were reached by Pedro de Creta, the man not believed nothing. On the contrary, he was sure that they were hiding something, and he decided to go with them. He offered the protection of his sword to the monks, but if they refused, he would follow them at a distance. There were no manner to persuade him to abandon his enterprise. The men of stone had no alternative, or they allowed to go with them, or they would have to execute him. They decided the first, because Pedro de Creta was clearly a man of honor. The chief of the Dominicanes was waiting for them. He was Rodolfo, and was born in Seville, but in the order he was called Rodolfo of Spain. His wisdom was legendary, 
but for strategic motives he never wanted to stand out in the academic ambience, and he only accepted to priorate in surrounding of Tolosa. From his monastery he operated the most internal group of the Circulus Dominicanus. He belonged to the same family of Petreño, and he had still a grade of kinship as second uncle of the newcomer monks, who were cousins. He placed Pedro de Creta in a monastery that housed Lycal pilgrims, and then he spoke with frankness. I know everything. The voice of the pure blood revealed it to me in the moment that occurred, and the eternal sight permitted me to watch the ritual of the demons. Now they have gone to the temple of Melchizedek, with a conviction that they achieved to exterminate the house of Tarsus. Thereby we have a little strategic advantage that we must utilize effectively to save the lineage of Tarsus. This is the scheme of the situation. From Spain, only you two in the Vraya have survived. Here are two nuns who are my nieces, Brunalda and Valentina, and two initiates, one in Paris and the other in Bologna. To them I have already sent messengers requesting them to come urgently to Tolosa. Gentlemen, we must sustain a familiar council. Fifteen days later, the seven of them were gathered in a secret crypt, under the church of the monastery of Rodolfo of Tarsus. In reality, there was not much to discuss, because the six remaining would accept all what proposed Rodolfo, by far the wisest of the lords of Tarsus. And they were not wrong in their plan, simple and effective, which resulted rather efficient against the enemy's strategy, and permitted to save the lineage of Tarsus. Thus he exposed, First of all, I must confirm you that the house of Tarsus is debated as never before in front of the alternative of the extinction, and that the possibilities of continuation of the lineage are minimum. Specifically, they are based in the two present ladies here. It is not unknown for us that in the whole history of our lineage the men of stone have always proceeded from the matrilineal heritage. The message of the pure blood is transmitted from daughter to daughter and only from the ladies of Tarsus born the men of stone in the caliber ladies. Thence the main priority of the strategy to follow consists in bind these ladies in convenient marriages for our purposes. This means that such marriages must be rigorously under our control. All must be sacrificable in favor of the familiar mission, even an infertile husband. Brunalda and Valentina assented with a gesture. Rodolfo continued speaking. The Circulus Domini Canis will give to all of you new identities, naturally because you will not return to where you are hitherto. The Gollum must never suspect that we are alive, neither that no one of us belong to the lineage of Tarsus. We will just retake your names the day when we will achieve to break the power of the Gollum, either destroying their satanic orders, either strengthening the Circulus Domini Canis. Meanwhile, we'll work in secret inside of the order of preachers, and we will be occupied to assure that the marriages of Ronalda and Valentina give fruits. We can't go back to Spain while the possibility of being discovered or recognized exists. We have to maintain the fiction that the House of Tarsus is effectively extinct. I know that it means to leave the Vraya abandoned to her luck, but that is preferable before the risk of a new siege of the immortals in the secret cavern. Remember that many have died to preserve the wise sword, and that the Vraya will only be one more of those who will give their lives for such noble mission. However, one day we'll have to return to the secret cavern to restore the guard. We will have to foresee the manner to recover the patrimony of the House of Tarsus. For it, nothing seems better than to carry out the next. Exists an initiate in the Circulus Dominicanus, a young Catalan earl, who would be willing to give the rights of his rich Mediterranean signiory in favor, a son of Alfonso III, in turn of the county of Tarsaval. I am sure that the king of Portugal will grant that will, considering the obtained advantages in prestige and rents. For the beneficiary of the Catalan county, all shall be arranged by the order. But there is something else. I have thought that this earl is the ideal consort of Ronalda, here the surprise was painted in all the countenances. Brunalda, a young woman of fifteen years old who since the thirteen was novice in Franjou, reddened. Rodolfo explained his plan. Don't be surprised that soon you will know the reason. I understand that it seems crazy the idea to send Brunalda to Spain, after the risks that I have confirmed about the strategy I have proposed. I will tell you that it can be possible. If we work with caution and take a prudent time to adjust details, 
for example, some four years, nothing permits to anticipate more dangers or difficulties. On the contrary, the presence of Ronalda in the lands of the House of Tarsus is necessary to make the charismatic power of the Stone of Venus act over her seed. Of course, we won't send her unprotected, because we dispose of the power to give her new identity, whose change would be hardly noticed by the Gollum. The case is that one of the German members of the Circulus Dominicanus, as a territorial lord vassal of the House of Swabia, widower since many years ago, and consecrated to the preaching inside of the order. When his wife died, this noble trusted to us his little daughter, of nine years old, as novice of the monastery of Fanjou, who died three years later, more or less, for the date when entered Brunalda. I have spoken with him, and he has agreed to swear that she is his legitimate offspring, and to die rather than betray such oath. He will take Ronalda with him to his castle in Austria, and he will present her as his daughter, that he has abandoned the religious life for have been promised to a Catalan earl. For four years he will integrate her into the German customs, and he will provide her all of the information about his recent family. I hope that after that time— Brunalda be able to pass as a German lady, and to respond all the interrogations of the lineage. For now here we have already substituted the graves and adulterated the death certificates of the monastery. Being that who died and was buried three years ago would be in that moment Brunalda de Palencia. What do you think about this plan? In regard to Valentina, I will tell you that I have not decided anything and that we will have to search her husband who collects the requested conditions by us but anyway, must disappear definitely as member of the House of Tarsus. Therefore I announce you also that Valentina de Palencia, Dominican nun of the Covenant Fanjou, for the legal effects died that night in which the pestilence swept the House of Tarsus. Her death is written in the certificates, and has her own sepulture of the cemetery of the Order. While we prepare her future, she will be occulted in a farm that we have in San Felice de Carman. Such property belonged to a noble of the lineage of Rajmonds, who was burnt by Simon de Montfort during the days of his advances to Tolosa. The unique alive heritor, confessed heretic, was obeyed to pass his lifetime in one of enclosed monasteries of the Order of Preachers. After his death, the rites passed to the Order that have now decided to sell them to a Roman knight, willing to live in these regions and owner of much gold to pay. This knight, Arnaldo Tiber, is no one else than our recently arrived from Bologna, here present. His mission will be then to carry out the production of the farm and rebuild the castle that is now in ruins. Also he shall marry with a chosen lady amongst the families of the Dominicanus. Valentina will have to pass as his sister or niece until the situation be solved. Momentarily will be housed there a man of stone who comes from Toledo and he will help in everything to a supposed Roman knight. You must have present that you will be a vassal to the Count of Tolosa, and therefore of the King of France. But, as the order of preachers will reserve the religious rites of the donation, your sword will be really at the service of the Pope and the Church. And I suggest you to accommodate in the castle, as chiefs of the garrison or mayor, to the widower knight that has accompanied you from Spain. I have no doubts that he is someone legit." All occurred just how Rodolfo had planned, with one exception that didn't disturb the objective, as will be seen immediately. The king of Portugal gave place to the request of the Catalan knight, strongly supported by the order of the preachers, and he granted him the county of Tarsaval. This was happening one year after the extinction of the house of Tarsus by the pestilence, and for that time the Gollum had meticulously inspected the village of Turdus and the signorial residence. They would leave convinced that there were no lords of Tarsus alive notwithstanding that would extend the quest through all of Spain and then the rest of Europe. But these indignations would give negative results, or positive according to the point of view, due to in all the sites where the members of the condemned lineage dwelled. They realized that the pass of the pestilence didn't leave survivors. The new Count of Tarsaval repopulated the village of Turdus, with five hundred families of Barcelona, and settled down a garrison in the signorial residence of three hundred Catalan soldiers where was located the chapel at the feet of the mountain range, Calendaria. He ordered to build a small fortress composed by tower and wall. Thence that place would be always under the surveillance of the sentinels of the county. Not existing noyles or vrayas to guard the secret cavern. The best would be to maintain surveillance on the mountain range to keep away the curious or possible suspects. 
Three years later the Count of Tarsival traveled to Austria, and he married with Brunelda, transformed now in a German lady. The signorial residence, remodeled and fortified by the Catalans, received then such shy lady, who never stopped learning the language of Alfonso the Tenth, and preferred to pass the hours praying in the church of the Grotto, that to enjoy the courtly customs. The family resulted prolific in sons and daughters, that the continuity of the lineage of Tarsus was until certain point assured. Otherwise the county enjoyed the relative calm during the next years, especially due to the care that the earl manifested to not be involved in the struggle of interests that the monarchs of Portugal and Castile sustained. When the King Sancho IV reincorporated the region of Huelva, and he grants his signiory with effects for the life, to Don Juan Mate de Luna, and the Earl of Tarsival pass without problems to the crown of Castile, that confirms his rights in the arms of the Catalan Count. The same respect will show for Ferdinand IV, and the successive owners and lords of the country of Huelva, in sum, the family that was growing in Spain in the ancient dominions of the House of Tarsus would enormously surpass the aspirations proposed by Rodolfo and the lords of the dog, although they would converse until the fourteenth century the secret of their lineage. But not all occurred as Rodolfo expected. There was one exception. But as I said at the beginning, that didn't change the objectives of the strategy. The problem was proposed by Valentina, who was a young woman full of gifts but extremely passionate. Rodolfo had arranged with the Lord of Flanders, follower, as his family, of the Dominicanus, the commitment of marriage between his son and Valentina. The engaged, a captain to the orders of the Duke of Flanders, was certainly in conformity with the marriage. But not Valentina. Why? What nobody imagined in that family council had occurred in San Felix de Carman. Valentina was madly in love with Pedro de Creta. Naturally, the Byzantine knight had something special due to he was already loved by the other lady of Tarsus, his deceased wife. But the passion that this time awakened in the cold heart of Valentina overpassed all the arguments of Rodolfo and every reasoning or advice of the men of stone. The lady not listened reason, or she married with Pedro de Creta, or the strategy of survival of the lineage would not pass for her. And what said Pedro de Creta to all this? Undoubtedly he was also in love, but, he affirmed, that the contracted vow for his murdered family inhibited him to formalize other marriage. He first should take revenge, punish in some way the damned Gollum. With this purpose he had come here, and he was still waiting to be oriented toward the demon's den. But his patience was exhausted, and if he not obtained soon the requested direction, he would go alone, putting his course as an errant knight in the hands of God. As can be seen, the situation was entangled but not impossible to resolve. The dilemma that Pedro could manifest about if he was worthy or not to marry with the Lady of Tarsus was already elucidated with his previous marriage. His family belonged to the Byzantine nobility. In the distribution of an inheritance he was entered by the intrigues with some familiars, and finally he was forced to flee. One of the lords of Tarsus met him in Constantinople, and he offered him such place in Spain. He was now thirty-eight years old and I already exposed the circumstances of his widowhood. Thereby, in principle, not existed insurmountable obstacle to fulfill the yen of Valentina. All was reduced to convince the knight about the importance of that union, but that would not be easy to obtain, due to that they would have to give explanations and many. A new council of family decided finally to annul the commitment with the Lord of Flanders and to talk clearly with Pedro. They said him the truth. They make him understand that the terrible power of the golem could not be faced by any one if he counted with the blood and the sword. Was necessary, also the wisdom, and that wisdom could be found in the Dominicanus, that they offered to integrate. But they didn't occult the mortal danger that he would run if his marriage with Valentino was discovered. He would be conscious, painfully conscious, that in such case his family could be exterminated by the golem again. Pedro understood in this way that the major possible damage against the enemy would be caused by the constitution of a family of the blood of Tarsus to perpetuate in secret the inheritance of the lineage, and then he was disposed to follow the plan of Rodolfo of Spain. The presence of Pedro was justified by the amity that he had with the baron of San Felix, that is, with the Roman knight that represented the man of stone, and then by the marriage with his sister, a young Spaniard woman named Valentina. The couple passed great part of their lives secluded in the castle. As for the family of Arnaldo Tiber, without arousing never the suspicion of the enemy about their real origin, 
for the exploitation of the property and to cover any possible suspiciousness among the villagers. The Spaniards counted with the inestimable help of a family of villagers to whom they had feudalized the farm. The Nogarets, as they were called, came from an ancient Octanian lineage deeply committed with the Cathar heresy, in other words, with the Hyperborean wisdom. Many of its members were burnt by Simon de Montfort during the siege of Albi. The rest of the family would have ended in the stake, too, if the Circulus Dominicanus would have not protected it, accepting in the Inquisitor courts that they controlled their conversion to the Catholicism and transferring them to San Felipe de Carmen. These brave Cathars, loyal unto death and brave unto termity, were united with the lords of the dog for the same hate against the Gollum Church and its creator god Jehovah Satan. They were only waiting for an opportunity to contribute against the plans of the white fraternity and that opportunity was offered by the lords of the dog thirty years later to guayame de nogaret pedro de creta and valentina of tarsus procreated four children who lived all their lives in san felix six of their grandchildren with other ten familiars of arnaldo tirber were those who returned to spain since the year thirteen fifteen and amongst them was enrique cretes ancestor of lito de tarsus it is clear then dr signigel why I have stopped to speak so much about them. I came directly from that couple, formed by Pedro and Valentina. 34th Day In the beginning of the 13th century, the plans of the white fraternity seemed to have been complying relentlessly. And notwithstanding that they failed, what happened then? This was, Dr. Signigal, the question exposed in the 18th day. The answer that you now will be capable of understanding more profoundly affirmed that two exoteric causes and one esoteric cause, and fundamental, explained the failure. Synthetically, the esoteric causes were concentrated in two men in history, Frederick II of Germany and Philip IV of France. However, they only expressed the action of some occult forces, which I have denominated the opposition of the Hyperborean wisdom. The first exoteric cause in the opposition of the Hyperborean wisdom has already been exposed. Now it is only missing to complete the strategy directing against their plans the acts of Philip IV of France, their second exoteric cause. In 1223, Philip II Augustus died, a king anesthetized by the Gollum, who remained indifferent during the crusade against the charters, and permitted the consolidation of the order of the temple in France. He would be succeeded by Louis VIII, the Lion, a monarch physically and spiritually weak who would participate in 1226 in the Second Crusade against the Charters and would die the same year. Thenceforth, and until 1279, governs Louis IX, the saint, who leaves settled the issue of the Languedoc when he incorporated all the territories in the crown of France by the marriage, obliged, of the unique daughter of the Earl of Tolosa, with his brother Alphonse of Poitiers. Then, the Guelph king of Aragon, James I, would confirm to Louis IX the territorial Occitanian conquests conceding, in the Treaty of Corbel of 1257, the rights of Aragon over Carcassonne, Rhodes, Lusac, Bezier, Albi, Narbonne, Nimes, Tolos, etc., betraying with it the cause of which his father, Peter II, died in the Battle of Muret fighting against. Simon de Montfort. He would also give his daughter Isabel as wife of Philip III, son of Louis IX. James I was such a child that Peter II had given as hostage to Simon de Montfort for his education. Once Peter II died, a delegation of noble Catalans managed before Innocent III the return of the child, to which the Gollum Pope agreed, with the condition that he would have to be educated by the Templar of Spain, that is, in the Monzon Fortress the same place where Bera and Bersha assassinated Lupo of Tarsus, Lamia and Rabas. James I was six years old when he was put in the hands of the Templars, who would dedicate for many years brainwashing and to convert him in an instrument of the Synarchy policy. It mustn't surprise you, then, that his unsupportive conduct with the cause of his father's death, neither the criticism poured in his book of memories about the acts of his father, very opposed to the Guelph policy of James I would be, instead, the behavior of his son, Peter III the Great, who would play entirely against the papal theocracy. Thence, 
when Louis the Ninth, the saint, died in 1270, his son occupied the throne, Philip the Third, taking Isabel of Aragon as queen, sister of Peter the Third. In that age took place the events that I have mentioned yesterday. That's to say, the Catalan Earl reconstructs the county of Tarsaville, and Valentina falls in love with Pedro de Creta. Philip the Third would govern until 1285, date in which would be seceded by Philip the Fourth the executor arm of the Dominicanus. But what happens, meanwhile, in the summit of the Gollum power, in other words, the papacy? To answer it would be necessary to go back to the death of Frederick II, when he was fighting in a successive war against Innocent IV, a war that threatened to end forever with the papal privileges. In these circumstances, the Gollum poisoned him in 1250, but the emperor had already caused irreparable damage in the European political unity and he was leaving in Italy a Gibellian party, strongly consolidated, that would not submit easily to the papal authority. It must be noted that the hate the Gollum experienced against the House of Swabia was only surpassed by the one that they professed for millenniums over the House of Tarsus. To that lineage, as this, they had sworn to destroy without mercy. Innocent III and the next popes decided to despoil the Hohenstaufen of all their rights on Italy, that's to say, in Rome, Naples and Sicily, and avoid that some member of that house could accede to the imperial throne. Frederick II was succeeded by his son Conrad IV, who was promptly excommunicated by Innocent IV. He died in 1253, leaving as heir to his unique son, the little Conradin, who had born in 1252 as regent of the child, governs Manfred of Sicily, natural son of Frederick II. Excellent general, this king continued the war undertaken by his father against the Gollum papacy. He receives three excommunications of Urban IV, terrible arm of that period, but that not left dent in the powerful Sacrian army that he formed. Manfred wins in every part a threat to conclude purifier work of Frederick II. And for disgrace of Urban IV, he married his daughter Constance with the King Peter III of Aragon. It is in that moment when the Gollums decide to realize an ambitious maneuver which would be initially successful, but that would finally produce the ruin of their plans. They tried to replace the House of Swabia, of Germany, for the House of Capet of France, in the excutrix role of the plans of the white fraternity. Even about what can be thought, the plan was not misbegotten due to particularly strengthened, but also divided by the feudal character of their states. The German landowners could be easily debilitated in their imperial ambitions, and the fact that interrogonum, the actual period in which didn't exist agreement to elect the king of Germany could be indefinitely maintained. That would be, then, the occasion to support the king of France, and to assign him the role that in one time was entrusted to Frederick II. But the Gollums were not thinking in the present King Louis the Ninth. Strong personality and difficult to manage. But his successor, Philip III, the most weak and able to be influenced by the clerics of his court, Urban IV offers the throne of Sicily to Louis IX, but the King of France not accepts because he considers legitimate the rights of the House of Swabia, who accepts his brother Charles of Anjou, the knight, hero of the Crusades, wants to be king as his brothers and accepts to become the executioner of the House of Swabia. With his intervention in the matters of Italy, the Gollums achieved to compromise France in their theoretic policy, and to restore the power of the papacy according to the conception of Gregory the Seventh and Innocent the Third. Then shall come, they suppose, the world government and the synarchy of the chosen people. According to the feudal organization of the provincial, the lords only gave troops for forty days, and with the condition to not transport them very far. Without being able to obtain nothing for that part, the Cistercian Order financed to Charles of Anjou a mercenary army of 30,000 men. Such troops of adventurous without law enters into Italy in 1264 and defeats completely to Manfred in the Battle of Benevento. Then they would begin perilous massacres and pillages only comparable to the barbarian invasions. In the aforementioned battle, a part of Manfred, many knights of the Ghibelline side lost their lives. Amongst them the father of Roger of Lauria, a child who grown in the chamber of the king of Aragon, Peter the Third, Because his mother was lady-in-waiting of the queen Constance, Roger of Lauria was, of course, the brilliant admiral of the Catalan navy, the most powerful of the age, with which Peter the Third conquered the kingdom of Sicily years later. When Manfred died, 
and once the Ghiblian party was broken down, only remains the child Conradin in Swabia, as the last male offspring of the rebel Hohenstaufen. Charles of Anjou agreed with Urban IV the usurpation of his rights. He proclaimed himself King of Naples, and he seizes Sicily. Immediately he establishes a regime of terror, oriented principally against the Ghiblian side. The expropriations of goods and titles, executions and deportations occur continuously. In little time, the French are as hated as the Saracens of the Holy Land. One of the most illustrious is John of Procida, the sage of the courts of Frederick II and Manfred, member of a noble Ghiblian family, Lord of Salerno, of the Isle of Procida, and many counties who would not be only despoiled from his goods and titles. But Charles of Anjou would commit a coward rape with his wife and daughter. He would only save his life thanks to the admirable prudence that he knew to deal with the Gollum Pope Urban IV. A huge outcry rises in the next years against the French domination. In 1268, Conradin, who in the time counted with sixteen years old, he goes to Italy at the head of an army of ten thousand men, trusting that in the peninsula would join him more troops. Charles annihilates him, in Taglicoso, making pass a terrible torment to the knights that he takes prisoner. Conradin, the last Hohenstaufen, tries to embark and flee from Italy, but he is betrayed and guided to the power of Charles of Anjou, is promoted a unanimous request to ask for the forgiveness of the grandchild of Frederick II, but Clement IV is inflexible. The death of Conradin is the life of Charles of Anjou. But the Golems are not disposed to suspend the extermination of the lineage that caused much evil to the plans of the White Fraternity. After a parody of judgment, Conradin is condemned to death in Naples, before giving his head to the executioner. The child demonstrates his gallantry through a gesture that will mean, in short term, the virtual defeat of Charles of Anjou. He threw one of his gloves to the crowd that had come to see the execution while he screamed, I challenge that a real knight of Christ takes revenge of my death in hands of the Antichrist. An instant later, he is beheaded in front of the presence of Charles of Anjou, the papal legacy, many cardinals and bishops, and tens of golems can't hide their joy for the extinction of the lineage of the Hohenstaufen. In that moment only remained alive the king of Sardinia Enzo, son of Frederick II, but lifetime prisoner in a castle of Bologna since 1249, who would soon be poisoned for major security. However, the gesture of Conradin would not be in vain, due to there were still knights disposed to fight against the satanic forces. The glove is picked up by John of Procida, in name of Peter III of Aragon, husband of Constance of Swabia. The daughter of Manfred, and first cousin of Conradin, is now the legitimate heir of their rights that the House of Swabia has over the throne of their two Sicilies, and the unique hope of the Ghiblian party. It must be seen in the deployed action by John of Procida thence, another aspect of the opposition of the Hyperborean wisdom to the plans of the White Fraternity, i.e. the esoteric cause of the failure of those plans. In fact, that great Hyperborean initiate took refuge in Aragon, with other illustrious persecuted, by Charles of Anjou and the Golems, and then incorporating the Argonese nobility. The king gave them many signiores in Valencia, from where he took contact with the Circulus Dominicanus, and he integrated to their strategy. To him, more than anyone, corresponds the merit of having persuaded Peter III about the justice of the Ghiblian cause. For years this lord of the dog advises the king of Aragon about the matters of Italy and plans the manner to conquer it. He was helped with enthusiastic animus by Constance, who wants to avenge his father Manfred and the destruction of her family Roger of Lauria, Conrad Lancia, and other Sicilian knights not initiated. In 1278, Peter III feels sufficiently strong to carry out his Sicilian project. He sends then John of Procida in a secret mission to Italy and the Middle East. The Sicilian knight travels wearing the Dominican robe. He meets with the main representatives of the Ghiblian party of Italy and Sicily who promised to help King Aragon, and in 1279 he reaches Constantinople to pact with the Emperor Michael Paleologos, who is about to be attacked by a fleet by Charles of Anjou. However, a fact that Charles of Anjou not suspected was that, in such age not existed more powerful fleet than the Catalan navy of King Aragon. The Byzantine contributes with 30,000 ounces of gold to maintain the campaign, and John started the return after passing through the Isle of Sicily. There, he obtained the compromise of the noble Alessimo de Lutini, 
and others to prepare an uprising against the French. All these arrangements obeyed to the strategy of Peter III, who wanted to prevent a direct struggle between France and Aragon, and prefers that the change emerges a local plot against Charles of Anjou. In 1281, everything is ready for the revolt, when a maneuver of the Golems obliged to suspend the movements. Charles of Anjou forced in Viterbo the election of Simon de Bru, a French cardinal highly clarified about the plans of the white fraternity which professed a ferocious hate for the house of Swabia and the Ghiblian cause. He takes the name of Martin the Fourth, and he immediately begins a terrible prosecution of the Ghiblians in all of Italy. Evidently, the Golems suspected that something was contrived against Charles, and they tried to stop it. Martin the Fourth is a typical exponent of the Gollum mentality, which is improperly called Guelph, of the fanatic class of George the Seventh and Innocent the Third. Possess all the cruelty of Arnautic Almeric, for his instance in the murders, rapes, and lootings that occurred steadily, subjecting the Sicilians to a regime of unsupportable terror. Finally, Rome will end rebelling. But in 1282 the state of things ends in Sicily. During the Easter celebration, the 30th of March, a French soldier tries to abuse a young Sicilian woman in Palermo, and at the cry, death to all the French, explodes the general insurrection. The French are exterminated in Palermo, Trapani, Corleone, Syracuse, and Agrigento. In one day died eight thousand, and rest must flee hastily from the island. In a single month it wasn't possible to find any French alive in Sicily. Were these popular reactions, the famous Sicilian Vespers, which occurred haphazardly due in those days to Peter the Third, having sailed from Barcelona with his powerful navy, and he was in Africa near to Sicily? His projects, largely elaborated, were carried out with great precision. In June he saw many Sicilian ships. They were ambassadors of Palermo, who came to offer the crown of Sicily to King Aragon and the Queen Constance. Then he landed in the island in the middle of the general joy of the people, that was seen with that act of sovereignty free forever from the French and Guelph domination. Therefore it was not about invasion, but of a legitimate re-election. The Sicilian people, liberated by their own means from the French occupation, was given to their own kings, restoring in this way the ancient rights of the House of Swabia in a person of the grandfather of Frederick II. But the Golems didn't bite the hook. Note, Dr. Signigel, that once again the Golems seemed to have won the match. The heretic Cathars didn't exist any more. Neither was perceived the presence of the Grail, nor existed an ostensible universal emperor as Frederick II to dispute with the Pope the spiritual power nor even existed a king in germany but in france yes philip the third completely controlled by the church and a financial templar synarchy in full march and a french king charles of anjou occupying the two sicilies and maintaining keeping at bay the luciferic giblians but strangely the smite of peter the third that could not foresee because he was product of the high strategy of the dominicanus produced the resurge of the Ghiblians, and threatened with the failure of plans to the white fraternity. The Golems would not permit it with impunity. In November of that year, Martin IV declares the excommunication of Peter III, and coerces him to withdraw from Sicily, and love Charles de Anjou, loyal vassal of the Pope. Before the indifference of the Argonese, he repeats the excommunication in January and March of 1283, preparing the hand to stab him in the back. In the last papal bull, indeed, he affirms that the King of Aragon is vassal of the Pope for commitment of Peter the Second, the grandfather of Peter the Third, who died in the Battle of Muret, and that the Pontiff has the faculty to name King to whom he pleases. So he removes the crown to the excommunicated Argonese, and deprives the sacraments of the Church to the populations and places that obeyed him. The Gollum's plan consists to outbreak a struggle unto death against Peter the Third and expand the dominion of France at the expenses of the one of Aragon. Would be the previous step to make that a king of the church be elated to the throne of the world government, supported by the financial synarchy of the Templars, and prepare the wherewithal to establish the universal synarchy. In that plan, evidently, the Gollum's had underestimated Peter the Third. Really, all failed with the Argonese because they ignored the spiritual strength that he had developed by the influence of John of Procida and the Dominicanus, but he promptly proves to have courage and unlimited intrepidity, an unbreakable loyalty to the principles of the Hyperborean wisdom. This is to the inheritance of the pure blood of his lineage. What grants him the divine right to reign without asking anyone than to himself, and a monolithic sense of honor? 
that the spirit dictates in him and impulse him to fight unto death for his ideal without surrendering formidable enemy have challenged the golem this time the stab in the back meant to compromise the kingdom of aragon in a war with france what peter the third was trying to avoid golems believed that the presence of peter the third of aragon would leave sicily free to fulfill the new occupation but the island protected by the catalan navy has been converted into an impregnable fortress peter the third withdraws serenely to aragon in twelve eighty three leaving the defence in the hands of the reckless and fortunate admiral roger of lauria charles of anjou possesses the second most important fleet of the mediterranean financed by the cistercian order of Provence, by the kingdom of naples and by the pope but he fails to plan a coherent tactic to face roger of lauria who in successive clashes will go destroying it relentlessly after to sink some ships and capture others he seizes the islands of malta gozo and liparia then he goes to naples and tends to an ambush to the french showing just a part of his squad charles of anjou is absent and his son charles the lame prince of salerno decides to respond to the challenge thinking in an easy victory then he begins the persecution of the catalans with all the available galleys colliding with the rest of the enemy navy that was the most important naval battle of the period in which roger of lauria sank a great number of french galleys captured others and only a few achieved to escape the flagship not had the same luck which was captured by roger in person and where was charles the lame jacob of brusson william stedarno and the other brave provincial and italian knights the son of charles of anjou is taken prisoner to sicily where all claim his execution and vengeance for the death of conradin nevertheless o oh mystery of the hyperborean spiritual nobleness is the queen constance who saved him and then he was confined in barcelona days after the defeat of his son charles of anjou arrived to gaeta but he not dared to attack the spaniards roger took advantage of that indecision to devastate the garrison of calabria and to take many continental regions in a short time sicily disposes of a governor in candelabria that threatens now by land the french dominion in naples but when charles decides to send the rest of his navy to the coasts of Provence to support the advance of the king of france his ships were taken between two fires in front of st paul and completely defeated by roger of lauria that disaster that costed seven thousand french lives represented the end of the neapolitan naval might of charles of anjou to all this martin the fourth outbreaks in twelve eighty four the strike that he thinks will be mortal for the argonese through a papal bull he offers the investitures of aragon catalonia and valencia to the king of france for one of his non-first-born sons philip the third accepts in the name of his son charles of valois and prepares to invade aragon the enormous warrior enterprise will be financed now by all the church of france and as in times of the cathars martin the fourth publishes a crusade against the excommunicated king of aragon the benedictian orders cluniac cistercians and templars agitate the entire europe calling to fight for christ the cross against the abominable Ghiblian heresy of peter the third soon philip the third who is the king of navarre gathers in the country an army integrated by two hundred and fifty thousand of infantry soldiers and fifty thousand in cavalry formed principally by french picards tolosates lombards bretons flemish burgundians provincials germans english etc with the assistance of four tolosate monks who revealed to philip the third a secret path through the pyrenees the crusaders invade catalonia in twelve eighty five surrounding the king and encouraging him permanently are the main cistercian golems who consider that war matter of life or death for their plans of world domination barely such king who in no case deserved the sobriquet of the bold would have joined to the crusade adventure without the sustained insistence of martin the fourth and the pressure of the french golem the papal legacy warns peter the third that he must obey the pontiff and give his kingdoms to the king of france to what the argonese respond is easy to take and give kingdoms that have cost nothing the mine bought with the blood of my ancestors shall be paid in the same price in catalonia the resistance turns fierce all the social classes support peter the third and what is sensed as a total war the argonese knights the infallible catalan crossbowmen the fiery almagavers warriors the servants and the combatants of the village stop harass and inflict permanent defeats to the crusaders 
Finally, an epidemic ends demoralizing them, and they choose to withdraw to the Pyrenees. But in Calado, the Paniza, is waiting for them Peter the Third to cut off their path, and for two days is fought the great battle. The French army ends annihilated. From the three hundred thousand crusaders, just forty thousand returned alive. The King Philip died in the campaign, and to France would be impossible the conquest of Aragon. It's in these circumstances that Philip the Fourth, the Fair, accesses the throne of France. Thirty fifth day. Charles of Anjou died on January seventh of twelve eighty five, sick and desperate. In March of twelve eighty five, died the Gollum Pope Martin the Fourth and Philip the Third, King of France. In October fifth of the same year, and at the end of that fateful year, November eleventh, twelve eighty five, expired Peter the Third of Aragon, the king who achieved to defeat the united force of the three precedents and frustrated in great measure the plans of the white fraternity. After his death, his kingdoms are distributed amongst his sons, girding Alfonso the triple crown of Aragon, Catalonia, and Valencia, and James the one of Sicily, succeeded by Frederick I. But John of Procida and the lords of the dog continued advising to the kings of Aragon. Hence, with the death of Philip III, the Gollums suppose that their plans are momentarily delayed. But only momentarily delayed or their plans are definitely frustrated, without being able to warn it at time. As will be seen immediately, only when it was too late, the Gollum will realize that something very strange has happened to the successor of Philip III. In fact, such king, whose education was entrusted to the most erudite monks of France, this is, to the Dominicans, had become a hyperborean initiate, a potential enemy of the plans of the white fraternity. How did such heresy occur? Who initiated him in the hyperborean wisdom? The answer— the unique possible answer would be the incredible possibility that inside the church, in one order of preachers, would have existed a conspiracy of followers of the Pact of Blood, a joint of initiates in the Hyperborean wisdom of the White Atlanteans. They not suspected, of course, from the Lords of Tarsus, to whom they considered definitely extinct, and they failed to discover opportunity to the guilt of the disaster. The hit would be extremely shocking, as to assimilate it with the necessary rapidity. And that inevitable perplexity, that paralyzing surprise caused by the high strategy of the Lords of Tarsus and the Circulus Dominicanus, would signalize the beginning of the end of the enemy strategy. Thenceforth, after Philip the Fourth performed his brilliant mission, the Gollums and the White Fraternity would have to wait until the twentieth century before they dispose other historical opportunity to establish the world government and the synarchy of the chosen people. As I said, the Gollums would not achieve to counteract the consequences of the new situation. They had maneuvered for many years to strengthen in Europe the House of France, and from its bosom would emerge a king hostile to the papal hegemony. They had yielded the field of the academic teaching to the Dominican monks, and the result that amongst them were infiltrated the enemies of God the One. And what was worse, to such order of preachers was entrusted the tribunal of the Holy Office, in charge to inquire about the faith, until then the Inquisition permitted them to eliminate, of neutralize oppositions under the threat of the accusation of heresy. And this they assumed clearly, the major heretics were them, thence they should work with caution. If it not, as the jujitsu, the own force of the attackers could be returned against them. Unable to submit him under the papal authority, the Gollums would try, vainly, to eliminate Philip IV, failure that was caused by the security enclosed that the Dominicanus tended around the king. When they finally poisoned him in 1314, Philip IV had reigned twenty-nine years and accomplished with honor the entrusted mission. And before the greatness of his work— Nothing count the culminies of a defeated Gollum church and a chosen people who lost their historic opportunity, even if they were repeated without fundament for seven hundred years. But during the twenty-nine years of his reign, neither would dispose of an equivalent political personality to replace or oppose him. The King of England, Edward I, even if he intervened in the European matters, he only did it indirectly in times of Philip the Fair, especially through his allies, the Earl of Flanders and the Duke of Guinea. His ruthlessness was against the Scots, maintained him occupying the British island, and in Germany the Guelph Rudolf of Habsburg, elected in 1273 to put end to the Intergrinum. 
died in 1291 dedicated to fight against the Ghiblians and to increase the goods of his house. He was succeeded by Adolf of Nassau, who only reigned for six years, engaged in a struggle with the sons of Rudolf, and then continued Albert I, who would concur peacefully with Philip IV and would agree with him in that the course of the Rhine would be the frontier between France and Germany. Nothing could do the Gollum against this sovereigns, to face a personality as the one of Philip the Fair, and we already know what could expect the kings of Aragon and Sicily. I want to show with this, Dr. Signagel, that once the control of the King of France was lost, the strategy of the Golems was seriously compromised. For fifty years the Circulus Dominicanus awaited their opportunity. This was presented with Philip IV, over whom they exercised great influence since his childhood due to the high number of instructors of the infant that existed amongst them. When Philip III died, his son had seventeen years old, and he was initiated in the Hyperborean wisdom and secrecy. It is possible to affirm, then, that when he started to reign, he already disposed of a clear project of historical mission. And he had also people around him that would advise him and would allow him to execute his ideas. Because it is convenient to distinguish clearly between two objectives, complementary, that are established as goals in that moment, the first is the one proposed by the Circulus Dominicanus, and already explained that aimed to stop the enemy strategy and avoid the golems to fulfill the synarchy of the chosen people. The second objective sprouted from the pure blood of Philip IV, and consisted, as in the case of Frederick II, in to express on its highest grade the regal function. In regard to the second, must not be forgotten that in every lineage of the Capsians, as in all the Hyperborean lineages, existed a familiar mission impressed by their remote ancestors in times of the fall in the cultural pact, and the lineage of Philip IV was of very pure blood. Even if in the last generations they would have been dominated by the priests of the cultural pact, that's to say by the monks and the Gollum bishops, such dynasty indeed began with the first king of France, Hugh Capet, son of Hugh the Great and grandchild of the Earl of Paris and Duke of France, Robert. This last one was son of Robert, the strong member of the royal Saxon house, invested by Charles the Bald, grandchild of Charlemagne, with the title of Count of Anjou. To make that his German troops stop the Normans' attacks, and Philip IV would reborn, thence, as occurred with Frederick II, a fruit that proceeded of the same Saxon racial root, and that was developed in secrecy in the fertile field of the pure blood. We'll be seeing how both objectives are reached jointly, as the regal function assumed entirely by Philip IV, who deposited in the society the seed of the nationality and how the measures taken in his government, measures based in the Hyperborean wisdom, would produce the failure of the plans of the white fraternity. Lamentability, Philip IV, would not reach to see totally realized his yearnings by the same reason that were not entirely reached by Frederick II. The age was not propitious, for the integral application of a strategy that could only end with the final battle against the potencies of the matter. Such age is still pending in history, and perhaps we are entering in it. But Philip IV was as near as he could be to his objective, and that undeniable fact lies his glory. In first place of importance, the instructors Dominicanus revealed to the child in what consisted the regal function of the Pact of Blood, concept that Frederick II, seventy years before, had understood clearly. If a racial population exists, a community of blood, always, always in its bosom, an aristocracy of the spirit will be conformed. From where would emerge the sovereign king? The king will be who has the highest grade of the aristocracy, the purest blood, who has such courage will be recognized charismatically by the people and will reign for the divine right of the spirit. His sovereignty could not be questioned nor discussed. Thus, his power shall be absolute. There is nothing higher than the spirit and the king of blood represents the spirit. And in the pure blood of the population lies the spirit. And for this reason the king of the pure blood who represents the spirit is also the voice of the people, the individualized will that tends towards the spirit, in such way that nothing material can interpose between the king of the blood and the population. On the contrary, the pure blood unites them charismatically, in a contact that is out of the time and space, in that absolute instance beyond the created matter which is called the common origin of the race of the spirit. Therefore, all what is materially conformed in relation to the population must be subordinated to the king of the blood. All the wills must join or break before his will. All powers must be subordinate to his power. 
Even the religious power and the ones who reaches the limits of the cult must lean under the will of the spirit that the king of the blood manifests. In second place is explained to Philip IV that the fall of the populations of the Pact of Blood is suffered due to a war fatigue and the employed methods by the priests of the cultural pact to detract, deform, and corrupt the regal function. In the case of the Roman Empire, the aforementioned concepts, inherited by the Etruscians, were contemplated in the ancient Roman law and in many aspects would remain present until the period of the Christian emperors. Specifically, would be Constantine who would open the door to the staunchest followers of the cultural pact. When he authorized with the Edict of Milan the practice of the Judeo-Christian cult, but the greatest damage to the regal function would be caused by Thodius, the first, seventy years later, when he made official the Judeo-Christianity as the unique religion of the state would begin then the large but fruitful process in which the Roman law would be converted into the canon law. It means that what was convenient to lay the foundation of the supremacy of the papacy in the Roman law would be retained in the canon law, and the rest wisely expurgated or ignored. That process would give the juristic justification to the Caesar opepsium, the papal pretension to impose a religious absolutism over the kings of the blood, whose most fervent exponents were Gregory the Seventh, Innocent the Third, and Boniface the Eighth. Before the decadence of the empire, the Roman kings and emperors attributed themselves divine origin, and that was also in Roman law. The task of the Catholic canonists was, if it desired, very simple. Consisted in substitution, pagan gods, source of regal sovereignty, for the real god, and to replace the highest representatives of the power or king emperor for the image of Peter, the vicar of Jesus Christ. Even if it's obvious, it must be clarified that after these substitutions every divine origin remained exiled from the canon law, that from now on would be the official law in the Christian world. Jesus Christ had been manifested only one time, and he said, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The divine right to reign the church, and all its congregation, poor or rich, noble or commoner, corresponded. Then, only to Peter, and of course to his successors, the high priests of the Lord, Peter had been chosen by Jesus Christ to be his representative and to express his power. And Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the God one in the mystery of the Trinity, the Creator God of all that existent. There would be nothing, then, in the world that could be considered more elevated than the representative of the Creator God. In consequence, if someone dared to oppose Peter, or pretended to exercise a power or will opposed to the vicar of Jesus Christ, or to assume a divine right for it, would be clearly a heretic, a man damned of God, a being whose own insolence has situated out of the church and to whom corresponds with all justice to erase also from the world. Hence the canon law not left any possibility for the kings of blood to exert the regal function. The real sovereignty proceeded now from the Christian cult, and the kings should be invested by the successor of Peter, the Maximus priests. And if the royalty should be confirmed, with it remained annulled the principle of the aristocracy of the pure blood, just as was convenient for the cultural pact. Naturally, as many times before, the populations will submit to the spell of the priests, and will come the tenebrous days of the absence of the king, in which the regal function has been usurped by the potencies of the matter. The kings of the canon law are kings of blood, but mere governors, agents of the state power. According to the definition of the Pope Galasius I, a part of the power of the state exists the authority of the church, from where proceeds the sovereignty of the first. From this Galician idea comes the theory of the two swords, realized by the Gollum Saint Bernard. The power of the state is analogous to the temporal sword, as the authority of the church is equivalent to the spiritual sword. Peter and his successors, therefore, would wield the spiritual sword, before which shall lean the temporal sword of the kings and emperors. But nothing of this is true, even though it is encoded in the canon law. The pretended spiritual sword of the Gollum church is just a priestly sword, and the power of a king of the blood authorized to exert for the divine right of the eternal spirit is not precisely analogous to the temporal sword, but to a sword of absolute will. A sword which hilt is located in the origin, beyond time and space, but whose blade can cross the time and space and be manifested to the people. In every case, the king of the blood wields the volitional sword, which action is called honor, and impresses with its touch the forms of the kingdom, 
from those hits of real will, from these acts of honor, will appear the legislation, the justice, and the wise administration of the charismatic state. If Philip the Fourth wants to present himself as king of the blood, clarify the Dominicanus, he shall restore previously the regal function, he shall abandon the illusory temporal sword that was imposed to his ancestors by the priests of the cultural pact, and wield the real volitional sword of the lords of the pact of blood, the sword that manifests the absolute power of the spirit. However, the canon law prevailing until those days legalizes the hierarchization of the swords according to the cultural pact. First, the priestly sword, pontifical second, the temporal sword, regal. It is necessary then to modify the juridical existence order, to circumscribe the canon law, to the exclusive ambit of the religious and establish a separate civil law. The regal function demands inevitably the separation of the church and the state. Well, in front of this exigency, Philip IV was not in a situation to initiate something totally new, something kind of juridical revolution. On the contrary, the Circulus Dominicanus was preparing the field for it since the time of Louis the Ninth, grandfather of Philip IV. Since those days, in fact, the lords of the dog came influencing in the French court to favor the formation of a whole class of secular legists, whose secret mission would consist in revise and update the Roman law. Philip the Third, the son of Louis the Ninth, was a king completely dominated by the Cistercian Golems, who maintained him in such ignorance that, useful as an example, they never taught to read or write. His mental structure, skillfully modeled by the Golems' instructors, corresponded more to a monk than a warrior. The lords of the dog never tried to alter this control because their strategy not passed by him, but through his son, Philip the Fourth. However, in one moment they achieved to influence in Philip the Third for the approval of a law, apparently profitable for the crown, in which was reserved the right to give nobility titles to the secular legists. This juridical instrument was used then to promote many and important Dominicanus to the highest charges and magistrates of the court, until then prohibited to all the commoner classes. Those secular legists belonging to the Circulus Dominicanus were dedicated with great devotion to their specific mission, and in 1285 they had already developed the fundaments that would allow to build a state in which the regal function would be over another power. Philip IV would count then with a team of advisors and functionaries highly specialized in the Roman law, who would help him faithfully in his confrontation with the Gollum papacy. From the most prestigious universities of France, especially Paris, Toulouse, and Montpellier, but also of the order of preachers, and even the new educated Bourgoy, will emerge the legists that will give intellectual support to Philip IV. Among the main of them, the knights Pierre Flotte, Robert de Artois, and the Earl of St. Paul, the Engorand de Miragini, coming from the Norman Bourgoy, as well as his brother, the Bishop Philip de Margini, Guillaume de Placien, Knight of Toulouse, and Ferva and Cathar, and Guillaume de Nogret, member of the family of villagers who dwelled in the lands of Pedro de Creta and Valentina, and San Felix de Carmen, his grandfathers had been burnt in Albi by Simon de Montfort. But he professed Catharism in secrecy and integrated the Circulus Dominicanus. He was law professor in Montpierre and Nîmes, before being convened court of Philip the Fair. 36th Day Starting from the aforementioned concepts, inculcated to Philip IV by the Dominicanus instructors, he goes establishing the future strategy. First of all, we have to restore the regal function. For it, he will attempt to separate the church from the state, and such separation will be based in the precise juridical arguments of the Roman law. But the participation of the church was manifested in the three main powers of the state, in the legislative, by the supremacy of the canon law over the civil, the judicial, by the supremacy of the ecclesiastical tribunals, to judge every case, independently and over the civil justice, and the administrative, by the absorption of great rents coming from the kingdom, preventing the state to exert any control over them. The measures that Philip IV will adopt to change this last point will be those that will provoke the most violent reaction of the golems. When Philip IV accesses to the throne, the church was politically and economically powerful and was superimposed on the state. 
His father, Philip III, had implicated the kingdom in a crusade against Aragon, which had already cost a terrible defeat to the French arms. The monarchy was weak before the landowner nobles. The feudal lords, when they fell to the cultural pact, gave a superlative value to the property of the land, abandoning or forgetting the ancient strategic concept of the occupation that sustained the populations of the Pact of Blood. Therefore, in times of Philip IV, was accepted that an absurd relation existed between the nobility of a lineage and the surface of the lands of their property, in such manner that the lord, who had more lands, pretended to be more noble and powerful, reaching to dispute the sovereignty to the own kingdom. Before Philip Augustus, 1880-1223, for example, the Duke of Guinea, the Count of Toulouse, or the Duke of Normandy, possessed individually more lands than the reigning house of the Capetians. The King of England, in theory, was the vassal of the King of France, but in more than one occasion his territorial dominion converted him in a powerful rival. That was seen clearly during the reign of Henry II, Plantagenet who, a part of the King of England, was also a ruler of a great part of France, Normandy, Maine, Anjou, Touraine, Aquitaine, Auvergne, Angamoy, Marche, Pergord. Only when John Lackland committed the errors that are known, the King Philip Augustus recovered for his house the Normandy, the Anjou, the Maine, the Touraine, and the Pateau. However, Louis the Ninth, partner of Edward I in the Crusade, would return to this English king the French feuds. Since the dismemberment of Charlemagne's empire, and until Philip III, not existed nothing similar to the national consciousness in the kings of France, but an ambition of territorial dominance that aimed to support the feudal power. The nobility was then purely cultural, was founded in the titles of the property and not in the blood, as would correspond to the authentic aristocracy of the spirit. In such manner, that territorial expansions of the predecessors of Philip IV had no other objective than obtaining the power and the prestige in the feudal society. In no way these possessions would have guided to the political unity of France, to the absolute monarchy, to the rational and centralized administration, and the national consciousness. Such results were exclusive consequence of the strategy of Philip IV. But a Hyperborean strategy is not a mere set of measures, but the dynamic structure of an action finally effective. The strategy of Philip IV was based in the next concept of the Hyperborean wisdom. If a population is organized according to the Pact of Blood, then the regal function demands the strategic mode of life. It means that the king of the Pact of Blood shall guide his people, applying the strategic principles of the occupation of the enclosure in the strategic wall supplemented with the principle of the magical cultivation, i.e. with the white Atlantean inheritance of the agriculture and the animal husbandry. To this concept that I already mentioned in the third day is necessary to return to comprehend structurally the change in the French policy after the advent of Philip the Fair. In practical terms, the strategy of Philip IV that he wanted to implement consisted in the execution of the three principles mentioned through three correspondence political facts. I will explain now in order how Philip IV understood such principles related to the regal function, and I will show how his political acts responded faithfully to the Hyperborean strategy of the Dominicanus. First, occupation of the real space. The principle admits many grades of comprehension. Obviously, in the case of the regal function, the occupation must include essentially the territory of the kingdom. But who should occupy the lands of the kingdom? The king of blood and the reigning house and the name of the racial community, i.e. of the spirit, which is a population of the Pact of Blood. Because the king is, according to what is said, the voice of the people, their individualized will, the king must occupy the territory of the kingdom to concentrate the popular sovereignty. The patrimonial feudal system, product of the cultural pact, was undermining against the regal function because it maintained the king separated from the people. The medieval population, indeed, they owed direct obedience to the territorial lords, and they to the king, and the king could only communicate with the people through the feudal lords. For this reason, Philip IV would sanction a law that obeyed to all the people of France to swear fidelity directly to the king, without intermediaries of any type. Nothing material can interpose between the king of the blood and the people. In synthesis, the occupation of the kingdom by the king is the sovereignty. Second, 
Apply the principle of enclosure in the real occupied space, and the most superficial grade of significance is referred also the territorial area. The own area must be strategically isolated from the enemy dominion through the principle of enclosure. This means that in every case, the definition of a state frontier. But in the second strategic step is the one that gives reality to the concept of nation, according to the Pact of Blood, a population of origin, of common blood and race, organized as sovereign state, and occupying and fencing the lands of its kingdom, constitutes a nation. Inside of the enclosure is the nation, out the enemy. Nevertheless, such ideal separation can be altered by diverse factors, and is not without struggle that can be fulfilled the application of the principle of enclosure, and give birth to the nationality. Can occur, as will be seen immediately, that the area of the enclosure exceeds, in certain stratums of the real space, the territorial area, invading the space of other nations. But can also occur that the exterior enemy enters in the area of the own state, and threat the nation internally. This last case is not difficult due to the cultural nature of the enemy. That's to say, it proceeds from the cultural pact. The exterior enemy is also the interior enemy, because the enemy is one, is the one and his representatives. In other words, the enemy lacks of nationality, or rather, is international. The enemy not know the principle of enclosure, and not respect any kind of frontiers due to the whole world for him, is his campus belly. And in that field of universal war, where he tries to impose his will, are included the nations and the populations, the cities and the cloisters, the cultures that give sense to the man, and the fertile field of his soul. It is understood, then, that the principle of enclosure is a more extensive concept than the suggested at first, and that only its exact definition and application allows the discovery of the enemy. The principle is referred, really, a strategic fence, which existence depends only of the will of those who apply and sustain it. For this reason, the enclosure includes multiple fields, a part of the merely territorial. An area occupied can be effectively fenced, but such geographical area is nothing else than the application of the principle of enclosure. Is not the strategic enclosure itself. The strategic enclosure never describes a geographic area, neither geometric, but charismatic. This is verified clearly in the case of the nation that admits many national frontiers a part of the geographics. The territorial limits of Babylon perhaps were signalized by the river Tigris and Euphrates, but the frontiers of the fear that inspired its national army was extended to all the ancient world. And the same principle can be employed to signalize any other aspect of the culture of a nation, which will always present an area of national influence. Only the members of a nation know where begin and end its limits, who are aloof to it can intuit the regions in which the national is manifested, but the precise definition is only known by those who belong to the nation, and this perception, which is neither rational nor irrational, it is said, is charismatic. The Hyperborean wisdom affirms the principle of the enclosure determines a form and a content. To the form calls mystic, and to the content charisma. The members of a nation, on the other hand, are strategic subjects. A nation, as a product of the strategic enclosure, determines its own mystic form, which is perceived charismatically by the strategic subjects that it belongs to. Every mystic, the national or any other, is independent of the time and physical space. Its manifestation is purely charismatic. For this reason, all who perceive the mystic, that's to say, who are under the same strategic enclosure, acquire identic knowledge about its form. Without difference of perspective, such unity is possible, because all the strategic subjects have a connection a priori, which is the common origin of the pure blood. Under the form of a mystic, the strategic subjects experience a charismatic connection that unites them in the origin and reveals them identical truth. It is understood, then, the concept of centrality of the mystic. Every strategic subject is the core of the mystic. But as the perception is charismatic, not temporal or spatial, it is clear that the same core is simultaneously in all the strategic subjects. In regard to the mystical nation, for example, there is a center that lies simultaneously in all the members of their people, the strategic subjects.
Each one of them projects the principle of enclosure in any field, being geographic or cultural, and receives charismatically the national mystic, and the nation is one and the same for all. Now it will be understood better, Dr. Signigel, the charismatic character of the regal function. According to the Hyperborean wisdom, if the core of a mystical nation is embodied in one man, he undoubtedly is the king of the pure blood, racial leader, charismatic chief, etc., of that population. The king of the pure blood constitutes, then, the fundamental core of the mystic of the kingdom, which is the same center that lies simultaneously in all his people, in such manner that nothing material can interpose between the king of the blood and the population, because amongst them exists the charismatic connection in the common origin of the pure blood. When applying the principle of the enclosure to his kingdom, Philip the Fourth perceives the mystic of the French nation, and also sees, as for contrast, to the enemy, external and internal. Who is the enemy? It is necessary to consider many grades. In first place, the enemy is anyone who is opposed to the establishment of the strategic enclosure, who recognize a national frontier but not accept it, who pressure against any of the national frontiers. In this case, is, for example, other nation, neighbor or not, but that exerts the unquestionable power to expand its national enclosure, based in the divine right of the spirit, to reign over populations racially inferior, and to occupy their territory. The polemic will decide the war, the means by which is determined unequivocally what nation possesses the best Hyperborean strategy. And therefore, what is population of purest blood, and who is the more spiritual king of blood? But this is a worthy enemy, because recognizes the existence of the adversary nation, although not respects the limits of the enclosure. With such enemy, it is always possible to pact an agreement of national coexistence, which doesn't mean, of course, the definitive peace, due to it is not possible to suspend the charismatic effect of an aristocracy of the pure blood. As is in any other nation, will be appearing leaders that will try to resolve the problem. The permanent peace is not conceived in the national strategy of the populations of the Pact of Blood, but a concept absolutely different, known as national mystic, and that will be reached by both populations at the end of the war. The first objective of the national war is not, then, the mere occupation of the enemy territory, neither the imposition of a foreign culture, nor the annihilation of the faced population. All these objectives, placed in first term, obey to the strategic deviations introduced by the priests of the cultural pact. The main objective is the incorporation of the enemy nation to the own national mystic, the charismatic connection between both populations, and the coincidence with the king of the blood. And if that means the destruction of a royal family, the extinction of a voice of the people, the triumphant mystic will be manifested. For all the strategic subjects in struggle— another voice of the people of superior charismatic character that will express them all. But in second grade, it must be considered that the enemy doesn't admit even the right to exist to the mystical nations. With this enemy is not possible the conciliations of any type. Of course that he neither requests it, because he never declares the war openly, to which they affirm, the repudiate, and prefers to operate in secrecy, from inside of the strategic enclosure is proposed in this manner to corrupt and destroy the charismatic bases of the mystical state, and to cause enfeeblement and eventually disintegration of the mystical form. This enemy, that must be qualified as synarchic, has in every nation and in all the sectors of the structures of the state, with organizations of indoctrinated agents in the objectives of the cultural pact. Such satanic internationals conspire against the existence of the mystic nation and therefore against the application of the principle of the enclosure and the charismatic connection between the king and the people that puts the nation out of their control, that's to say, out of the control of the white fraternity, which encourage, feeds, and vivify the synarchic internationalisms. The plans of the white fraternity, I already explained widely, aims to establish the universal synarchy of the chosen people. For this reason, such internationals would coincide all in to sustain the principles of the cultural pact, directed treacherously to debilitate the Hyperborean strategic principles of the populations of the Pact of Blood, to erase ethic base to the reality of the aristocracy of the spirit, founded over the racial heritage of the symbol of the origin in the populations of pure blood. They affirmed the equality of all men before the creator Jehovah Satan 
to demonstrate that the strategic enclosure and the nation defined by him was only a measly idea, elaborated by mediocre men, austere and egotistic, who would never accept the high ideal of the universalism. They employed the Christianity as instrument to equate culturally the populations and then condition them to identify a universal principle of the power with the Pope of Rome, who with no doubt wielded the priestly sword that dominated the temporal sword of the kings. The Pope was a real universal sovereign, who prevailed over the populations and nations. Before his greatness and power, the work of the kings of the blood would have to appear from the asleep man evidently unprovided of the mystical character, and the aristocracy of the spirit and the blood would be, for the fanatic egalitarians, an artificial creation of the nobility, a product of the privileges of the feudal society, and to discredit the war as means to affirm the national mystic. They were proposing the utopia of the peace, a perpetual peace that would be obtained in every case if the humanity entered in the stage of the religious universalism. If all the secular powers, the temporal swords, kneel before the priestly sword of the Catholic high priest, then the wars would end, and the Christians would live forever in peace, far from the arms and the battlefields, and of the caprice of the lords, committed to the work and the prayer, protected by the absolute justice of the representatives of God and his law. Only one world government would have the power, and yet it might be possible that the two swords would be in the hands of an imperial pope and the peace would bring richness to all. But that richness would be administered fairly and equitably by a unique bank, product of a bank concentration, or financial synarchy, dependent exclusively on the high priest that would exert the universal power. The Christian people, then, shouldn't doubt about who really represented their interests, and to whom they should concede without questioning the universal sovereignty, the occupant of the throne of St. Peter, the promoter of the Universalist Pact, the regent of the Pigeon of Israel. Against this Christian civilization of love and peace, of egalitarian culture, were opposed to the national frontiers and the kings of the blood, and the pagan civilization of hate and war, which invariably was produced inside the mystical enclosures, and the aristocracy of the spirit, and the strategic subjects that were perceived charismatically and knew the limits of the national frontiers. Against them they would fight without declaring the war, subversively, the internal enemy and external of the nation, supported by their forces of fifth column, in their international organizations that aimed all to the establishment of the world government and the synarchy of the chosen people. And who was the enemy of the French nation? With the advice of the Dominicanus, Philip IV determines rigorously the identity of the enemy, who is deployed in many tactical organisms. In order of dangerousness, the different lines of action were carried out by the following organizations. First, the Gollum Church. Since centuries ago that the Gollums controlled the papal elections and, from Rome, they guided the Christian world. Even if the main enemy, properly speaking, were the Gollums, they would oppose to Philip IV as external enemy through the Pope and as internal enemy through their monastic orders, warrior and financial. Second, the Benedictian Gollum Orders, the Congregation of Cluny, the Cistercian Order, and the Templar Order that employed the Kingdom of France headquarter. Third, the Chosen People, with their permanent, destabilizing, and corrupt task. Fourth, the Lombard Bank, property of the Guelph Houses of Italy. Fifth, the English Royal House, controlled by the Anglo-Saxon Gollums and owner of great feuds in the Kingdom of France. And sixth, some feudal lords vassals of the King of France as the Earl of Flanders, who betrayed the king in favor of the English royal house, motivated by commercial and financial interests, to whom were not strange the numerous and rich members of the chosen people, who infected the Flemish and English cities, and by the anti-French influence of the Anglo-Saxon golems. Third, build a strategic wall. It is understandable that Philip IV not reached to comply with the third objective of the strategic way of life due to, if such thing would have occurred, the history of humanity would have taken a totally opposed course, and would not have been now, again, in the precedent moments to the settlement of the world government, in the synarchy of the chosen people. The application of the principle of enclosure, brilliantly accomplished by Philip the Fair, caused his life in hands of the internal enemy. 
but it served to signalize the total failure of the plans of the white fraternity in that age. And the men of stone and Hyperborean pontiffs, who inside of the Circulus Dominicanus were awaiting the occasion to spend the project due to the lack of initiatic aptitudes of the next kings, who plunged the kingdom already converted in a sovereign nation in multiple difficulties, which only one of them was the Hundred Years' War. 37th Day We are getting closer, Dr. Signigel, to the denouement of the history of Philip IV. That's to say, the moment in which the plans of the White Fraternity failed, developed during the previous seven hundred years by the Golems. I already indicated from where would begin the strategy of the initiated king, occupation of the real space and enclosure. Then the internal enemy should be eliminated to safeguard the national mystic, which is the effective action field of the regal function. The concepts of the Hyperborean wisdom that I exposed the last days, and that in analogous manner were assimilated by Philip IV in the thirteenth century, permitted to access to a different strategic point of view, from where the acts of his reign were acquiring its real sense. Philip IV receives the crown of France in 1285. He inherited from Philip III in that moment the military disaster of the crusade against Aragon, and the obligation contracted by the realm to vest his brother Charles with the crowns of Peter III. But Philip IV was interested to continue the struggle, and he limited to stop the hits of audacity of the Argonese that, emboldened by their triumphs, realized periodic incursions and disembarkations in French territory. The Peace of Tarasson, Concerted in 1291, in the Treaty of Anagni, of 1295, with free hands the king would undertake the enterprise to expel the English from the French territory. Guinea was the most extensive province of France after the Languedoc. From its capital, Bordeaux, came Bertrand de Gaut, a lord of the dog who was pope under the name of Clement V, and from whom I will talk later. But that huge duchy was in power of Edward I, Plantagenet, since 1252. Although surrounded by the French counties of Poitou, Guinea, and Gascony, and the Kingdom of Navarre, which king was also Philip IV, the opportunity to occupy the English areas of Guinea would be given by a conflict between English and Normand marines in the port of Bayonne in 1292. The English corsairs seized of a French squadron, and they ransacked the La Rochelle, Nothing else needed the French to take numerous strongholds and castles and try to close the enclosure. Two years later, England and France were mired in sanguinary naval war. The war against the English exterior enemy not only meant the change of front of the French policy, but also contributed a great pretext to initiate the administrative reform of the kingdom. This reform, largely planned by the Dominicanus legists, had to start necessarily with the financial separation of church and the state. Essentially was necessary to control the ecclesiastic rents that usually were retired to Rome out of any audit. In parallel would be sanctioned a tax system that assured the continuity of the real rents. The pretext consisted in the authorization that the popes had granted to Philip III and Philip IV to tax with the tithe the rents of the Church of France, with a finality to afford the crusade against Aragon. If in 1295 the peace with Aragon was concerted, one year before exploded the war with England giving occasion to Philip to prosecute with exactations. That was not legal, nevertheless soon it would be thanks to the real law at the ends of the 1295 that imposed to the clergy of France the forced contribution of a war tax over their rents. Before it they see that the reaction of the Gollum Church deserves a separate commentary. The attitude that the Pope Gollum, Martin IV, had assumed when he questioned the realms of Peter III. On it is clearly appreciated the enormous hate that he felt against the House of Swabia. The case in that impressive army that Philip III took to Catalonia not only was financed with the tithe of the Church of France, Martin IV suspended the crusade that was being planned by Edward I of England to the Holy Land, to derive against Aragon the tithe of the English clergy, but he also spent entirely the sums with which Sardinia, Hungary, Sweden, Denmark, Slovenia, and Poland had contributed to aid the Christians of Palestine. Waiting in vain the succor of Europe, the Oriental regions would not delay to fall in power of the Saracens. In 1291, Acre, the last Christian bastion, 
seated before the emir of Egypt, Malik el Askarf. Thus, two centuries after the First Crusade, and leaving rivers of blood behind, concluded the existence of the Christian kingdom of Jerusalem. The order of the temple, without the necessity now of stimulating, the sustenance of the army of the East, remained free to dedicate to their real mission. To affirm them as first financial potency of Europe, to maintain a militia of knights as base for the future unique European army, and the synarchy of the chosen people. After the deaths of Martin IV and Philip III, the Pope Honorius IV continued giving tithes to Philip the Fair, with the hope that he would give accomplishment to the crusade against Aragon. Same criterion would adopt Nicholas IV, since 1288 until 1292, who was follower of the Angevins, even though he belonged to the Ghiblian family. Nonetheless, he favored to the family Colonna, naming Peter Colonna Cardinal. He founded the University of Montpellier, where Guillaume de Nogaret would teach laws, and he would put the Order of Friars Minor under the direct jurisdiction of the throne of St. Peter. The fall of Acre produced to him great consternation, and he published a crusade to send succor to the Christians and the attempt of the reconquest. He was tracing these plans when he died in an epidemic that decimated the city of Rome. When such pope died, who represented an encouraging promise in the projects of the king of France? The cardinals fled on its majority to Riete and Perugia, leaving abandoned the Holy See for more than two years. During that interval, the pontifical household would remain vacant. Apparently, the twelve cardinals, six Romans, four Italians, and two French not achieved to agree in the election of a new pope. But, in reality, the delay obeyed to a skilled maneuver of Philip IV and the Lords of the Dog. The Golems had favored the French presence in Italy because they had the House of France as unconditionally Guelph. They never foresaw that from its bosom would emerge a Ghiblian king. That confidence was rewarded in principle by the terrible repression that Charles d'Anjou exerted over the Ghiblian party and the members of the House of Swabia, and these services had the effect of increasing the French influence in the issues of Rome. Philip IV would know how to take advantage of this situation to prepare in secrecy the resurrection of the Ghiblian party. His main allies would be the members of the family Colonna and the Cardinal Hugh Asilian, who communicated with him through Pierre de Paroy, Prior de Chase, who was Lord of the Dog and French secret agent. To all of them had been offered rich French counties in turn of the support of the College of Cardinals. The support consisted, of course, in to avoid that a column pope be elected or, in the best of the cases, to name a Dominican. The Colonas were a family of noble Romans who for many centuries had much weight in the Rome government and in the Catholic Church. They had a lot of signiories in the mountainous region that goes from Rome to Naples, in such a manner that almost all the paths toward the south of Italy passed through their lands. In those days existed two Colonas, cardinals. The old man Jacobo Colonna, patron of the Order of Spiritual Friars, and his nephew Peter Colonna, the older brother of Peter, John Colonna, in the same period, was senator and governor of Rome. It is evident to mention that this family constituted a powerful clan that formed a party with other lords, knights, and bishops. Such party was faced with great strength against the second important clan, the one of the Orsinis and the Ursinos, who were decidedly Guelph, and were controlled by the Golems. Both groups dominated the rest cardinals that had to decide the papal election. Until that moment the positions were drawn, the Colonas trying to hinder the Golem attempts and to propose, in turn, members of their own clan. But the Catholic Church was in that age an organization extended through the whole world, with thousands of churches and vassal signiories that directed considerable amounts of money and valuable merchandise. Its administration could not remain too much time adrift, Hence, after two years and three months of discussions, the situation turned quite unsustainable, as to demand to the election without delay. Then, once they realized that no accordance would emerge to name any of the present cardinals popes, they agreed to designate a non-cardinal. Both groups thought that a straw person, a weak pope whose will could be guided in secrecy. Therefore, in July 5th of 1294, is obtained the unanimous votes, opting all for Peter de Moron a saint hermit of eighty-five years old, who lived retired in the cavern of Abruzzo. The spiritual Franciscans, led by Jacobo Colonna, had retaken the ancient monastic tradition, inspired by the rule of St. Francis, and in the apocalyptic vision of Joachim of Fiore. 
Thirty years before, Peter was guide of many communities of spiritual Francians, but not satisfied yet with the extreme rigor of the order, he founded his own, which later would be remembered as the Order of the Celestines. Nevertheless, even though the Celestines' monasteries were extended continuously through the region of Abruzzo and the Meridional, Italy, Peter had retired to the cavern of Motagne del Moron to devote himself to a contemplative life, was in that retirement when he had news about his nomination for the charge of Pope. He doubted of the convenience to accept, but he was convinced by Charles the Second, the Lame, son of Charles of Anjou, who, liberated from the Catalan prison, was reigning in Naples. Finally, Peter accepted the papal investiture, and took the name of Celestine V. All the Christianity saluted Mary the enthronement of the saint from whom was expected to put end to the regent materialism and immortality of the ecclesiastic hierarchy, and to open the church to a spiritual reform. It is understood, then, that for the Colonna, and for Philip IV, such election had taste of triumph. But Peter de Moron lacked of every instruction, and the necessary knowledge to administer in an institution of the dimensions of the Catholic Church. His unique experience of government came from the conduction of small communities of friars. Moreover, the saint was not interested in those mundane matters, but was all related with the practical religion. The evangelization, the prayer, the salvation of the soul, hence he delegated amongst the cardinals and in a group of legists, bishops, the temporal issues, forming a corrupt environment and, and interested that in four months plunged the church into a great economic disorder. The Gollums, as is logic, were also expecting to control Peter de Moron. They relied above all in the king of Naples, for whom Peter professed special affection. They supposed that Charles the Second would not support the intrigues of his cousin, Philip the Fair, and he would prosecute the Guelph policy of Charles of Anjou. With the help of the king would be easy to achieve that the Pope could sanction as his own the measures proposed by them. And they also had an astounding secret. A cardinal, the Benedictian Gatani coming from a Ghiblian family and openly enrolled in the cause of France, was one of their own. This Gollum, doctor in canon law, theologian, and expert in diplomacy, would place himself near to the saint without awakening the suspicions of the Colonna, against whom he fed in his interior mortal desires. It is convenient to stand out now the two changes introduced by Celestian V at the requests of Charles the Second. The numbers of cardinals increased, naming other twelve, most of them French and Italian, and he re-established the law of the conclave, that obeyed to replace the vacancies members of the sacred college, and he bestowed to the spiritual Francians the authorization to work independently from the order of friars minor. Such dispositions favored the French influence in the church, and the party of the Colonna. The Gollums would not reach to control Celestine V, and as the months passed and fell in the account that the war between France and England not only strengthened Philip the Fourth, but threatened with paralyzing the plans of the white fraternity. There was no time for quibbling any more. It was urgent to eliminate the saint and put in his place a Gollum Pope, a man capable to impose over such callow king who dared to challenge the potencies of the matter. Since the throne of St. Peter, which dominion they had exerted almost continuously for seven hundred years, would present to Philip IV an opposition, as was never seen since the days of Henry IV, Frederick I, and Frederick II. However, they didn't dare to kill Celestine for the repercussions that this fact could have over the people of Italy, which was impressed by the spiritual virtues of the Pope. In this way appeared the idea to convince the saint that his pontificate was not appropriate for the Church which required a pope occupied to carry out other important issues a part of the religious, as to be administrative, legislative, juristic, and diplomatic. The prolocutor of this idea, and who offered the legal counseling to fulfill the renounce, was the Benedictine cardinal Gatani. Such pressures produced doubts in Celestine, but the advices of those who wanted him to remain in his place could be more, due to the church required the sanctity of his presence. Approximately after five months of his reign, Benedictine Gatani reaches to the coarse appeal to buy his valet and to place him from the superior floor. A voice bare tube on the back of the Christ of the altar, and a chapel to which Celestine occurred daily to pray. The voice that emerged from Jesus said, Celestine, release from your sword the feud of the papacy, due to its heaviest that your forces. In the beginning, the saint took the advice as from heaven 
but later he was warned about the humbug. However, the Christmas party was drawing nigh, and Celestine was deposed to retire to a lonely monastery in the Abruzzo to pray in solitude, as was his custom all of his life. By counsel of the King of Naples, he decided to assign three cardinals, authorized with great powers to make them act in his name during the four weeks of absence. Was in those weeks when a Gollum cardinal accused the Pope of an illegal action. The Church, said him, that he could not have four husbands. The papal dignity was not delegable up to that point. So the saint decided to renounce, more disgusted by the intrigues that were around him than for the brandishing of arguments. But to renounce from the papal investiture is not the same to abdicate from the royal investiture, and the canon law in force until then the possibility was not contemplated and had never presented a case since St. Peter, named his successor to St. Linus in the first century. On the contrary, the canon law affirmed that the investiture was lifetime, due to its acceptance had the character of a matrimonial bond between the Pope and the Church, which was dogmatically indissoluble. To save this insurmountable difficulty, the canonist cardinals, Benacci and Gattani, appealed to Peril, logical reasoning. The canon law rules and formalizes the behavior of the popes, but above all, the canon law is the pope himself, the vicarious of Jesus Christ. To him corresponds the evident right to modify with his infallible word every law and every dogma, included the matter of the renouncement to the papal investiture. In December 13th of 1294, five months and nine days after his enthronement, Celestine V signed the papal bull written by the canonists of Benedictian Gatani, in which was confirmed the right of the Pope to renounce, if profound and founded guilty consciousness, for example, the belief that his manner to guide the Church could rebound in serious damages for it, or just the conviction of being unfit for the charge justifies him. Thereupon he took off the tiara, the sandals of St. Peter and the ring, and he renounced to his high charge. In December 29th of 1294, the conclave elected the Benedictine Cardinal Gattani, natural from the Anagini, and member of the royal families that had given to the Church the Popes Alexander the Sixth, Innocent the Fourth, and Gregory the Ninth. He took the name of Boniface the Eighth. Peter de Muron, who a part of saint had fame of prophet before his departure, made him the following admonition: "You have risen as a fox; you will reign as a lion." and you will die as a dog. About the legality of his attitude, the bitterest polemics aroused amongst the canonists that remained for centuries, due to the older, wider spread, opinions sustained that the papal investiture could not be renounced by any decretal. This opinion, shared by many theologians and canonists of Italy and France, who also sustained by the people, which continued considering Celestine V as legitimate pope, Fearing a schism, the Gollums decided to eliminate Peter the Moron. Boniface the Eighth arrested him in a cave of, of the Mount of Sant'Angelo, de Puglia, where he had retired, and confines him in the fortress of Fumona in Campania, in May of 1296, where he would be murdered and his body buried five meters underground. Thirty-eighth day. The famous investiture controversy sustained between Gregory the Seventh and Henry the Fourth, between the priestly sword and the volitional sword, would be renewed now by Boniface the Eighth and Philip the Fourth. But where the first had triumphed before, now would be imposed the second, with all the weight that could release the absolute truth over the essential lie. Times had changed, and it was not about a struggle between the priest of the cult and the king of the blood any more in which the first was ahead because it dominated the culture through the religion and the organized church, while the second lacked from the necessary strategic orientation to enforce the charismatic power of the pure blood. With Philip IV, the Gollums were before an initiated king, who opposed them in terms of strategies, i.e. in the context of an essential war, the priest of the cult and the cultural pact against the king of the blood and the pact of blood, the synarchic culture against the strategic manner of life, the Gollum Pope Boniface the Eighth, and the theocratic concept of the world government, against the king of the pure blood Philip the Fourth, and the concept of the mystical nation, the plans of the white fraternity against the Hyperborean wisdom. Yes, Dr. Signigal, this time the complaint was proposed in the plane of two total strategies, and its resolution would imply the total defeat of one of the adversaries. 
i.e. the impossibility to comply with their strategic objectives but as it was about the strategy of the potencies of the matter against the strategy of the eternal spirit represented by boniface the eighth and philip the fourth would not be difficult to predict who would win that was better synthesized by pierre flot a lord of the dog who was minister of philip the fair when boniface affirmed for being pope i wield the two swords and he answered it is true holy father but where your swords are just a theory the ones of my king are reality in october of twelve ninety four many french provincial synods were gathered to discuss about the help that the king claimed to solve the war against england many approved the transference for two years of an extraordinary tithe but the majority of the orders protested to the vatican and here can be said that started one of the most fruitful divisions on the bosom of the church the french bishops in great number went on by the national mystic and they felt charismatically inclined to support philip the fair on the other hand the gollum church represented in france by the benedictian orders that's to say the congregation of cluny the cistercian order and the templar order are fiercely opposed to the pretensions of philip the fourth is the abbot of chateau who raised de boniface the eighth the most virulent claims after the general assembly of twelve twenty six which are compared to servile bishops who accepted to pay taxes with the dumb dogs of the sacred writing meanwhile the king is equated to the pharaoh such difference that in the moment was quite exaggerated divided the church of france in two sides in the side of the king were aligned the nationalist bishops some of the lords of the dog although the majority were composed by simple patriots who feared privately a confrontation with the holy see philip the fourth would not neglect them assuring in every case the real protection against any reprisal that their behavior could produce also the university of paris the most prestigious school of canon law of europe was divided there apart from the issue of tax reform was still debated about the legality of the election of boniface the eighth being many the canonists who considered celestine v as the real pope the next measures of philip the fourth and the strategic movements of the dominicanus would tend to consolidate the unity of that side to agglutinate them around the king of the blood and to oppose them against boniface the eighth and the other side the one of the gollum church properly said headed by boniface the eighth were grouped the enemies of the mystical nation that's to say the followers of the internal and external enemy the gollum orders and their secret centre the college of temple instructors for philip the fourth and in this manner would be exposed in the process to the templars from that secret societies would be elaborated a plot destined to debilitate the monarchies in favor of a world government against that satanic side still enough powerful as to try a last defense of the plans of the white fraternity philip the fourth should smite with all his force of his volitional sword trying at the same time that the hit would respond to the highest hyperborean strategy boniface the eighth doesn't lose more time he decides to apply over the king of france and in an extensive form to all who dare to imitate him the universal prestige of the catholic church from this prestige appears the principle of obedience to the papal authority which until then no one dared to disobey without suffering severe punishments in his religious condition when not to punishments of more concrete order the call of a crusade to safeguard the catholic religion convoked by the most fervent adherences put in movement thousands of faithfuls and it was only about a papal mandate of an order obeyed for the respect to the holy investiture of his transmitter would not be then the right moment to apply such prestige over the insurgent kinglet who dared to intervene in the centennial plans of the gollum church but boniface the eighth had not warned when he evaluated the force of such prestige the recent loss of holy land neither the frustrated crusade against aragon nor the argonese presence in sicily nor the extreme weakness that the war against swabia had produced in the german kingdom nor the almost inexistence of the empire except for the title that was still conferred to the german kingdoms etc none of these things he warned and he decided to compete with philip the fourth through the bull clarisilacos of february twenty fourth of twelve ninety six on it was prohibited under excommunication penalty to all the secular princes to demand or receive extraordinary subsidies of the clergy clerics for their part had prohibited to pay them unless under authorization in contradiction of the holy see under the same excommunication penalty under such point to the absurd 
that a bishop ran the risk to be excommunicated not only for falling in heresy but also for paying a tax. You won't miss, Dr. Signigel, the Judaic connotations that are behind such greedy and avisurous mentality. The reaction of Philip IV was consequent. He gathered in France an assembly of bishops to debate the bull Clerilacos, in which he accused who obeyed to not contribute in the defense of the kingdom, and being, therefore, liable under the charges of treason. The Roman law was opposed, already, against the canon law. He sent some loyal bishops and ministers to Rome to treat the issue with the Pope, while in secrecy animated the Colonna to strengthen the Giblian party. But apart from these measures, he made something much more effective. In August 17, he promulgated an edict in which he prohibited the exportation of gold and silver of the Kingdom of France. Other royal edicts prohibited to the Italian bankers who operated in France to accept funds destined to the Pope. In this manner, the Pope remained deprived to receive the ecclesiastical rents from the Church of France, including his own feuds. Boniface VIII, of course, not expected such strike from the king. Philip IV had exposed the new situation to the people through sides, libels, and assemblies convoked to the effect, and he had skillfully exposed it, in such a way that the Church of Rome appeared as indifferent before the necessity of the French nation. As interested only egotistically, on its rents, while the nation had to mobilize all its resources to face an exterior war, was pretended to make the accept passively, under excommunication penalty, that the clergy directed important rents to Rome. These arguments justified before the people and the estates the royal edict, and predisposed to everyone against the papal bull, unanimously was requested to Philip IV to disobey the Clerilacos which content, according to the secular legists, was manifestly perverse, due to it obey the king to miss the laws of his kingdom. To Boniface VIII, whose love for the gold was hand in hand with his fanaticism for the Gollum cause, the deprivation for such rents meant little less than a physical mutilation, especially when he had news that the English king Edward I was imitating the measures of Philip concerning to the exactation of the ecclesiastic's tithes and now was preparing to disobey also the cleric Lacos, and to commandeer the totality of the rents of the church. The pain of Boniface the Eighth will be better understood, if we observe the amounts of that in question. Italy contributed with 500,000 guilders of gold and papal tithes, England with 600,000, and France, that was retaining a part destined to the crusade against Aragon, 200,000. It was about a guilder that for nothing in the world could be renounced. For what needed Boniface VIII such quantities? In part to finance the war with which he wanted to break the Ghiblian fence that had been developing in Italy, where was still missing the Sicilian issue, and in part to enrich himself and his family, due to Benedict Gattani was gifted with perfection of the features of the boundless ambitious, the unscrupulous climber, the corrupt tyrant, worthy of these examples. When he acceded to the papacy, he immediately annulled the laws and decrees of Nicholas IV and Celestine V that benefited the Colonas, transferring titles in favor of his own familiars. The King Charles II obtained for his nephew the title of Count of Caserta, and many feuds, for the sons of him, of the Earl of Palazzo and Earl of Fondi, for himself he seized from the old palace of the emperor octavian converted then in the military force of rome which he restored and rebuilt magnificently employing for it the money of the church same procedure continued with other castles and fortresses of campania and mermema and all passed to integrate his personal patrimony he possessed palaces in rome ritti or vieto his habitual residences although the most beautiful and luxurious was undoubtedly the one of his natal city in Anagni, which he passed most part of the year. So he lived in an environment of splendor and luxury that was in nothing coherent with his condition of leading of the church, the exalts, the salvation of the soul, by the practice of humility and poverty. He lacked of scruples to concede charges and favors in exchange for money, i.e. he was Simeonac. He put his money, or of the church, interchangeably in the hands of the Lombard, or Templar bankers, to be borrowed at user interest. He lacked of any piety when it was treating about to reach his purposes, quality that he demonstrated in first instance when he ordered the assassination of Celestine V, and then confirmed the bloody persecutions of the Ghiblians that he unleashed in Italy. And to complete this profile of his sinister personality, perhaps be enough with a last example, as every golem, Boniface VIII, had affection to the ritual sodomy.
Of course, just as the Gollums had not disposed of a king of the height of Philip IV to oppose him, neither they disposed of a St. Bernard to seat in the pontifical throne. Benedict Gatani was the best they had, and to him they entrusted the execution of their strategy. And the best strategy seemed to be, before the toughness and the courage of Philip IV, to go back one step, and prepare to advance two. In other words, would be attempted to calm the king, mitigating the sense of the bull Clariglacos. Through other bull, and Ephibalus Amor, in September 21st of 1296, and they will dedicate, by all the possible available means of the church, to end with the Ghiblian threat in Italy and Sicily. And concerning to the pretext of the war with England, brandishing by the king of France to justify his exactations, he would be neutralized, obeying the parts to pact the peace, pure logic, without war, the king would have not motives to demand taxes nor contributions to the clergy. The ineffabilis amor is followed by the bulls Romana Mater Ecclesia in Novartis, in which it threatens the king with excommunication, manifesting the total approval of the tithes, only when the kingdom be really in danger. But what stands out in all of them is the arrogance with which is directed to the king, to whom he considers a mere minion. These bulls would raise a wave of indignation in France. Due to it, they were openly read by order of the king, and they would predispose even more the French bishops against the papal intrasignants. They were who gathered in an assembly in Paris and asked to the Pope, in February 1st of 1297, the authorization to subsidize Philip IV which was facing at the time the treason of the Earl of Flanders. He, in fact, had allied with the King of England, who was trying to recover the guinea, and was threatening the north of France. Boniface the Eighth must yield before the facts and authorize the contributions, leaving the Clerilacos in dead letter. In April of 1297, Boniface sent to Paris the cardinals Albano and Preneste, carrying a new bull, on it he ordained to the monarchs in conflict the establishment of a one-year truce, while the definitive treaty of peace is being arranged. The negotiation would be in charge of the Pope. Philip received them, but before to permit the reading of the rescript, he made the following warning. Tell to the Pope, that is our conviction, that only to the king corresponds to command in the kingdom, that we are the king of France, and we don't recognize the competence of any one above us to intervene in the matters of the kingdom, that the king of England and the Count of Flanders are vassals of the king of France, and that we do not accept other advice than to voice of the honor to treat our subjects. The bull was read, but Philip did not respond until June of 1298, when the fate of the weapons was adverse before the united forces of England and Flanders. Then he accepted the arbitration of Boniface the Eighth, but not in quality of Pope, but only as Benedict Gitani. Thus he avoided to admit the papal jurisdiction in the matters of the kingdom. Meanwhile, the controversy about the legitimacy of Boniface the Eighth continued more alive than ever. In France, the lords of the dog were in charge to update the debate, while in Italy the agitation ran by account of the Colonnas. The preference for Boniface the Eighth or Pope Celestine V had been transformed their in synonym of Guelphs or Ghiblians. The Colonna, receiving secret help from Philip IV, are now the allies of the King Frederick of Sicily, son of Peter III of Aragon, and Constance of Swabia, were present in the view of the Pope as the staunchest candidates for a Gollum vendetta. They just needed a chance, and this one appeared when the anger of Esteban Colonna took him to assault a papal caravan that was carrying the pontifical treasure from Anagni to Rome. Esteban Sicara Colonna had not acted with the intention to rob, but with the certainty of rescuing the goods of the church which were in power of a usurper. For this reason he carried the treasure at the light of day to his castle of Palestrina. The lesson that Boniface the Eighth would apply to the Colonna and the Ghiblians, it would be exemplary. Although characteristic of the Gollum mentality, first he presented the act of Sicara Colonna to the people of Rome as an indescribable crime, for which he blamed his entire lineage. The Cardinal Pedro is the chief of the Ghiblians in both. He and the Cardinal Jacob were guilty for the two years' retardation of the papal election in Perugia. Now another member of that family dares to revolt against the authority of the Pope, the highest of the universe, and dares to steal this treasure. That accursed lineage— must be banished from the church. The proclamation of the illegality of Boniface the Eighth by the Colonnas was in vain. 
their contributions and the accusations about the doubts that the University of Paris sustained about the resignation of the Pope Celestine V, or the request of information of a general council of the Church to utter on the case. In less than a month, with the approval of the Sacred College, the Cardinals Jacobo and Peter were excommunicated and deposed, as well as Juan Colonna and his sons, Agapito, Jacobo, and Esteban Sicara. In addition of taking them away from the Church and Christianity, and the bull is ordained to confiscate their goods, properties, and titles. Naturally, the Colonnas resisted, and Boniface replied, publishing a crusade, All who take part of it will get the same dispenses that if had gone to Holy Land. With the pass of the Crusaders, the Ghiblians' massacres are renewed in all of Italy. The castle of Sicara, in Palestrina, is taken and by order of Boniface reduced to rubble, the ground ploughed and covered with salt. Sicara and the rest of the Colonnas must flee to France completely ruined. Then was the turn of the spiritual Francians. According to another bull, the Holy Office found their doctrines heretical and ordained the dissolution of the order.
39th day. Only in 1299 Philip the Fair would finish the war with England. The truce agreed by Benedict de Gattani had been developed morosely, and the warring nations were unable to yield in their intentions to restart the struggle. Finally, through the Treaty of Montreuil, the same ended due to the own conditions of the time. Edward I, King of England, would marry with Margaret, sister of Philip IV, while Edward II, son of English, would engage with Isabella, a four-year-old girl who was the only daughter of the French. Isabella would inherit the Duchy of Guinea, but the English would not tread French territory by the moment. The next year, Philip occupies the county of Flanders with his troops and closes the strategic enclosure. In the year 1300, Philip the Fair completed the first two steps of the strategic way of life of the regal function. He realized the principle of the occupation on the territory of the kingdom and applied the principles of enclosure. And the fields were prepared for the rational exploitation of the agriculture and animal husbandry. The Hyperborean strategy then reaches its highest degree of development, and there is almost no power on the earth able to oppose the king of the blood and the mystic nation. Has sounded the hour of the charismatic state, in which the king and the people are a single voice and a single will. The arrest of the bishop of Pamirs, which will outbreak the last reaction of Boniface the Eighth, will clearly show the real existence of the charismatic state. Bernard de Sosset, Bishop of Parmiers, was in reality a Gollum spy. They entrusted him the mission to investigate the existence of a secret society in the Languedoc, where allegedly belonged counselors of Philip the Fair. After a patient work, he reached to a stunning conclusion. In fact, a wicked conspiracy existed against the Gollum church. On it converged the Cathars, who reappeared surprisingly organized, the spiritual Francians, recently excommunicated, and some members of the Order of Preachers, especially Spaniards. Disputes between heretics and inquisitors were clearly simulated, and was easily to warn that behind the plot was the hand of Philip the Fair, who protected all the imputed ones in person. Before being discovered by the Lords of the Dog, and then arrested and accused of high treason, the Bishop of Parmiers sends his report to Boniface VIII, who demanded to the King of France his immediate release. This was not possible without running the risk of exposing more details about the Dominicanus. So he was formally accused of being involved in a seditious plan at the service of the Crown of Aragon. He was going to be judged by a civil court, which was in total contradiction to the canon law, which prohibited to the bishops to appear in the secular court. The necessity for the Bishop of Parmiers to obtain testimony against Philip the Fair, and the challenge which meant in that time the civil prosecution of a bishop, caused the anger of Boniface the Eighth. His response would be the bull Asculta Phyllis, dispatched to France in December 1301, with others of lesser importance. On it Boniface criticized violently the legal and administrative reform of the king. Return, my beloved son, to the path that guides to God and from which you have missed, either by your own guilt or by the instigation of malicious advisers. Above everything, don't let you to be persuaded that you do not have a superior, and that you are not subjected to the Pope, who is the head of the ecclesiastical hierarchy. Such opinion is senseless, and who encourages it is an infidel already segregated from the flock of the Good Shepherd." Those evil advisers, of course, would not be other than the Dominicanus. Then Boniface expresses that, with the finality to consider the disorders caused by the misbehavior of Philip, and to find a fair remedy to it, he convened all the bishops to a council in Rome on November of 1301. During the same, the king, who is invited to be present, will be prosecuted for his crimes and called to the correction. Philip the Fourth, of course, not only would not present, but he would prohibit the bishops to leave France without his consent. The crimes that were imputed to the king in the Oscotola of Phyllis would seem us today perfectly sovereign. They accused him to have changed the monetary system, to create taxes unknown until then, to tax the rents that the Church of France guided to Rome, to impose national frontiers to their subjects, etc., Copies of this bull were written and burnt in public in all France, generating a popular movement of indignation against the theocratic despotism of the Pope. As I told you, Dr. Signigel, with the Escutel Phyllis, appeared the opportunity to exhibit the mystical nation. With this new structure of the state that was patiently created, the Dominicanus Legists, 
The demonstration was realized exactly the day, April 10th in 1302, at the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, and can be considered as the first constitution of the modern French state. There were gathered the representatives of all the French provinces, reasons why the Congress was called of the general states. But what was really new consisted in the three orders that composed the assembly. It means representatives of the nobility, the clergy, and of the cities. These last ones present for the first time in a council chaired by the king, and must be placed at that time, in the fourteenth century, to appreciate on its real dimension the innovation which meant to include the noble and ecclesiastical representatives, the plebeian class and not as a democratic right extorted by force to sanguinary tyrants or weak kings but by the real recognition that the people participate in the sovereignty such as affirms the hyperborean wisdom naturally in the third order were represented the different strata that integrated the mystical nation mainly the new and vigorous bourgeois composed by the traders merchants and yeomen the artisans and builders free peasants etc outstanding performance in the organization of first assembly of the three orders had the lords of the dog especially the first three named pierre flotte robert of artois and count of saint paul pierre flotte spoke to parliament in the name of the king and his words are still remembered the pope has sent us the letter in which he declares that we must submit unto him as to the temporal government of our king refers and that we must abide not only to the crown of god as we always believed but also the apostolic see according to this statement the pontiff convokes to all the prelates of this kingdom to a council in rome to reform the abuses which he said that have been committed by us and our functionaries in the administration of our states you know in other hands in which manner the pope impoverishes the church of france giving at his free will behooves which incomes pass to foreign hands you ignore that the churches are overwhelmed by tithes demands that the metropolitans don't have now the authority over their suffragans neither the bishops over their clergy which in one word the court of rome reducing the episcopacy to nout attracts to himself power and money it is necessary to curb these outrages thus we beseech you as lords and as friends to help us to defend the liberties of the kingdom and of the church and what treats about us if it is necessary to sacrifice for these double motive our goods our lives and if the circumstances demand it the ones of our children the position of philip the fair was supported in collective form by the general states the nobles and the cities subscribed quite letters in which they refused in hard terms the accusations against the king they denounced at the same time the intention of the pope to convert the kingdom in an ecclesiastical feud but the relations went poisoned more and more during the assembly the most atrocious crimes attributed to boniface the eighth had been made public the usurpation of the papal investiture murder simony heresy sodomy etc and such lack of moral authority from who pretended to become supreme sovereign was divulged through all the corners of the kingdom by the publicists of philip the fair so the people were with their king and would not react adversely before any initiative that would have as finality to limit the ambitions of boniface the eighth in regard to the bishops they were in front of the following dilemma if they concurred to the council would be considered personal enemies of the king they could be accused of treason and just as occurred to the bishop of parmir judged by civil courts but if they not they would be excommunicated by boniface the eighth nevertheless even by the terrible retaliations that had promised the pope to those who don't present in rome the majority of the bishops were in the side of the king to whom they considered as a worthier representative of catholic religion only the golems and the spies of philip the fourth would go in november to the council it means only thirty-six would go of a total of seventy-eight french bishops but before the council on july eleventh of thirteen o two an unfortunate event came to tarnish the mystical court of philip the fair to suffocate a general revolt that had sprouted in flanders philip sends a powerful army of knights which results annihilated such day in the battle of courtray and in the battlefield remains forever the invaluable pierre flotte robert d'artois and the count of saint paul three lords of the dog whose performance was the main factor of the success of the strategy of philip the fourth other Dominicanus even more fearsome than the three defunct, Guillaume de Nogaret, 
en Gorand, de Marigani, en Guillaume de Plessian. During the council, no resolution was taken against Philip IV due to, as in the fable, no mouse would exist disposed to put the sleigh bell to the cat. Nevertheless, the fury of Boniface has no limits when he knew that in France had been confiscated the goods of the present bishops, and a judgment of high treason has been promoted to them. Thus, November 18th, he published the bull Unam Sanctum, which would be considered as the most complete juridical exposition ever realized in favor of the papal and priestly absolutism. Incapable to take other more effective measures against Philip the Fair, the Gollums tried to initiate a juridical polemic about the matter of the spiritual power and the temporal power. For this reason, Boniface insists once again with the analogy of the two swords. The tactic consists in to obtain, to be admitted it. It is continued with the identification of the Pope with the spiritual power and the King with the temporal sword. The conclusion, evidence and logic, is that the king must submit to the pope because in this manner is accomplished the will of God. The idea was not new, but now was elevated as the official dogma of the church, and its explicit rejection would imply the sin of heresy. Let's remember, Dr. Signigel, the main conclusions of the bull. In first place, it affirms the existence of just one church, denying the recent accusation of the Dominicanus consisting that, inside of the Gullum church, heretic and satanic, from which Boniface would be one of the chiefs, thence the name of the bull, Unum Sanctum Ecclesium. In this unique church, we are obeyed to believe, because out of it there is no salvation, nor forgiveness for the sins. And this unique church is analogous to the organic body in which the head represents Jesus Christ, and also the Pope, the Vicarious of Jesus Christ, therefore is the lonely and unique Church. There is just one body, only one head, and not two heads, as the monster has. It means Jesus Christ and the Vicarious of Jesus Christ, Peter, and the successors of Peter, are the head of the Church. For these reasons, the temporal and spiritual swords are subjected to the power of the church. The second must be used for the church, and the first by the church. The first by the priest, the second by the hands of the kings and knights, but to the will and conformity to the priest. A sword, however, must be subjected to the other, and the temporal authority to the temporal power. The king mustn't interfere in the issues of the church— either in what treats about its rents, due to if he do such thing commits a great mistake. He interferes with the spiritual power, and the Pope is obeyed to judge him and to call him to the order, but without, on the contrary, exists anyone over the earth that can judge the Pope. We see it clearly in the contribution of tithes, either in the glorification as in the sanctification, in the reception of such power, and in the government of the things. Because, as the truth testifies, the spiritual power must institute and judge the earthly power. If this is not correctly exerted, thus if the earthly power errs, it can be judged by the superior power. But if the supreme power really errs, this can only be judged by God, not by any man. It means that all the accusations of Boniface VIII, exposed during the assembly of the general states and transcribed in the letters of the cardinals, lack of value due to they come from those who don't have the spiritual capacity to judge the acts of the Pope. Only God can do that. And to believe the opposite is manifested heresy. Therefore, whoever resists to this power ordained by God also resists to the law of God. Unless that he pretends the existence of two principles— as the Manichaean. So we declare, we say and define, that is entirely necessary for the salvation, that all the human creatures are subjected to the high Roman pontiff. The glove has been thrown to the king of France and was clearly adverted, in the words of the bull, the intention to excommunicate him. In the next four months, Philip the Fair and the Dominicanus celebrated many secret meetings. The prestige of Boniface the Eighth has fallen lower than ever in France after the bull Unum Sanctum, is the moment proposed the lords of the dog to depose the Pope. Once beheaded, the Gollum dragon will be easier to disband the body. However, the argument of the illegitimacy of his investiture doesn't have the unanimous support of the University of Paris, necessary, request to substantiate the claim or imposition of a new papal election, gains strength instead. The idea to present an accusation of heresy— the heresy, according to the canon law, is casual of demission. 
of the Pope and is supported with historical antecedents. Of course, that to prove such accusation and to derive from it the substitution of the Pope was necessary the scheme of a general council. Philip IV is then disposed to force the recall to a council to judge the heretic behavior of the Pope. He entrusts to enforce there the number of his national bishops. The lords of the dog will accompany him, orchestrating a campaign of denunciations of heresy against Boniface VIII as a manner to morally influence over the bishops and also over the nobles in the cities. Guillaume of Nogaret and Guillaume of Placien offered to officiate as accusers, being the first, elected to perform a secret mission in Italy. What would not avoid to initiate the campaign of accusations, begging in public to the king to defend the Christians from the evil of Boniface VIII, and the second to accuse openly to the Pope. On March 12th of 1303, Guillaume of Nogaret, before the Council of Ministers of the King, reads and signs a manifest, which is immediately copied and published in the whole kingdom. It says, The glorious Prince of the Apostles, the blessed Peter, talking in the name of the Spirit, said us that, As in past times, as in coming times, would emerge false prophets that will besmirch the path of the truth. And those who, in their greed, and through misleading words, will traffic with us, following the example of that Balaam, who satisfied with the prize of the iniquity, to impose the punishments and to utter his threats. Balaam has a beastly creature, that, gifted with human speech, proclaimed the nonsenses of a false prophet. These things which were announced by the Father and the Patriarch of the Church, we see now with our own eyes realized letter by letter. In rigor to the truth there is seated in the chair of blessed Peter, the master of lies, who notwithstanding of being maleficent, in every possible form, is called Beneficent, Boniface. He didn't enter through the door in the flock of our Lord as shepherd and cottager, but as raider and thief. Even being alive, the real husband of the church, Celestine V, has dared to injure the wife by means of illegitimate embraces. The real husband has no participation in this divorce. In fact, according to what the human laws say, nothing more opposed to the acquiescence than the error. Can't marry who, while the worthy husband lives, has besmirched the marriage with the adultery. Thus, as all what perpetuates against God is an injure which is committed against every one, and which such great crime concerns the testimony of the first who comes must be received, even being the one of the wife, although being of a shameful woman. I, therefore, as the beast that through the power of God was gifted with the voice of a real human, to make him reprove the nonsense of the false prophet who reached to curse the blessed people, I direct unto you my supplication, the most excellent of the princes, our Lord Philip, by the grace of God, King of France, who after the example of the angel that showed the naked sword to comply with the justice, you must oppose to this other and most fatal Balaam, and prevent the consummation of the damage that he is preparing against the people. The damage consisted in the excommunication of Philip the Fourth and the liberation of all the French Christians to comply with the vow of fidelity, with which the kingdom would remain in question, and could be rightfully conquered for whom the Pope authorizes. Such the plans that Boniface VIII was preparing, and that the spies of Philip IV informed periodically. On the other hand, as an effect of the Manifest of Nogaret, no official measure was taken, but promptly the people started to refer to the Pope as Maleficent VIII. What explained by the Gascons enjoined France of the same fate that in Spain have the Andalusians. Fortieth Day On June 13th of 1303 was celebrated an assembly of the General States in Louvre, chaired by the King. On it were renewed the complaints against Boniface VIII, and was formally proposed the necessity to convoke a council to condemn him and to name a new pope. The nobles, the cities, and the nationalist bishops accept. Guillaume de Palacian requests to be the accuser of Boniface in the future council. He is accepted too and reads a declaration where he exposes his arguments. I, Guillaume de Palacian, knight, anticipate and affirm that Boniface, who now occupies the Holy See, will be found a perfect heretic, according to the heresies, prodigious facts, and wicked doctrines as the following. First, he doesn't believe in the immortality of the soul. Second, he doesn't believe in the eternal life, because he affirms that he would prefer to be a dog, a donkey or a brute before a French. 
thing that he would not say if he believes that a French has eternal soul. He doesn't believe in the real presence because he decorates his throne with major magnificence than the altar. He has said that to humiliate his majesty in the French, he would disrupt the whole universe. He gave his approval to the book of Arnaud de Venu, the protected sorcerer of the Cistercians, who had been condemned by the bishop and the University of Paris. He erected statues of himself in the churches with a purpose to be worshipped beside the crucified. He has a familiar demon, which he calls Baphel, who reveals him what he wants to know. For this reason he said that even in the whole mankind would be placed aside, and would be only he in the other side. He can't err, either in what treats about an aspect of a fact or of only right. He expressed in his public preach that the high priest, even putting price to all the sacraments and ecclesiastical charges, cannot commit simony, which is a heresy to affirm. As a confirmed heretic, he sustains that only his own faith is the real. He qualified the French, notoriously one of the most Christian populations of Cathars. He is a repugnant sodomite, as numerous testimonies prove. He is also a killer, and his presence gave death to many clerics, saying to his guards, when they not reach to slay them, with the first smite, Beat, beat, dale, dale! He obeyed the priests to rape the secrets of the confessional. He doesn't watch nor vigils nor fast. He releases Philippics against the order of Dominican preachers, against the minor brothers and the spiritual Francian, repeating often that they ruin the world that they are hypocrites and false, and that nothing good would happen to those who confess before them. Trying to destroy the faith, he has convinced an old aversion against the King of France. In his hate towards the faith of the real Christ, because in France is where he is, and was the splendor of the faith, the great support and example of Christianity. He raised everyone against the house of France, to England, Germany, confirming the title of emperor to the king of Germany, and proclaiming that he did it to destroy the pride of the French people, who boasted to not be subjected to anyone concerning to the temporal things, that there was no one above his king, adding that they had lied through their rough, and declaring that if an angel would have descended from heaven and said to the French that are not subjected neither to Boniface nor the emperor, it would be anathema, he permitted the loss in the Holy Land, employing in his personal wars and luxuries the money destined to the defense of that site. He has been recognized in public as simonist, and moreover as the source and base of the simony, selling benefits to the highest bidder, imposing over the church and the bishop's servitude and vassalage, with the objective to enrich his family and his friends with the patrimony of the crucified, and to convert them in Marquess, Cons and barons. He dissolves marriages for money. He annuls the votes of the nuns. In sums, nights, he said that prompt. He would make of all the French apostates. Impressed for the accusations of Placian, all accompanied by abundant proofs, the parliamentarians convened to invite Boniface VIII to assist to the council to exert his defense. Nevertheless, Philip IV was not in accordance with the collective approval, and he wrote personal letters for many dioceses of France. While Nogaret went to Rome to notify the Pope, Gu Guillaume de Pelassian, escorted by a dissuasive royal troop, he visited every city in person, village or hamlets, and he collected the signs of the statements. As was expected, almost everyone signed when reading the letter to the king and hearing the exposition of the official accuser. Only the Cistercians resists, and the other Benedictine orders, main refugees of the Golems, Chateau, the Cluny, and the Temple, disapproved angrily the behavior of Philip the Fair, and manifested that there is nothing reprehensible in Boniface the Eighth. Instead, the University of Paris, the Dominicans of Paris, and the Francians of Touraine declared to be in favor of the king. In mid-August, Boniface VIII published a bull in which he affirms that only the Pope is authorized to convoke a council, and he tried to defend himself from the accusations of Placian and Nogaret. At the end, he wondered, how has been possible to reach to the absurd that the Cathars accused the Pope of heresy? 
but the spies of Philip IV informed him that the decree of excommunication of the king is being drafted and questions the kingdom of France. To the bull has been placed in advance the date of its omission, September 7, 1303. Philip IV decided to give a hand hit and capture Boniface before the publishing of his infamous resolution. He would be judged in France and formally deposed, naming in his place a French bishop of his trust. To comply with this plan, he conceded white letter to Guillaume de Nogaret, to whom he gave his own sword and said these historical words. The honor of France is in your hands, knight lord. Guillaume de Nogaret goes to Italy accompanied only by Scaria, Colonna, the most fearsome personal enemy of Boniface, and by Charles de Saint Felix, a Dominicanus who was grandson of Pedro de Creta and Valentina de Tarsus. Nogaret knew Charles since he was a child, because he was son of who was the lord of the family of Saint Felix of Carmen. In Florence, the banker of the king of France gives to Nogaret an important sum, due to he had the order to provide the Gascon of whatever that could be necessary for his mission. Since their departure, a lot of people addict to the, Gil to the Ghiblian party to give advice to the Colonna's allied lords in the proximities of Anagni, Alatri, and Ferentino. The Pope is located in his palace of Anagni, his natal city in the ancient pontifical state of Frosinone, the neighbor city of Ferentino, Ghiblian rival of the Guelph Anagni, and the meeting point of the conspirators, the chosen day, September 6th, i.e., one day before the omission of the bull that would excommunicate Philip IV. The signalized day in the highest secrecy arrived a dozen of lords, sworn enemies of Boniface VIII, who were waiting since years ago a similar opportunity to take revenge. All they craved intimately an occasion to execute Boniface, due to they considered worthless his transference to France. Ironically, Guillaume of Nogaret shall appeal to all his authority to protect him and comply in this manner with the strategy of Philip the Fair. Each knight had traveled separately, accompanied by a small guard that would not awake any suspicion. To these troops were added the mercenary effectives provided by the captain Rinaldo Supino, guard of Ferentino who sold himself to Nogaret for one thousand florins. In some were three hundred horsemen and one thousand infants. Such companies would be really exiguous for the enterprise that they proposed to realize, if they would not have the principle to surprise and favor due to either Boniface the Eighth nor his Gollum followers, imagined remotely that they could be attacked in Anagni. Formed a few kilometers of distance, the battalion of Nogaret seemed to have emerged from the knot, and nobody in Italy could know with anticipation of its existence as to warn the Gollums. One of the Ghiblian knights was Nicholas, from the powerful family of Conti, whose brother Adenulfo, dwelling in Anagni would support vital collaboration to the invaders. Through him is achieved to buy the commandment of the papal guard, Godfrey Busso, for a good bag of gold, while the own Adenulfo would be occupied to deceive the Anagnians during the attack. At midnight arrived the warriors of Christos Lucifer in front of the ancient capital of the Hermix. Two knights carry the penance of France and of the church. Nicholas Conti guided them to a door in the wall that has been opened from the inside, and all rushed to the scream of, Die, Boniface! Long live the King of France! The horsemen, followed by the infantry, are deployed in many groups by the narrow and declivitous carriageway. They go right where there are erected the sumptuous palaces that belong to the cardinals and the pope, and many churches of the splendid ornamentation. The commandment of the papal guard joins, with a part of his own, to the intruder forces and the siege to the palace of Boniface VIII ex begins, who scarcely disposes of a few men to resist. For one time the history has inverted, the argument is the same, the personages similar, as the fight of the spirit against the potencies of the matter, the king of the blood against the Gollum priests, of the representatives of the pact of blood against the ones of the cultural pact. But this time the king of blood, is who triumphs over the Gollum priests, over the exterminators of the pure blood, over the crusade proclaimers against the Hyperborean wisdom. Inside of the sumptuous residence, the pride of Boniface collapses. See him there, trembling and crying as a woman, the Gollum demon who pretended to prevail over the charisma of the king of the blood. Perhaps he is not crying because of the tragedy, but for the future punishment that his lord will impose him, the supreme priest Melchizedek, and the masters of the white fraternity. 
the dwellers of the anagni to all this arouse with the surprise that their city has been occupied by troops of the king of france someone makes the bell tolls calling the reunion and all the families run towards the town square of the market the news are overwhelming Schiara Colonna has come to with a battalion provided by the King of France, and will surely he will kill the Pope. Godfrey Busso has passed to the enemy side, and the city has remained unprotected. Rapidly in the midst of a great confusion, the name chief to Adelnufo Conti, he accompanied with some neighborhoods, previously elected amongst the followers of the Colonnas and the Contis, leaves to parley with the raiders. He talks with Reynaldo Supino, and returns immediately. He assures with vehemence that would be impossible to resist the French, who have already looted the palaces of the cardinals, only rests the possibility to join them and to share the booty. Desperate, the Guelphs begin the pillage, stealing beside the Ghiblians the cardinal and papal palace. Their artworks of incalculable value would disappear. Treasures of the antiquity, a rich crockery of gold and silver, each one takes what they want and can take with them. Some of them discover the warehouses and charge to satisfy the exquisite palates of the cardinals and to calm their indistinguishable thirst, and promptly the bottles pass from hand to hand. During the day, few would be Anagnians who would not have stolen or get drunk. No one dares to walk through the streets, and the city remains under the total control of the scarcely men of Nogaret. While the nocturnal pillage took place and the population was being entertained in that barbarous task, the feverous warrior activity emerged in the surroundings of the palace of Boniface, who, conscious that he was reduced guard, could not resist for a long time, tried to arrange an agreement with the besiegers. His legacy received the conditions to surrender without capitulation, to lift the excommunication of Philip the Fair, to rehabilitate the Colonnas, and to concur as prisoner to France to be judged in the council. When Boniface receives the terms, he refused to accept, and he remained plunged in desperation. He just dressed with the Gollum papal investiture and awaited his enemies seated in the throne. Amongst sobs of bitterness, he prayed fervently to the Creator God to realize the miracle of his salvation and of the plans of the white fraternity. Could be possible, he wondered aloud, that the lords of the war could triumph over him, who is a representative of the Creator of the universe? If he in whom he had been committed to stop the temporal kings failed, what new misadventures would supervene later for the Gollum orders? that for many centuries developed the plans of the white fraternity. After each one of these questions he convulsed, and was evident that he would not delay to lose the reason. With the exception of two bishops, one Spaniard and the other Italian, everyone escaped from his side as they can. Some of them were captured and killed by the men of Schiaria Colonna, while others remained as hostages because they surrendered voluntarily, amongst them his new nephew. Such news ended to depress Boniface. Finally, a window yielded, and Guillaume de Nogaret and Charles de Saint Felix entered, followed by a dozen of soldiers of Ferentino, who stayed to a prudent distance to not be recognized by the Pope. Nogaret and Charles get nearer to the throne, wearing to the papal tiara, replica of the Egyptian crown of the swarthy Atlantean priests, with the white robes of the Levitic priests of Israel, in which is embroidered the four leaf clover of the Gollum priests, stylized as Celtic crosses and his right hand sustained the cross symbol of the spiritual incarceration, and in the left the keys of St. Peter, symbol of the Kalachakra key, with which the traitor gods of the spirit consummated the original treason. There was seated, with his eyes burning, with hate and fear, one of the wickedest men on the earth. Cathar! Son of Cathar! exclaimed Defiant when he recognized Nogaret. Your lord, king of France, could not do anything against the law of Jehovah God! I am knight of the King of France, replied the Gascon, and I assure you, detestable priest, that my lords only know and respect the law of the honor, which is the law of the Holy Spirit, of the will of the real God. Only your God, Jehovah, who is a demon called Satan, to whom you obey slavishly, can oppose to that law. Damn Gollum! Now is Charles of St. Felix, or Charles of Tarsus Volter, or Charles of Tarsival who spoke. I assure you that the King of France will only end with you, and the diabolic orders that aid you. You will never govern the world while initiates as him or Frederick the Second, but you have for sure still that we, the eternal warriors of Christus Lucifer, will end some day with the chiefs of your chiefs. 
with the occult hierarchy of supreme priests that maintain the uncreated spirit chained into the slavery of the created matter. Boniface paled and shuddered when hearing the men of stone. Something as a halo of essential hostility emerged from such night with an impressive intensity. What was the death of the warm life before the other death that was intuited through his presence? What was the loss of life, of the ephemeral joys and riches, of the power in this world or the punishment of the supreme priest in the other world which produced much fear in him until then, before the abyss of the eternal death in which the eyes of ice of the French knight sank him? Heretics! He screamed out of control, and the moment when a door fell shattered and entered in full steam a multitude chaired by Schiara, Colonna. Respect for who? By disposition of the unique God must govern over the world. Ciara, such mortal enemy of Boniface, reached to hear his last words and gave him a violent slap with the iron glove, pouring out blood from his cheek. Nogaret had to contain him to avoid, to avoid him to traverse the Pope right there with the sword. The people and the soldiers, meanwhile, were taking every valuable object they had at hand. With the palace taken, Boniface prisoner, and the city under control, the situation was not nevertheless promising. One thing was to enter in secrecy in Italy, and prepare a surprise attack, and another leave the place taking the prisoner the Pope. Neither the Anagni they could have remained much time if the dwellers would have discovered how small was the number of occupant troops, and the port of Ostia was waiting for them a ship of the Annibald's family, allies of the Colonnas, but to reach there they would need an important reinforcement. The brothers of Schiara were in charge to concur with five thousand men, but they delayed, and the day of September 7th elapsed in tense calm, while the Anagnians were awakening from their surprise. The next day all continued as before, but rumors of that they had been victims of the treason of and ahead of a few aggressors started to circulate among the dwellers. The hostility started to be felt in the form of many provocations to the soldiers of Nogaret, and promptly they realized that they would have to leave Anagni as soon as possible. Guillaume of Nogaret, Charles of St. Felix, and Schiara Colonna were deliberating about the convenience of killing Boniface or taking the risk of carrying him with them when they learned that Godfrey Busso has passed again to the side of the Pope and has cut them the pass to the entrance of the palace. Immediately restarted the battle, bloody this time, and the three envoys of Philip the Fourth are obeyed to fleeing, leaving Boniface in the hands of the Guelphs. Days later they were in France, being approved by the great king, all what happened in Anagni. Is that the life of Boniface didn't serve any more to the Gollum interests due to he has lost irredeemably the reason? One month after the events of Anagni, October 11th of 1303, he would die in Rome, finishing with him the age of the Gollum medieval domination in the Holy See, and failing the imminent fulfillment of the plans of the White Fraternity, i.e. the world government and the synarchy of the chosen people. The high strategy of the Lords of Tarsus and the Circulus Dominicanus was triumphing over the potencies of the matter. Philip IV, who appeared as the exoteric cause of the Gollum's failure, was a Hyperborean initiate who accomplished to the letter the esoteric guidelines of the Hyperborean wisdom. But the death of Boniface, Dr. Signigel, was just signalized the beginning of the end, was still missing to dismantle the financial infrastructure of the Templars, the germ of the synarchy of the chosen people. The crisis that broke the soul of Boniface occurred when his diabolic pride was terribly humiliated by the acts of his enemies. First, the Cathar Nogaret, treating him as a subject of the King of France and taking him prisoner in his name. Then the mysterious Charles de Saint Felix, transmitting to him his frightening power and preaching the failure of the most secret plans of the Gollum Orders. These confirmed the suspicions of Bernard de Sosset, the Bishop of Parmiers, that around Philip the Fair existed a conspiracy of the Sons of the Shadows. Surrounded by enemies, captured in his own palace of Anagni, bathed in cold sweats, Boniface understood later that he had underestimated Philip the Fair, and that he didn't take seriously the frequently warning advices that the monks sent to the Cistercians and the Templars. Prey of a mix of hate and terror, he felt that his soul was depressing irredeemably. Then the banditti Schiara, Dargan, to hit him, and even to threaten him of death, while his men covered him with insults and at last the treason of his natal population, looting without shamelessly his palace, allying to his enemies who were the enemies of the Gollum Church, the Church of God the One, the Creator of the Universe, of the God from whom he, the priest Maximus, was the living manifestation. 
O oh God one, what ingratitude, the one of your people, perhaps such aggression of his people, for being of lesser importance but more effective, harmed him more than the precedent offenses. And naturally inside of that pain, detached in highest grade, the anguish of have being despoiled from the gold and silver, of his art treasures of unparalleled beauty gathered an entire life of acquisitions, many of them inherited or properties of the Gitani's family. The weight of the failure was released, without extenuations, crushing in some hours to Boniface. Too many feelings at once even for a golem of legendary cruelty, the ones that afflicted to the Pope of sixty-nine years old. When he was rescued by the people of Anagni, his consciousness had been situated out of the reality, and even if many promised to return the stolen, Boniface was not in conditions to comprehend it. Mechanically he requested to be taken to the palace of Lateran. There the cardinals Orsini, when checking his demential state, maintained him apart from the Romans. With exorbitant eyes, he exclaimed, Boival, Boival, al quemadas trafero. In some moments of lucidity, he exploded, request for vengeance against his enemies, and predicted the ruin of who had betrayed him. But later his mind went obscuring, and he suffered fits of rage in which he howled, vomiting foam from his mouth, and trying to bite who were taking care of him. Finally, October 13, 1303, he died, converted in furious beast, complying in this manner the prophecy of Celestine V. The saint had said, You have risen as a fox, you will reign as a lion, and you will die as a dog.